Good morning, everyone. Like Umama, can you start, please? Just kindly make Saima co-host. She has to begin it. No, Saima is already co-host. Saima, you can start now. So I'm not the co-host. So I've connected with two devices. Saima, you are the co-host on both devices. A very good morning to all dignitaries and participants. <coughs> I, Saima Zera, on behalf of Department of Chemistry, Isabella Thoban College, and Internal Quality Assurance Cell, take this opportunity to welcome you all to the second day of International Conference on Applied Chemistry, exploring futuristic applications for sustainable development. It is so joyful to see so many faculties, working professionals, and students from across the world join us for this conference. Yesterday, we witnessed experts like Professor Lydia Moroska, Dr. Tharamani, Dr. Jagriti Saini, Dr. Sarat Gutikunda, expressing their views on different topics like indoor air pollution, cleaning energy sources, energy transitions, impact of environment on human health, fuel cells, potential pulse program, and a lot more. The interactive sessions yesterday were indeed very enriching and were really interesting to be a part of. Moving further, we look forward to even better day too with esteemed speakers putting forth their views on different topics. Before we begin, I request all the participants to kindly turn off their mic and for any queries after the lecture, kindly raise up their hands. As for the tradition of our college, before starting any program, we invoke the presence of Almighty and seek his blessings. Let us start this beautiful day with a hymn sung by one of our students, Miss Ruth Parathna.
Now I would like to invite Ms. Mahima Solomon to kindly lead us in prayer. Let us bow down our heads in prayer. Glorious Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful day that you have given us. Thank you for our beautiful lives. Lord, I pray for all committees in charge that may fulfill their task responsibly. That the objectives they have set may all be achieved. May, may you extend your divine wisdom to our honorable speakers so that they would be able to impart effectively their knowledge to all of us. Bless the participants, Lord, so that they would be able to glean the vital information from this conference. Lord, I keep everyone present here in your mighty hands. I ask for your blessing on this international conference. May we take invaluable knowledge and experience from this and apply it in our lives. May we become the witness of your genuine love for this world. In Jesus' precious name, I ask this prayer. Amen. Thank you so much, Mahima, for such a meaningful prayer. May we be showered with choicest blessings of the Almighty and be blessed with abilities to achieve our goals while serving humanity. Beginning with the program, I would like to welcome and introduce Dr. Vinita Prakash, Principal, Isabella Thoburn College. Dr. Prakash has been the Principal of Isabella Thoburn College since 2013. She has more than 30 years of teaching experience at undergraduate and postgraduate levels. She has qualified NET, JRF, and completed PhD from Department of English, University of Lucknow. She has a good number of publications to her credit. Dr. Prakash is a voracious reader, an excellent orator, and an exceptional leader. I would now like to invite Dr. Prakash for, for, for the welcome address. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Saima. On behalf of Isabella Thoburn College family, I would like to extend a warm welcome to all the participants to the second day of this international conference on applied chemistry, exploring futuristic applications for sustainability. have joined us uh, on this platform, even though it is a virtual platform, but so many good things we have seen happening yesterday. I particularly welcome in our midst today, Professor Ramkrishna Guda from Western Michigan University, USA. Thank you, sir, for taking time out from your busy schedule, especially since we are in different time zones, to come here and address our students and all the participants of this conference. Dr. Guda has been a recipient of many national and international awards for research. He did his postdoctoral um, from postdoctorate from Western Michigan University, uh, where he is uh, located at the moment. And I'm sure that what he has to say will benefit the students who have joined today. The purpose of this conference is to uh, empower women towards research. And since our college has been a pioneer in women's higher education in the country and in Southeast Asia, I'm particularly looking forward for our students to go to the next level and involve in research. Even though this is a conference of chemistry, but I would encourage uh, students of all branches, whether it is humanities or commerce or whatever, to uh, develop a temperament of research and uh, be empowered. Do not think that you cannot uh, do something like this. All of you have that inside of you. And as uh, we are involved in higher education, this is the next step. 
yesterday we had a very enriching day with so many panelists distinguished professors and researchers from all parts of the world and also i was amazed at the quality of the presentations made by the students which was so good and it is a step in the right direction today also we have uh, eminent researchers and scholars from different parts of the world ms shivi saxena who is our alumna who will be speaking later in the day dr vishnath patel from the university of mumbai professor archita patnayak from iit madras professor francisco pella from dublin and i am looking forward to hearing uh, from these eminent speakers and the presentations i uh, uh, i hope and i pray that the presentation also will lead us towards more research work and encouragement of uh, research work particularly in these fields so i my best wishes are with you for today also and uh, um, i uh, and i hope that this too will be an encouraging and enriching experience for all of you thank you so much all the best for the entire day thank you ma'am for your constant motivation and for being a pillar of strength in every task that we undertake moving further with greatest honor and privilege i take this opportunity to welcome and introduce our fourth keynote speaker for the event professor ramakrishna guda professor ramakrishna guda has completed post doctoral education from university of michigan and arbor in dynamics and two photon absorption properties of organic aggregate and metal nanomaterials and completed his phd from university of mumbai he has done thesis in ultrafast interfacial electron transfer dynamics in dye sensitized semiconductor nanoparticles he is a recipient of faculty research and creative activities support fund award in 2009 2012 and 2018 research development award in 2009 pk bhattacharya young scientist award in 2004 homi baba award in 1999 his research interests include optical properties of quantum sized metal and semiconductor nanoclusters interfacial electric fields for enhanced two photon absorption chromophore functionalized semiconductor and metal nanocluster for optical applications we extend a warm welcome to you sir over to you thank you very much uh, for giving me the opportunity to talk and it's an honor and privilege for me to uh, present my work uh, let me share my screen here I hope you can be able to see what I'm sharing. So, thank you, Dr. Prakash, for your kind words, and thank you, Sana, for introducing me. And I will like to thank Dr. Lawrence for giving me an opportunity to present our work from here. And uh, it's an honor and privilege to talk to all of you. Uh, you know, even though it's late hour at our place, but it's a, it's a pleasure for me to talk. So today I'll be talking about our research that has happening. We have been doing the research in this field for last thirteen years, and uh, have been here since two thousand eight. And currently, I'm an associate professor, and as well as a graduate advisor, I work on you know recruiting uh, students to our research program here, where we have where we do research in different areas of chemistry, but also you know the western michigan university is kind of a little bit bigger university and let me just talk about the university one where we are and and talk about the university a little bit the western michigan university is established in 1903 and it has an enrollment of over 20000 students in various undergraduate and more than 4 5000 graduate students in various disciplines So we have three main campuses: main campus, west campus, and uh, east campus, and Parkview campus. So, and there are 170 different buildings, and a lot of new buildings came up recently. So, beautiful buildings in this one, and this is a new engineering campus, and this is a thing, new building that's coming up. 
and uh, several new things that are happening at the Western Michigan University and uh, new dormitories. And this is where our chemistry department we have. We have over 3,000 students in several undergraduate chemistry courses. So we have both undergraduate and graduate programs. Graduate programs include mass MS in chemistry, MA in chemistry, PhD in chemistry, and uh, you know, people do an accelerated master's too, in the sense that people can do from undergraduate to master's within five years. So we at Western and Michigan, we see all four seasons. You know, it's a good amount of snow, uh, spring, summer, and fall. So with this time, and I would like to talk about the research, and I especially happy to share with you a student from Isabella Thurborn College is working in my lab. So before I talk about my research, let me acknowledge all the people who are involved in this program. So I have uh, several students who have worked and who are working in this projects. So Viraj and Masood have graduated with their PhDs. And uh, Sajini has also graduated some time back, and she's a faculty in Towson University right here. And Shivi and uh, Sukhanya are the new graduate students, and Shivi comes from your college, and I'm really happy to have her in, uh, in my lab. And uh, I have several collaborators. My research spans and from you know various countries, South Korea, or, you know, Italy and different places where I have collaborators, we do work together because research is nowadays is interdisciplinary area. So, you know, one, if one has experience in one, it's not sufficient. You have to do collaborate with various people with different expertise so that, you know, you can be able to solve a common goal. In my lab, we are working on goal clusters. That's what the topic that I'm going to talk to you today. People know Faraday, Michael Faraday has done so much. So people know Faraday's electricity and Faraday's laws. One thing that he has also done, he probably is the one who is the father of modern nanotechnology. Back in 1857, this, this if you can be able to see here, I don't know if I can be able to see my screen here. So Michael Faraday has shown this Tyndall effect, and this is still there in, uh, in a museum in England. He had shown that when you make your gold in finely reduced form, very, very small form, you can see all kinds of colors from gold, for gold. Now for us, gold is a, an ornament, which is a beautiful luster in a beautiful shiny object, but when you make it into finely divided state, it shows beautiful colors and that he was able to show that when in 1857, not until 100 years later, people were able to experimentally reproduce what he has shown and shown that these things are happening because you are making the tiny particles. These are all nanoparticles and that gave birth to the modern nanotechnology. You can be able to make these nanomaterials and now nanoscience is nan nanotechnology has taken over the science field in people working in different interdisciplinary areas in material science, physics, engineering, chemistry, biology, and what's all. Here, we are talking about gold nanoparticles. And that's what I'm talking about, noble metal nanoscale particles. We know the bulk gold is so luster, pure, beautiful metal, but when you make that metal into smaller particles, something like a diameter, of a particle is around 50 nanometers, it's like that than the wavelength of electromagnetic field, you will get bulk gold nanoparticles. Bulk gold particles smaller into the 50 nanometer size, this is where your gold nanoparticles, which will show beautiful purple color, size dependent absorption in the visible region, and you can be able to make it rod shape and beautiful plasmonic properties. Our research started not at this place because it has People have worked a lot in this field. What will happen when we crush them further? When we make it much, much, much smaller, that's where the cluster comes. When the size of the particle becomes the Fermi length of an electron, something around 0.5 to one nanometer, you come and make gold clusters. And now at this stage, 
all the properties are defined by quantum mechanics. Instead of bulk nanoparticles, classical physics, you get into quantum mechanics here. So the field of gold nanoparticles, plasmonics has given so many applications from Raman scattering to biomedical imaging, therapeutics, and so on and so forth. What will happen when we make this much smaller that gave to the science of the gold clusters, science of noble metal clusters. This science of gold clusters has re received a huge boost in 2008 when people were able to make this gold cluster and able to find out the crystal structure of this gold cluster. And this came the cover article of Science Journal and we're able to see that this gold clusters to be able to make them atomically precise. And the fact that it's like a backroom molecule with so many gold atoms. This is a cluster, this picture of this one is gold 102 atoms with particular number of ligands. That gave rise to the science of gold clusters now. When people make nanoparticles, these are the bulk nanoparticles. When people make polydispersed gold nanoparticles, that was itself a great thing previously. And they say plus or minus 10 nanometer, okay, it was useful for certain applications. Later on, finer synthetic methodologies, you can be able to make nanoparticles with size distribution of plus or minus one nanometer. That was found to be one of the you know, greatest discoveries, new synthetic methodologies you can be able to make plus or minus one nanometer. Now comes the phenomenon of, of gold clusters. Now, not only you will make them atomically pure clusters. And the fact that if I make gold 25 with an 18 ligands and one negative charge, that's what how pure you can be able to make this cluster. It's not gold 24, it's not gold 26, it's gold 25 with 18 ligands with one negative charge. That's how precise synthetic methodologies. On top of that, accurate characterization with mass spectrometry and crystal structures has enabled both experimentalists and theoreticians to work on atomically precise gold clusters. When you make them quantum size, they give you interesting properties. Your charge gets quantized. This is the electrochemistry of a little bit bigger cluster of around 140 atoms. You can be able to see charge quantization, energy quantization. You can be able to see discrete electronic states, not the plasmonic absorption. You can see molecule-like electronic states. This was paper published in science in nature in 2000, later on reviewed in accounts of chemical research. When your size is around two to three nanometer, gold by itself is not catalytic. That's, right. That's the reason we call gold as noble matter, it does not catalyze. But when you make the gold into really, really tiny size, they start to catalyze chemical reactions. And when you give it much, much smaller, we were able to show that they can be able to use as multi-photon labels, and you know, can be able to use them for biological labeling as well. So in addition to that, they'll show beautiful electrochemical properties, more like molecule at very, very small sizes. Then you see the quantized charging. This is the molecule-like energy gap, and this is quantized charge, and then bulk metal should not show any electrochemistry. What we are interested in is optical properties of this cluster. People have shown magnetic properties when you make gold cluster with a zero charge and non negative charge. Zero charge is a uh, paramagnetic species when it is a negative charge, that's a go whole uh, filled shell of atoms, it is non-magnetic. Just change one charge on it, it will, you will show magnetic behavior. People have shown super paramagnetism in these gold clusters too. Our research more mainly focuses on the optical properties side of these clusters. Sometime back when I was uh, doing my postdoc work, we were able to show that at what stage this cluster will become a nanoparticle, where it will become from a molecule-like to a cluster nanoparticle-like behavior. We showed that at around two nanometer, around one hour D, around two nanometer, you will see below two nanometer, you will see molecule-like properties. Above two nanometer, you will see plasmonic properties or metal-like properties. So that was the, one of the first study we showed that critical size for the transition is around two nanometer for these clusters. <clears throat> in our group, after that, we went on to study different aspects of these clusters, especially on these optical properties. 
we have shown beautiful temperature dependence, exciton dynamics, how the metal doping affects the optical properties, how the symmetry of the cluster will change the optical properties. And now we are also working on making highly luminescent gold clusters. And uh, this aspect of this one, luminescent gold cluster strategies, uh, Shivi will present in her presentation. So our group's motivation is not just to do complete property uh, applications like in solar cells or imaging, but our motto is to address the fundamental questions. Fundamental questions is an important part for every researcher. If you are doing the fundamental science, you are addressing important questions so that later on they will be useful for applications. One of the first thing is, why are the things the way they are? The structure and how the structure is related to the function. That the second one what we study is from being to becoming. It's the dynamics and the mechanism. We will we always study the mechanistic details. Once you show something, it is not enough. You have to show the mechanism so that can this be applied to generalize to everything, every a cluster that you make. So those are the fundamental studies that we always focus with the techniques that we have developed in our lab and various state-of-the-art ultra-fast laser spectroscopic techniques so that we can be able to see the things, monitor the things in real time. So we will, I will share with you some of the work and those fields. So within the applications of gold clusters, there are, they are useful for photocatalyst, they're useful for electrocatalyst, they're useful for optical sensors. But here today, I will be talking about applications in light harvesting in solar cells. I'll also talking about optical imaging applications of gold clusters and our contribution to these two uh, applications of gold clusters. First, let me talk to you about light harvesting of and solar cell applications of gold clusters. Light harvesting using gold clusters. In recent years, Professor Kamath's group at University of Notre Dame was able to show these cluster sensitized solar cells with an efficiency greater than 2%. People are now working on increasing the efficiency of these solar cells where they have used these beautiful molecule-like clusters as a way to sensitize the semiconductor nanoparticles and use them for dye solar cells. It was also useful for photocatalytic water splitting. They were used as a visible light induced hydrogen generation in, in neutral water. They were able to use the gold clusters as a sensitizer to split water. And this group from Bang, they were able to show when you use different size clusters, you can be able to increase the solar cell efficiency. And the certain size of the cluster is best suited. See, the cluster with gold 18 atoms has shown a greater current density and also increased solar cell efficiency. And we at our group, we have shown light harvesting in these systems, but also we study why these things are useful, what makes these clusters for useful for light harvesting up. One of the first study which I am going to present is how the exciton dynamics, if you make these clusters, which are uh, absorbs in the entire in the visible region, how their excited state lifetimes, how this molecule life, excited state lifetimes depends on the size of the cluster, symmetry of the cluster. This is one of the paper that we published in Journal of Physical Chemistry Letters in uh, 2017, where we shown energy gap law, which is actually has been developed by Marcus and Jortner back in 1985 for describing organometallics. We are able to show such a law is applicable for quantum size gold clusters. So what we did was we have collaborated with our collaborators in uh, Dr. Lee from South Korea. He made these clusters starting from gold 25 to 38, 67 atom cluster. 102 atoms, 144, and we also worked on gold, 333 atoms. Make no mistake, each of these clusters is that much only. Gold 25 with 18 ligands. That this is what I call them as atomically precise clusters. And people have determined their crystal structures. What is the core? This 
these clusters are very unique in the sense that they have an interesting gold core and half of that they are stabilized by these staple motifs of consisting of a gold, sulfur, gold, sulfur kind of a staple motifs. It's kind of a staples that make this cluster stable. If there is good, simple one ligand on it, probably they will not be stable because they have this staple motifs make these clusters very much stable. So, we here we have done the mass spectrometric characterization. This is an ESI mass spec of gold 25. You can see this is accurate, only one size of the cluster here 38, 67, 102, and 333. And we did an absorption measurements. From there, we were able to determine the band gap in these clusters. From where this is the homolumo gap in these molecularized clusters except for this gold 333. That 333 now shows plasmonic property. Now, instead of behaving like a molecule, it will behave like a metal-like cluster. So one of the first thing that we did was understanding their lifetimes using a femtosecond laser spectroscopy. Femtosecond laser spectroscopy monitors the events with a time resolution of 100 femtosecond. One femtosecond is 10 to the power of minus 15th of a second, which can be able to follow the things that happen at real time. So this is one of the story that we have shown for Goal 25. And this is a very in interesting, fast non thermal state relaxation followed by long-lived decay. We used to follow this one from hundreds of femtoseconds to picoseconds to all the way to nanoseconds to microsecond timescales. So <clears throat> this is for gold 25, 18 ligands with one negative charge. This is the lifetime of that. And we have shown all the way for different clusters. This is gold 144. It's a very interesting symmetric cluster where we shown this 144 at this stage, still they show molecule-like behavior. We have published a paper in Nature Communications on this topic, where we have this, this many gold atoms still behaves like a molecule. That is because of this unique symmetry of this gold cluster. This is a beautiful spherical cluster. And people have done an NMR of these ligands on this 60 ligand show identical NMR, suggesting that Though all the ligands are in the same environment, the crystal structure of this cluster has an icosahedron symmetry. Because of the symmetry, this cluster remains the molecule-like behavior. When you increase from 25 to 333, 333 atoms, now it will become plasmonic. Instead of molecule-like behavior, you will see a surface plasmon bleach, and it behaves like when you shine a light on it, you heat up the system and you see an electron dynamics instead of molecule-like behaviors. So that shows pump power dependent uh, scale. And we show that this 333 cluster is a plasmonic cluster. And recently we have shown much smaller clusters show plasmonic behavior too. That probably is not the topic of this study. So when then we studied the size dependent exciton recombination, studied the lifetime, the homo lumo gap recombination as a function of size, where we went from 25 to 38 or two, this is a 25, 38. And when you increase the big size of the cluster, lifetime become smaller and smaller. And you see the uh, lifetime, average lifetime go from 109 nanoseconds to 3.2 picoseconds, suggesting that when you decrease, when you increase the cluster size, lifetime decreases. But that has no physics behind it. If you tell that the size increases, lifetime decreases, it looks good, but you have to explain some physics behind it. So we were able to model this one to a famous energy gap law, which was as I told you, this was developed for organometallic molecules by describing the non radiated decay proportional to the homo lumo gap. And where we did found out the homo lumo gap from our measurements, and we determined the lifetimes from our uh, ultrafast measurements, and we fit this one to this uh, equation. It was able to fit perfectly, suggesting that the energy gap law which says that when you decrease the homo lumo gap, the lifetime should decrease. So this is kind of an universal scaling law one has to develop so that to understand how the size will affect or the how the homo lumo gap will affect the 
uh, lifetimes of these classes. Later on, we have been able to show the similar thing with another series of uh, uh, tertiary beta and thiol protected clusters. This is uh, in collaboration with one of my co collaborator in the in University of Mississippi. He made different series of uh, uh, gold uh, tertiary butyl thiolated protected clusters. And again, we did the lifetime measurements and we were able to show that energy gap loss still holds good for uh, this series of these clusters. Whenever you do one system, it should be able to uh, generalize for many, many systems. Make no mistake, there always will be certain exceptions for law, but you have to see a majority of things follow certain law. For example, this cluster is deviating from this linear behavior and where we show that that is because something happening in this cluster because of its symmetry breaking that is showing a different behavior. Otherwise, all the clusters, irrespective of what its thiol, what is the, how the protecting group, they should follow this energy gap law. And if you know this energy gap law, you can be able to apply them for applying, telling them how these things can be useful for solar cell applications. When you make it a smaller size clusters, they have a greater homolomo gap so that they can be able to efficiently transfer energy to titanium dioxide nanoparticle so that they can be useful for solar cell applications. In a recent study, we have shown that size dependent light size dependent light harvesting we worked on different sized glutathione protected gold clusters and where we have shown that gold 18 gold 22 and 25 atom label gold clusters can be used for non thermalized energy transfer it's important to differentiate between coming to the homolumo states even before it comes to the uh, its highest or lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, you can transfer the energy from very high energy states. This is one of the studies that we recently published in Solar Research Letters. So where we made 80 atom gold clusters all the way to 940 atom clusters with different uh, uh, dye molecules bound to it, what we showed was when you excite at very high energies, there is an energy transfer from the gold to this fluorescein dye and where we see for this three dyes, especially 18 and 22 and 25 clusters, where we see a higher photoluminescence, suggesting that higher energy states are giving energy to this dye and making it more fluorescent. So this is what non-thermalized energy transfer is. We have in turn to study why it was happening like that. We showed you that this cluster has an intrinsic non-thermalized state, but when you attach a dye, the electron transfer, or sorry, energy transfer from the cluster to the dye is much faster, especially in 18, 22, and 25, they were able to transfer the energy much more faster than its own lifetime. Whereas if I show you 67 and 102 and big clusters, there is nothing like that. They have no change suggesting that there is no energy transfer from higher energy states in these clusters because they have a huge density of states. So they come back to the ground state, I mean, uh, lowest unoccupied state much, much faster. So our story, the mechanism for that one was we were able to see in faster energy transfer time scales of 200 to 300 femtosecond faster than their internal conversion rate, making these clusters to transfer energy from not relaxed state, but non-relaxed states or something called non-thermalized states. This is one of the very first study where people have shown that even not the relaxed states can give energy, even the higher energy states before they get thermalized can transfer their energy and make them useful for optical applications. So like this, we study in different aspects of gold clusters with regards to ultrafast dynamics. So now I will switch to the next topic of optical imaging with gold clusters. So this is one of the study in a recent paper. People have shown in advanced materials, you can be able to image different kinds of, you know, oh, stroke or lungs with gold clusters as an imaging labels. For near infrared uh, wavelengths, one can be able to use this gold clusters for optical imaging because you can be able to make these clusters luminescent. 
but one important aspect of it is gold by virtue being a metal is non luminescent but even when you make it nanoparticle it is not luminescent then from last 10 years people are trying to see how can we be able to increase the luminescence of this clusters this is some of the literature people make gold clusters in proteins they were able to show a quantum efficiency of 6% but all the clusters with different kinds of xanthiols the quantum efficiency is much much smaller when in a recent paper in 2014 there was people have made this gold 22 clusters with a quantum efficiency of of around 8% for this cluster and zinping told that this emission comes from aggregation when this clusters get together and get emission get luminescence enhancement but we thought that that's probably not the case so we always you know study the mechanism behind anything so we may our collaborator dr lee made this cluster with a, and characterized with mass spec this is the optical spectrum and this is the photoluminescence very good quantum efficiency with this clusters around for 6 to 7% so then we went on to study the lifetimes and the temperature dependence measurements and what we found out was when you decrease the temperature your photoluminescence at this is a uh, uh, at room temperature at liquid nitrogen the luminescence increased but also the peak shifted not only the peak shifted it shifted around the place where we made this glycerol water mixture this is the freezing point or something like when you make the cluster rigid at this uh, temperature we saw an increased photoluminescence lifetime as well as increased quantum from this we were able to tell that this quantum mill of this fluorescent cluster can be enhanced if you can be able to make this cluster much more rigid in the sense that you stop all the non radiative deactivation we can be able to make this cluster give more photoluminescence so that's from that our story we were able to show why this light luminescence is coming from this cluster this cluster luminescence is coming from the staple motifs and they form beautiful catenin type of structures they give you ligand metal metal charge transfer state that gives you a photoluminescence and when you decrease it you go to a high luminescent uh, uh, triplet state that gives you a really really higher quantum yield at low temperatures what we wanted to see is can i be able to make the rigidified state that high luminescent state at room temperature so what we wanted to see can i rigidify the shell instead of low temperature can you use something else to make it uh, increase the quantum yield so we use this tetra octal ammonium bromide because of this this is a polar head group and this is the non polar trade group this is kind of surfactant this went and bound to the water soluble cluster took it into a non polar solvent like toluene and when we see this when it surfactant bound to the surfactant we say a quantum yield of around 60% this is one of the highest quantum yield ever reported for this cluster so what we have seen and seen here is that when we rigidify the cluster we see the luminescence lifetime increases for photoluminescence life uh, quantum yield increase that is not only for gold 22 we showed this one for gold 25 atom cluster gold 18 atom cluster when we can be able to rigidify the shell we are able to see the higher quantum yield and that's one this is the paper that we published in tax in 2015 when we took the cluster from water to toluene we made it very very luminescent so this is the famous rhodamine dye and our cluster is as luminescent or if not more luminescent than that of rhodamine cluster so the idea behind this if you can be able to rigidify the shell it is possible to enhance the photoluminescence quantum yield we establish this phenomenon using different kinds of system this is a collaborative work with uh, researchers from canada us uh, germany and china where we were able to see structure and formation of very luminescent gold clusters where again we showed you that showed people that when people make gold clusters in protein they are making interesting gold 10 cluster and when you rigidify this cluster using the surfactant 
you can still increase the photoluminescence. Same thing, you make the pasta within the protein, you get into very high luminescence and you break this protein with an enzyme cleavage, you will decrease the flor for fluorescence uh, <coughs> quantum yield, suggesting that the rigidity will always enhance the photoluminescence quantum yield of this cluster. This system we were further able to show with much more protein a uh, function as cluster. We have a collaborator, Somain made in the University of Mississippi, made with a gold clusters and a copper storage protein. Again, when you made these clusters in the protein, we saw a greater photoluminescence quantum yield here and long for photoluminescence lifetimes. We're able to use this one for optical sensors as well. In addition to that, we wanted to see if I can be able to make more luminescent clusters by sensitizing with an organic dye. We used a pyrene here. Our idea was we were able to make the pyrene label cluster, give energy to the cluster, gold cluster to make it more luminescent. That is what we achieved. We were able to make a gold cluster with the pyrene. We saw a little bit increase in fluorescence quantum yield from here to here. But that increase is a combination of this pyrene dye giving the rigidification to the cluster, but there is some amount of energy transfer, something like 20% in water, when it is in TOA, it was almost like 70% energy transfer efficiency. But the problem what we were having was, when we showed the mechanism, we saw that not only we have an energy transfer, but this cluster is giving back its energy to the pyrene in terms of electron transfer. So that electron transfer quenching is decreasing the photoluminescence of gold cluster. So even though we're able to increase the photoluminescence to some extent, but there is a delirious electron transfer back, electron transfer decreasing the photoluminescence quantum. Yield. So we went on to use different other systems like this is another system that we worked on with a fluorescein dye that people use for, for biological imaging. Fluorescein tag is always used for, for optical imaging of uh, live, cell, live tissues. <coughs> we functionalized this to the gold cluster. What we saw here was this fluorescein dye is a very good pH sensor in the sense that when you go from a low pH to high pH, your fluorescence increases because of the way the dye becomes a dye anion. So when you wave synthesize this gold cluster coupled with this fluorescein dye, so we characterize them with mass pack and we saw this absorption, there is really no change. But what we saw is an increased gold cluster luminescence, but also increased the dye luminescence. So not only the gold cluster luminescence is increasing, there is an ultra fast energy transfer to the dye, making this dye luminescence increase. And we're able to do an optical imaging, especially pH contrast. We're able to see at low pHs, there is not much of a contrast with the free dye and the gold cluster labeled dye. But when you increase the pH, you see a huge enhancement. It's almost like 160 fold contrast increase. So you can be able to see the same thing in live cell tissues. Uh, uh, we did it different pHs. We'll see this one more luminescent. Whereas the simple dye alone does not show, but when we add gold cluster with the dye, we have shown an enhanced contrast so that these kind of a, dye label clusters can be useful for optical imaging, both in vitro as well as in vivo applications. In a recent study where what we did was, we made this cluster not with one or two dyes, we made this cluster completely decorated with 18 pyrene dye molecules. This is a very interesting synthetic pathway. So for this to happen, we have to take the cluster, from water phase to a toluene phase and do this reaction in the toluene phase and then get back into water so that you can be able to have this many la pyrene label gold cluster. Well, this is the different amount of pyrene labeling. What we saw here was, this is a monomeric pyrene. A pyrene by itself has uh, this luminescence and 
This is your eczema, pyrene, pyrene stacks together, you get an eczema, and this is your gold cluster luminescence. So gold cluster luminescence is increasing, eczema luminescence is higher, monomer luminescence. So this comes in your blue wavelength region, this comes in your green and red. See what is this one? RBG, red, blue, green. You mix all of them together, you get beautiful white light emission in these gold clusters. White light emitting systems, it's something that you can be able to use for light emitting displays. And the beautiful thing part of this cluster is they are very much photostable. One can be able to use them for light emitting displays. So why this was happening? So we went on to study with an ultrafast spectroscopy and uh, ultrafast transient absorption as well as ultrafast anisotropy, we were able to show what was happening here. There is two important phenomenon happening here. When you are having this cluster with all these dyes, there is an energy migration happening between pyrenes. This is the kind of thing that uh, happens in light harvesting uh, photosystem in our uh, plants, where we have this chlorophyll is made up of all these porphyrins. There is an energy migration between all these porphyrins with unit quantum efficiency because that efficient energy transfer happens at very, very fast time scales. Not only we saw that, we saw an energy transfer from monomeric pyrene to the gold cluster and eximeric pyrene to the gold cluster. That monomeric pyrene gives you the blue cluster luminescence, that eximer gives you the green, and the gold cluster by itself gives you the red. Together, all of them, we were able to show white light emitting from this gold cluster. This paper was published in 2000, this year in uh, the journal Small, where we were able to show a white light emitting gold clusters. So in summary, I want to show that I have told you that we have been working on these gold clusters for some time. We, we not only use them for application, but also we study the fundamental questions regarding these clusters. One of the first study that we showed was energy gap law. One can be able to ease, you use this energy gap law and predict what kind of lifetime you expect for the cluster if you make a new gold cluster. And we have able to show a non-thermalized state energy transfer, energy transfer from not relaxed state but not relaxed state, the thing that is against the Kasha's rule, we're able to show that kind of a thing is happening in gold clusters. That's a very good thing because of the fact that when a light comes back, when you shine a light very high energy, they go by as a heat to the surroundings. Before coming, going down as a heat, you can trans, if you can be able to transfer the energy, you can be able to use that much high energy for optical application. When we also studied the mechanism behind the uh, photoluminescence of these gold clusters, and we have shown that if you can be able to rigidify a cluster, you can be able to achieve highly luminescent cluster. We are able to make fluor dye label clusters and show them for optical imaging applications and also increasing the photoluminescence of clusters. I hope uh, with this, I would like to conclude and thank for giving me this opportunity to present our work and I hope I might have rushed up. So is that time sufficient? Sorry. It's perfect. Is that fine? It's a perfect. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. I'll be glad to ask, answer any questions you have. Yes, sure. So Nanda Tiwari is uh, having. Uh, Saima, can you take over? Yes. Thank you so much, sir, for such an enriching session. We got to know a lot about the gold nanoclusters and about the luminescence and everything related to it. Thank you so much, sir. Now, I want to take the, uh, the first question Hello? is from Nanda Tiwari. Nanda? Hello? Hello, go ahead, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, sir, a very good morning. Good morning. Uh, I am Dr. Imran from Department of IT College. Sir, you very well explained about enhanced photoluminescence efficiencies of gold cluster by rigidifying the gold thylate cell. Yes. And you talked about the phase transfer catalyst where you mm -hmm. use quaternary ammonium salt as PTC. Yep. 
right. sir, I just I want to uh, uh, ask uh, that have you tried some other phase transfer catalysts like phosphonium salt? If yes, then what was the effect of uh, these particular phase transfer catalysts on photoluminescence? Whether the efficiency increases or decreases, or it is somewhat same effect like quaternary ammonium salt as for phase transfer catalyst. That's a good question. Actually, we tried different quaternary ammonium salts, not like uh, only this kind of an octal, tetroctal, you know, uh, CTAB kind of a things. But they did not only the tetroctal ammonium bromide gave you much higher photoluminescence. We never tried. Phosphonium salts, we didn't have that one. That's a good idea. We never tried phosphonium thing, but the carboxylate COO minus with this water ammonium is a strong bonding so that it can take from water to the organic phase. But it's a good question and good suggestion. Hopefully we can be able to find a phosphonium uh, uh, salt so that that can be used as a phase transfer catalyst to, uh, we did not try that, that. We should be able to try that one actually. Thanks for that suggestion, but it works. But the, among all this quaternary ammonium salt, tetractyl ammonium bromide was you know, more efficient than many other things. And we were able to dissolve them in different solvents and we showed the polarity effect too. Is that, uh, did I answer your question? Oh, okay, sir, thank you. Nanda, you can ask the question. Uh, good morning, sir. First of all, nice. I want to thank you, sir, for providing a very good information. Sir, my question is, the, uh, there is any or uh, difference between nanoparticles and a nanocluster? Nanda, it's a very good question. That's where the story is, like nanoparticles. Definitely, even though they are like, you know, especially gold nanoparticles, they do behave like metals. But when you make them much, much smaller than that, what I told as a Fermi length, you start behaving like a molecule, make a matter behave like a molecule. That changes the whole paradigm in this cluster business. People have shown like back in 1993, even a sodium is a metal. When you make it around less than 20 atom sodium, it become like molecule-like cluster. So this, when you become molecule-like cluster, it is becoming a macro molecule. Still 144 atoms, still behaving like a molecule, then it can be useful for you know, molecule-like application. But what when we showed our story is that it's not exactly a molecule-like cluster. This phenomenon in this one, the cluster behaves some kind of a hybrid behavior. Both a semiconducting behavior we have shown and molecule-like behavior for this cluster. So that's the reason they can be useful for those applications like solar cell applications, fuel cell applications, like uh, electrocatalyst, photocatalyst. Those, this cluster behavior makes them more useful than a nanoparticle of these uh, gold, uh, gold nanoparticles because they can catalyze chemical reactions now. You can do a hydrogenation reaction, you know, oxidation reactions with these clusters. So I guess uh, Priya Tripathi, you can ask a question. Okay, thank you, sir. Good morning, sir. First morning, of all, Priya. sir, thank you. Thank you so very much, sir, for the informative presentation, sir. So my question is on uh, this uh, nanoparticle, sir. As we have studied that silver particle or zinc oxides or titanium oxides are used in uh, food, sir, for, uh, as, uh, for preservative or as an antimicrobial, antibacterial property. But, sir, yes. there are evidences that have been found that they are cytotoxic, sir. Their cytotoxicity has been increased and they are uh, causing problems like uh, gastrointestinal tract infection or uh, cellular infection. Sir, what could be the substitute of uh, these uh, uh, nanoparticles? in food industry, sir, especially? That's a good question. Cytotox, especially some of the nanoparticles with little bit bigger sizes, like, you know, 10 to 20 nanometers still have shown, even though they have shown antimicrobial and different kind of properties, but still has shown cytotoxicity. Cytotoxicity, to avoid cytotoxicity, you should be able to make it much smaller in size. But when you make them much smaller in size, their reactivity increases. So there is a balance, you know, I cannot really give you a thing, but 
people take toxicology issues of nanoparticles, one has to study more. So that's where the nanoscience uh, research right now is going on is talk, uh, you know, even though they are useful for many pro things, but their cytotoxicity or the toxical, toxic effects of nanoparticles is very important thing to study. And that's where anything, if it has to be useful for real-time applications, one has to study the toxicity. If you don't study the toxicity, they cannot be used. Like the way when you do any drugs that people have to study the toxic, uh, toxicological um, parameters, same thing holds good for all these nanoparticles. What are the substitutes? I think you make them into a coarser nanoparticles, which inside one and outside, another side of a nanoparticle, which is biocompatible, or you make them biocompatible with other kind of a functional groups. That's one area of research people are working on where make these nanoparticles biocompatible and less toxic, but still remains their you know, interesting properties. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. And Thank Dr. Seema Joshi has a uh, question. Dr. Joshi? Yes, ma'am. Professor Gouda, uh, wonderful deliberation. Uh, Thank you, ma'am. My query is that since we are taking gold as a metal, can we replace it with a... Uh, will we getting better result with iron or... It's a very... Iron making them because they tend to oxidize much more readily than that of a gold plus. So that's the reason why we gold clusters are a little bit easier to make synthetically. Whereas when you make it much smaller iron nanoparticles, iron clusters, they tend to oxidize. They tend to react much uh, more efficiently. And you know, they like people have worked on iron oxide, Fe2O3, Fe3O4. They're very readily stable and they're beautiful crystal structures. Even their nanoparticles have interesting magnetic behavior, but making them purely iron without anything, it's a very difficult thing. So we worked on copper clusters, but again, copper has to be heavily, you know, protected. Same thing with a platinum cluster, palladium cluster, have to be heavily protected. You know, iron nanoparticles, iron clusters is a very interesting proposition, difficult to synthesize. Like the toxic, I was talking, thinking about the toxicology part because these all these heavy metals they will be more toxic, and we are using these nanoparticles, gold nanoparticles in immunotherapy. Yes. So, can we have some another suggestion for that? Any gold metal? nanoparticle? The one in, compared to other things, gold nanoparticle cytotoxicity is not as bad. You know, like people use gold nano gold by itself did not do as much damage compared to many other things. I have uh, some people, people did silver. One guy in Canada actually consumed silver nanoparticles so that you wanted to see that silver tends to get oxidized and they actually he had a real problem with that silver particle. Whereas on other hand, gold is not as cytotoxic as any other metal that you come across. All other metals, either in nickel or you know, iron, they tend to have a cytotoxic effect for sure. You know, platinum, palladium being much more heavier has mm -hmm. some effects, but gold being noble, one among all the clusters, gold is by far more safer. But gold nanoparticles, because of the uh, photothermal uh, therapy, people are using gold nanoparticles now because you shine light on it, you heat up, you can... Uh, kill your tumor. People are using for photothermal therapies in gold nanoparticles. But among all of them, gold was found to be more safer. Again, I, you oh. use light on it, it will behave more uh, you know, toxic, but without that, it is more safer. Okay, thank you. Thank you for thank you. answering my question. Will... Thank, you. thank you, Dr. Joshi, and talk... <laughs> thank you, Dr. Rama. Like, uh, like it is almost the midnight in Michigan, I think so. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you know, like, sorry, sorry. Thank we'll you very great, much for giving me the opportunity to you. You know, like, and we will not take any further questions. You know, like, because uh, you have to, you know, go to office tomorrow also. I'm really very yes. grateful. You, you know, thank you so much, sir. Thank and you, sir. Thank you. Very soon, like, please, if you have guys, anybody have questions, you know, you can write back to me. Yes. And if you yes. wanted to know more about university, please send me. And any student will be happy to have, and especially, you know, women's. 
in science and you know it's very important and what you guys are doing for women empowerment and girl child education is one of the great things that uh, like uh, the, the university is doing we will be interesting in just one thing you know like you know like you must be familiar with lucknow lucknow and yes, especially sir. this type of colleges regional colleges we don't have a lot of funds sir. so but right. you know like our you know like students our women students they have a zeal and they have a you know like good mind you know so like yes. we we are interested in sending like a one or two students just for a one week two week training exposure sort of thing so if you can explore things for us so we will be very happy to send one or two students to your institute so that they can get exposed and they can learn something from your lab you know it will be a big blessing from you know, for from you sure dr lawrence definitely i will get back to you with from we have an heineken institute of global education and we have some different programs here full bright scholarship programs and actually this kind of a thing that our university is actually looking forward to yes, thank you we so have much. some collaboration with different places but you know some of these things make really really you know important contribution for all the uh, you know educating you know minority base especially all us to women are underrepresented in science no doubt about it Yes. one has to improve the representation of uh, underrepresented students like girls in research it's very important and thing is that a good like, point actually yes we have like become like professors like we have achieved a certain goal now it is our duty you know to just provoke these girls you know to do something extraordinary and like yes uh, sir they they can do extraordinary things and yes. you know we have uh, shivi here and we can we see they are doing great things and they can all the people can do it all of them can do it and i definitely i'll take your suggestion and i'll go through our international office and we'll come back to you sir thank you so much thank, thank you very much thank you so much sir have a Thanks nice a have a nice night sir please good night sir. thank you very thank much thank you sir thank so, you sir uh, for attending to our queries now i would like to hand over the mic to miss srishti to proceed with the event over to you srishti thank you saima Moving further, I would like to welcome and introduce our first student speaker for the day, Ms. Shivi Saxena. Ms. Shivi Saxena is currently pursuing PhD in Chemistry from Western Michigan University. Her thesis include optical properties and applications of highly luminescent gold nanoclusters. She has done her master's in Chemistry from Isabella Thoban College, India. She has been a research associate in R&D department of Canopy Techno Solutions Private Limited, having worked at Krishnam Technologies Private Limited under a project based on water quality monitoring instrument development, she has received Dr. Nagler Scholarship for Chemistry at Western Michigan University in 2021. She has presented many papers and conferences and has three publications and a patent to her credit. We extend a warm welcome to you, ma'am. Over to you. Thank you so much, Shristi, for a very nice introduction of mine. I will share my screen. So, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Shivi Saxena, uh, currently third year PhD student in Department of Chemistry at Western Michigan University. And I'm happy to share my journey from master's to PhD and so on. So I did my master's in, uh, uh, from IT college in 2016 in chemistry. And uh, my first research experience was uh, the master's thesis project, which was chemical characterization of drinking water at different railway stations in Lucknow city, where we sampled uh, water samples from different railway stations. You know, the taps provided at different stations, so many passengers drink water every day. And then we uh, went to IITR campus for at water analysis lab for few uh, basic physical chemical parameter analysis. And we uh, did the uh, compare the stand, we did some analysis and we compared them with Central Pollution Control Board, World Health Organization and Bureau of Indian Standard uh, Permissible Limits. And uh, it was seen that the Ash Park Railway Station uh, water was uh, safest amongst all. Then uh, because of my research, uh, my interest in electrochemistry, I got my first job in Canopy Techno Solution, um, whose mentors are two professors from IIT Kanpur and uh, 
this is me working in electrochemical and reaction engineering lab in iit kanpur and my job was whole day to work with this instrument which is ab bipotentiostat or electrochemical workstation and uh, i was uh, doing uh, i was uh, designing protocols for testing uh, various electrochemical uh, reactions and uh, and i was making uh, a reference electrode these reference electrodes from the scratch and uh, there i was highly interacting with so many phd students who were mainly most of them were working in nano materials so which drived me uh, which uh, developed more interest in me for doing uh, higher studies in nano materials then uh, due to funds problem uh, i got uh, second job in kritsnam technologies and my first project was in collaboration in mit uh, in mechanical engineering department with professor rohit karnik and uh, they made this uh, dry sampling of water contaminants uh, for water contaminants uh using this uh, t back stir stick device so what is it is that it uh, it adsorbs uh, it has some resins which are highly selective for heavy metals and it uh, adsorbs metals from the water sample so uh, we did uh, we collect water samples from different water resources from kanpur and uh, like this is from uh, drain and then we filtered it we did we performed uh, filtration and then we uh, used this device testing we we tested it and then we uh, compared the result with uh, with the standard results in the lab uh, by using in inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometer and uh, so uh, our job was to uh, so the experience which i gained in masters for water quality analysis it helped me a lot and uh, i was able to uh, design the protocol for the testing of this device then um, within few three months i got project associate position in the same earth sciences lab and the professor in the same and uh, there we developed a water quality instrument the challenge was to uh, make instruments uh, for wa continuous water quality monitoring for basic physico chemical parameters which one which was uh, done uh, which was never done before and uh, because of some of the limitations so uh, we had some sensors and we tested it in a hydraulics lab in iit kanpur and then we our client was ericsson so um, we had some of the deployments of our instruments in, uh, in these areas like in municipal tank in tehri uttarakhand then in some other water bodies in kanpur then the second project which i was working on was multi parameter liquid quality measurement system so um, the ericsson's demand was to make a such low cost uh, instrument which is more portable so we use smartphone which is easily uh, nowadays everyone is having that and uh, with that we uh, we made a, a device which is using test strip uh, based on calorimetric detection of uh, for water parameters and we were able to see more than 14 different parameters uh, at one go with this device so the camera of this uh, smartphone is using as a is used as a detector and it is seeing the colors from the strip and based on the rgb value combinations um, it is able to detect uh, all the parameters at one go so in that uh, project i was uh, working on the initial testing of the device and also i was uh, working on sampling and then uh, comparing them with the results in the lab with uh, ion chromatography and then again with icp ms so um, after all these things i uh, felt that uh, there was something missing like uh, i was doing all this work but i was really interested in fundamental science to work more in that so i was uh, simultaneously giving my gre and tofel exam and then uh, luckily i got admission in western michigan university in fall 2019 and uh, i pursued my uh, so i am pursuing my phd since fall 2019 in nano materials in ultra fast laser spectroscopy lab my um, advisor is dr guda and uh, these are other lab members sukanya saha lampros zianos and this is me so um 
currently my phd topic uh, is in optical properties and applications of highly luminescent gold nanoclusters so um, dr guda have given a very uh, nice introduction of gold nanoclusters i will uh, again give a brief introduction of them so between nanoparticles sorry between nanoparticles and molecules um, uh, there lies something in between them which are uh, which is a unique uh, uh, I, uh, which is a unique thing with uh, known as cluster and this entity is uh, something which is having properties which is lies in intermediate of the molecules and nanoparticles and uh, so um, we have nanoparticles when we have metal metallic nanoparticles they are semiconducting and uh, um, they don't have uh, uh, st surface structure well defined and uh, when we synthesize them they always are polydispersed and hence we cannot have a structure property correlation in them and uh, their optical properties are more like semiconductors and uh, one more drawback of these nanoparticles are apart from this size, uh, bigger size is that the photoluminescence uh, and most of the other optical properties uh, are, uh, they does not lie in visible region. So in order to have something uh, which is having uh, an entity, which is having a, a well-defined surface structure, and uh, whose, uh, whose structure properties can be correlated with its optical and electrochemical properties. Um, uh, in 1980, uh, there was uh, in the old nanoclusters was invented by a uh, modification of brush Shippen reaction, which was uh, initially used for the synthesis of uh, gold nanoparticles. Now in gold, uh, what happens is when the size of gold bulk gold when we etch it so much that it reaches 2.2 nanometer then quantum confinement behavior is seen in these uh, in these uh, gold entities and uh, in that we see that the now um, bulk gold materials bulk gold materials are uh, metallic in nature but when the size comes to 2.2 uh, nanometer then there's a uh, then a part, then uh, instead of having metallic character these uh, go these gold entities show semiconducting properties that is there's a band gap between a uh, conduction band and valence band between them also not only the band is there like semiconductors but also there are a discrete electronic excited states are there and that's why they show molecule like optical properties so um when we have a cluster uh, which is protected with such ligands which are like glutathione like thiolated protected ligands um, such ligands uh, which are uh, which are non toxic and uh, these are actually some of them are actually uh, present in biological systems as well for example glutathione and then um, other uh, proteins so uh, then then these clusters show excellent uh, photostability and low toxicity and the photoluminescence of these clusters now lies in visible range. So with excellent photostability and uh, low toxicity, good biocompatibility, these clusters can be potentially applied for biological imaging, biological labeling applications. They're also used for targeting drug delivery applications in chemical sensing in, um, as photosensitizers and also in light harvesting applications which sir have already defined. So um, now the problem with these cluster is, one of the problem statement is that they have very low photoluminescence quantum yield. And now uh, research, uh, research uh, groups from different all across the world, they are actually trying to enhance the photoluminescence quantum yield of these clusters for practical applications. Now, um, this is the Jablonski diagram of old 22 glutathione 18 cluster in water. Now, uh, these, uh, this cluster show these transitions where uh, there's an intra core transitions between uh, SP, SP band, which is a uh, LUMO, and the uh, HOMO is, uh, and there's a uh, in inter core uh, relaxation dynamics, which is lying in the less than 200 femtosecond range. 
apart from that there is a, a, a core to shell relaxation uh, which is uh, from uh, home which is from lumo to homo and uh, this this relaxation is always uh, is most of the time uh, associated with triplet excited state deactivation pathway uh, and it is it has also two uh, triplet excited states one is uh, low low quantum mirror state and another one is high photoluminescence quantum mirror state now it is seen that um, upon surface rigidification of these clusters the low quantum yield state can be disappeared or can be destabilized and uh, uh, and the uh, high photoluminescence quantum yield state is all only there which is enhancing the photoluminescence of these clusters now so many research group across the world they are working on uh, uh, ways to enhance photoluminescence of these clusters by ligand modification it is seen that the uh, origin of these uh, clusters luminescence is basically ligand to metal metal charge transfer that is some of the metals from staple motif they charge transfer it to the core metal and there's a aurophilic interactions in them which is uh, one of the reasons for uh, the quantum uh, the photoluminescence in these clusters and uh, if we have uh, electron rich ligands they can also uh, enhance the photoluminescence then uh, it is also seen that the metal doping like silver doping in clusters also is associated with aggregation induced emission enhancement in them then surface rigidification which is one way to uh, eliminate these non radiative relaxation pathways these uh, sorry these non radiative relaxation pathways it can be uh, the, uh, it can be eliminated by surface rigidification another way is chromophore functionalization that is if we have the ligands over the metal surface which can be conjugated with some of the chromophores like pyrene like uh, amino fluorescein then uh, there is a uh, foster resonance energy transfer mechanism which is taking place which is enhancing the photoluminescence of these clusters and then uh, there is one more way is binding clusters in confined assemblies that is um, mm, embedding the cluster in a uh, rigidified environment and this is also uh, one of the way of uh, uh, eliminating the non radiative relaxation pathways in the clusters so um, now again the problem statement is that if we conjugate a chromophore to a cluster will there always be a enhancement in photoluminescence well the answer is no um in the previous studies of my research group uh, we have shown that uh, when uh, the gold 25 glutathione 18 cluster when it is uh, conjugated with amino pyrene uh, with uh, ligand and uh, then um there is an electron transfer uh, in the time range of 580 femtosecond from gold core to the uh, uh, chromophore which is not only uh, decreasing the fluorescence emission of the pyrene which is the chromophore but there is no such enhancement in the uh, cluster uh, photoluminescence now this is the fluorescence count as you can see that the electron transfer is taking place and uh, this is the uh, green one is the pyrene fluorescence and uh, this is actually decreasing when it is conjugated with the gold 25 hexanthiol cluster now another possibility apart from this is that there can be an energy transfer from the excited state of the cluster to the uh, chromophore uh, conjugated to it this was one of the paper in 2018 where uh, two amino fluorescenes were uh, conjugated with a glutathione gold 22 cluster and energy transfer was taking place from when they were when it was excited uh, uh, and then uh, the photoluminescence it was seen that at ph 7.8 that is when this amino fluorescein is in dianionic form then uh, it is it is able to uh, accept energy from the excited state of gold 22 cluster and we see that the photoluminescence of the uh, amino fluorescein is increasing whereas the of intrinsic cluster that is around at 670 nanometer it is not much increase so um so from these studies we we see that 
with chromo 4 functionalization there's not only just enhancement of uh, photoluminescence of gold clusters which is possible but there are other possible pathways which are in the uh, time range of uh, nanoseconds to femtoseconds which can be uh, the reason for uh, decreasing photoluminescence of the intrinsic cluster so um, one of the curiosity uh, uh, was that uh, how uh, this uh, we see that uh, the resonance energy transfer phenomena will be uh, is there in chromophore functionalization but how will be uh, how it can we can see it if we have uh, more number of chromophores attached to the cluster so this was one another paper and uh, it was seen that when uh, instead of one pyrene, two pyrene ligands are uh, attached with the gold 22 glutathione 18 cluster. We see that there is an enhancement in photoluminescence of the cluster. Now, there was uh, in my previous slide, I have shown that uh, there was electron transfer, which was the uh, reason for quenching of intrinsic fluorescence of the cluster. But with two uh, pyrene ligands attached, um, the photoluminescence is in enhanced of intrinsic cluster to 14%. So um, another uh, point of interest was that if we have two pyrene, then how will be the course of the luminescence of the cluster when it is all functionalized with the uh, chromophore, that is uh, pi all pyrene 18 ligands. So this is the photoluminescence spectra of the cluster uh, with, uh, with the excitation uh, wavelength of that of pyrene. And it is seen that in excited state, uh, not only the cluster's luminescence is manifold enhanced, but also the monomeric and excimeric uh, pyrene system is also enhanced. So uh, this is, uh, and it was seen uh, with uh, transient absorption measurements and uh, other uh, transient uh, measurements and global fit analysis that uh, there are some of the, these are some of the photophysical events which are taking place over the cluster when the cluster is uh, 18 pyrene conjugated with the, uh, with the glutathione one. And we see that there are three uh, uh, pathways uh, which are taking place. One is 160 picosecond energy transfer from excimeric py pyrene to the gold core of the cluster. Then another one is 3.5 picosecond energy transfer from monomeric pyrene to the gold 22. And then there was energy migration between pyrenes. Now, as sir has told that uh, this is uh, analogous to what we see in uh, so many light harvesting systems in uh, nature. And um, just the difference is that there is no electron transfer which is taking place here in the end, but uh, in the light harvesting systems of many purple bacteria and many of the photosynthetic system, it is seen that the, uh, that the last, uh, last thing is electron transfer. So um, this beautiful system of 18 pyrene ligand conjugated with a gold 22 cluster, uh, it shows enhanced photoluminescence. Now, another, uh, another strategy for enhancing protoluminescence our research group is working is by surface rigidification. And uh, this, sir is all, this sir has already explained that when uh, the glutathione cluster is uh, ion paired with tetraoctyl ammonium and toluene, it is phase transferred. And uh, then with this ion paired uh, rigidified system, uh, the photoluminescence of cluster is so much enhanced that it is comparable to that of rhodamine V-dye. Now, the current work which I am doing in the lab is uh, enhancing photoluminescence by different pathways, that is chromophore functionalization. And these are some of the results of my uh, recent experiments and which I have used gold 25 glutathione clusters and I have um, seen its uh, course of photoluminescence enhancement in uh, organized assemblies. And one such system is vesicles. So we synthesized small unilamellar vesicles in the lab and which were characterized by dynamic lab scattering. And then we see its course, uh, the course of photoluminescence of clusters in these vesicle system. And we see the enhancement of PL. And uh, another system is hydrogel. Now hydrogel is hydrophilic polymeric uh, 
uh, systems in which uh, when gold in which gold clusters can be embedded and in these rigidified uh, environment also we see the photoluminescence uh, enhancement in cluster uh, with the increase in the concentration of hydrogel so uh, i am also working on some electrochemical aspects of these clusters and uh, so uh, after phd what i uh, wanted to do is post i wanted to become a post doctoral researcher because um, i believe that all the skills and all the experiences i am gaining here is will help me in becoming an independent researcher and i really wanted to broaden my area of uh, research and uh, currently i am seeing that uh, what in the nano material field uh, in the area where i am working is um, it can be potentially uh, utilized for light harvesting applications for biological imaging and for chemical sensing so i want to do broaden my knowledge in this area and uh, i really i hope that being in uh, post doing post doctorate will also uh, enhance my mentorship skills so um these are the references and uh, i'll be very happy to answer your question yes sir thank you shivi you know like, it is like a you know like a proud moment for all of us you know like and uh, you were like among the best students and i think so like only one thing uh, you know like uh, you had like was a zeal and uh, hard working and i like all your teachers are here dr seema joshi she has helped you a lot you know and uh, dr bhartia and everyone you know like they miss you and they love you a lot so like i will give uh, further to saima saima thank you so much ma'am for such an amazing session thank you for giving us such profound information now i would like to mention that the platform is open for the question answer session participant can raise their hands to put forth their questions okay we have mr iklaq way sir you can ask the question yes so thank you thank you saima so good hello Good sir hello. i am very happy to see you after long time on the virtual tour same here sir you are the inspiration of so many so all the students in fact here who are joining us today i want to ask you one question that uh, can you we use the photo pigments like chlorophyll or uh, that is the green uh, based green leaf based the synthesis of the gold nanoparticles and we show the imparting the photoluminescent behavior because i think these are the chemically synthesized gold particles too. sir um it is seen that uh, uh the gold cluster is actually stabilized so you can see like if you know the clusters uh, structure it has a gold zero core and then gold one shells which are uh, stabilized by a uh, staple motif which is having a uh, thiolated ligands now why this cl this cluster is able to we are able to synthesize is because of gold sulfur bond chemistry because gold sulfur bond is very stable and that's why it is able to passivate uh, it is able to be passivated by so many thiolated ligands so um um like uh, we have tried with different ligands but it is seen that uh, the clusters are not that much stable and uh, though we can have gold nanoparticles which are which may be which may not be having that much uh, like you know atomically precise surface um but uh, uh, for clusters i think uh, we need uh, some ligands like uh, glutathione or some of the ligands which are many electron rich so yeah these days the silver nanoparticles are too much synthesized from the green chemistry using the different plant extract material leaf stem root by using the natural reductants so yes, because sir. in the gold in gold in the gold nanoparticles they are less in the, in the research area they are totally now chemically synthesized still so i want to just know that about green synthesis yes sir gold gold nanoparticles can be uh, synthesized but for clusters i am not sure at this moment and uh, i have seen that uh, uh, so many research groups are using sodium borohydrate as a reducing agent and uh, apart from that uh, in in earlier times like uh, like in 90s 
uh, Zai were using uh, CO2 as reducing agent. And uh, I haven't uh, read any literature so far regarding uh, the reduce, reduction of uh, gold with uh, these green uh, uh, compounds. Thank you. Thank you. So we have our next question from Dr. Bhatia. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, Shivi. In fact, good night for Thank you. you. <laughs> How are you? And I'm so, so proud of you. And Thank you, ma'am. The work you are doing is so very interesting. So I would just like to say that when you were using pyrene, right? Yes, so ma'am. As you functionalized your particles with pyrene. And you said mm -hmm. that fewer pyrene when you used, then the luminescence went down. And mm -hmm. as you increased the number of pyrenes, the luminescence started going up. So can yes, it yes. be a reason that when you're using more pyrenes, then there is rigidification also happening? Because you, by rigidification, we say that the luminescence goes up. Yes, ma'am. So ma'am, actually what is happening is that, um, so, so, um, so at the same time, like when we have uh, one uh, pyrene attached with a gold cluster, so uh, electron transfer is the main deactivation pathway of uh, uh, like uh, after after excitation. Mm -hmm. But when we have so many uh, pyrene attached with these clusters, then what happens is that this electron transfer still will be taking place, but the main pathways which will be by which the cluster will be uh, deactivating its energy after excitation will be uh, by these energy migration and energy transfer processes. So for that, we use uh, some of the techniques called transient absorption and transient anisotropy measurements, which is able to distinguish whether the uh, electron transfer event is happening because because same energy transfer and electron transfer events happens in almost similar uh, time durations. That is from femtosecond to picosecond range. So for that, uh, we use uh, some of the techniques called um, transient absorption and transient anisotropy measurements, which gives more detailed explanation about the uh, like course of uh, interaction of the uh, these pyrenes with the cluster. And if there is a electron transfer, then along with the absorption measurement there is an anisotropy of these ligands is also okay. changed and we saw that there is no uh, ligand anisotropy change so that's why we concluded that there's no electron transfer pathway and the energy migration and energy transfer from pyrene to the cluster is the main pathway which is enhancing the luminescence of the cluster okay, okay. so and yes. how did you make these uh, these uh, you spoke about cold clusters the glutathione cluster so yes, like top down you must have used. How did you make them? So ma'am, uh, what we do is first of all, we take glow trichloride solution and then we uh, have it with the glutathione ligand. So glutathione has some reducing property which makes gold three uh, gold in plus three uh, state to gold one state. And then uh, after that, uh, we make the core of the gold. So which is uh, made by adding strong reducing agent like sodium borohydrate. It cannot be done by weak reducing agent. And then by following the literatures and protocols after uh, uh, etching of the gold, we are able to uh, like uh, stirring uh, for a few hours, we are able to make a uh, atomically precise clusters in high yield. Although when we make these clusters, these are, it, it is not just these cluster which we make, but there are so many side products also which are there. And uh, we uh, do uh, fractional precipitation and sometimes polyacrylamide gel electro electrophoresis by which these clusters need to be separated. And we see this uh, only a certain size clusters uh, of monodispersity. Thank you. Thank you, Shivi, for taking those questions. Bless you. Thank you. So uh, we will not take any further questions, like because like uh, it's already a delay. And I think so you are in the, your lab or where are you? <laughs> yes. Sir. Oh my God, like in mid midnight, you know, you're working too hard, you know. So you'll be going to your house also. Anyways, best of luck. God bless you. Uh, take Thank care. you, sir. So God bless you again. Okay. So, so over to okay. you, sir. Now. Thank you Thank so you. much, ma'am, for attending to our queries. I'm sure it helped our participants to get a better insight of the lecture. Thank you, ma'am. I would now like to hand over the mic to Ms. Shaista to proceed with the program. Over to you, Shaista.
Thank you, Ms. Saima. Taking the event further, I would now like to welcome and introduce our fourth keynote speaker, Dr. Vishwanath R. Patil. Dr. Vishwanath R. Patil is an associate professor in the Department of Chemistry, University of Mumbai. He has done PhD from University of Mumbai and completed his MSc from North Maharashtra University, Jalgaon. His area of research interests include water-soluble polymers, light-emitting polymers, polymer nanocomposites, synthesis of coordination compounds, and nanochemistry. He was a member of Board of Studies in Chemistry, University of Mumbai, appointed by Vice Chancellor. His research projects include synthesis and studies of water-soluble polyesters containing ethylene, diamine, tetraacetic acid, and their metal complexes, and stable blue light emitting polyfluorine containing diphenyl anthracene and terphenyl base light emitting diodes. We extend a warm welcome to you. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Shaista, for a kind introduction. Uh, I hope my voice is audible. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, at the outset, I thank organizers, uh, IQAC or uh, uh, Isabella Tobin College, then Department of Chemistry, uh, for inviting me here and giving me this opportunity to interact with the young scientists of this uh, uh, forum. Uh, well, uh, the conference theme is related to the applied chemistry, so I thought I would uh, uh, deliver the lecture, which is based on uh, which is related to the theme of the conference, but uh, Dr. Alfred uh, told me that you have to also motivate the student for doing research, uh, uh, research uh, for the research purpose. So I thought I will make the lecture uh, in a, which is having dual purpose that I can also motivate the student along with that I can also interact with the student with two of my topic which I'm uh, going to deliver in this lecture. So let me start the sharing uh, the screen. So I will request uh, Dr. Alfred, sir, if there is any technical glitch, please let me know. You can yes, sure, sure. call me. Okay. Visible. My screen is visible. Yes, sir, it is visible, sir. Okay, sir. So the topic of my talk is applied chemistry for social cause. So basically, I'm a polymer chemist, as Shaista has introduced my uh, research areas. So I'm doing uh, polymer chemistry in the lab. My students are playing with the polymers. They are tailoring the structure of the polymer. They are preparing the polymer, uh, light emitting polymers, water soluble polymers. And uh, these light emitting polymers, they are also utilizing to fabricate the devices, uh, light emitting devices of these polymers. So being a polymer chemist, I always say that polymers are wonderful materials. So people say that polymers are very dangerous to the environment. They sustain environment for longer time. They reduce the fertility of the soil. But yes, it is true. And uh, But there are certain reasons. If you uh, utilize this polymer, if you prepare this polymer with certain uh, responsibilities, I think polymers are wonderful materials. I request you all that just look around in your room uh, where you are sitting and just see how many items are made from the polymers. I think your answer is 99% items are made from the polymers. And if tomorrow I am saying that don't use these items. Don't use polymer uh, tomorrow onwards. So how the life would be? Life without polymers actually might not exist. If we go back to the development of our civilization, our civilization started from Stone Age, where the, the man at that age was using stony materials like uh, arrowhead, then sword, septi items, then kitchen maze, all were made from the stones. So that era is known as Stone Age era. And later on, he found, found another alternative that is bronze, which was more sophisticated than stone. So slowly, 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 he replaced all the items by bronze. So he moved with the bronze and that era is known as bronze age era. 
because he was having bronze as an alternative so uh, he again found iron as an alternative in next level and he prepared uh, all materials with the iron because iron was more cheaper than the bronze and that era is known as uh, iron era when i was a, a small kid so we used to use the buckets in the bathroom that was made from the iron so nowadays that bucket is made replaced by plastic because we found plastic as an alternative to the iron because it is more lighter more cheaper and easy to recycle so people uh, started using plastic or polymer so nowadays every every item is made from the the polymer as you see so laptop then mobile mobile screen everything is made from the the polymer so we say that it is a polymer age it is a polymer age and now after polymer we are not having an proper alternative to the polymer so unless and until we are not having proper alternative we cannot leave the polymer um, and we cannot move to the next level so if we see the uses of the polymer since morning to evening we are using the polymers i will i will quote some uses here in in, in short so polyethylene milk bag in mumbai we are getting the milk we are getting milk in a polymer bags so that bags are made from the polyethylene then polyamide bullet to waste that military or the the police are, uh, or army people are using and then uh, i was just googling through uh, uh, i was just searching the uses of the polymers and i found artificial heart is also uh, coming in the market in so a lot of research is going on into this and it was implanted to the person who was having uh, 63 age who was 63 age uh, years old but later on he died because he was having uh, some other issues uh, but a lot of research is going on in the area so so the person or the patient who are suffering from heart diseases they will get a great relief out of this research work and then uh, the polymers can also be useful in invisible barcode technology which we had invented in our laboratory in 2018 and uh, i think uh, dr alfred uh, was there when i delivered lecture which which was based on invisible barcode technology in mumbai um, so since then we are knowing each other and another use of the polymer is antiviral nanocoating which we recently developed in our laboratory for the safety of the doctors who were who are into the treatment of the covid-19 patients so that was the uh, the the uh, recent uh, invention in our laboratory so as i said earlier in the um, beginning that the theme of the conference is related to the applied chemistry i think you you have already heard about the applied Applied chemistry. What is applied chemistry? And what are the different branches? What are the different uh, areas that covers in applied chemistry? It is physical chemistry, material chemistry, and chemical engineering, and etc. etc. So my area comes under the material chemistry because it is properly, uh, basically, it is related to the polymers and it is related to the nano. So it is sort of interdisciplinary areas that we are combining polymers with nano. Okay. so um, purely we are also doing polymers but this this uh, this is our next level this is the next level of our work that we are combined we are doing interdisciplinary areas so uh, let me uh, tell you here that i am dividing my lecture into uh, the three parts first part i would be talking about the barcoding which we had uh, invented in our laboratory so sort of uh, history of the barcode that we'll discuss and then we'll go to the uh invisible barcode technology which we had invented in our laboratory and after that if time permits i can also discuss about the antiviral coating that is recent invention that we had uh, done in our laboratory uh, i i won't be discussing much chemistry but yes i am uh, i'm discussing how we can design the topic and uh, what are the different parameters that we need to think before uh, starting our research uh, and how we can uh, do the good research so that topics i will cover so uh, just imagine that uh, you are into you are standing in front of the supermarket uh, just be relaxed you are standing standing in front of the uh, supermarket now what we do when we enter into the supermarket we take a trolley and we go to the respective section right so uh, so we can uh, collect the different different items and we can place those items in the trolley like i can uh, collect shampoo biscuits oils and other groceries and then once i finish i go to the cash counter 
the person sitting at the cash counter what he does he just scans each and every object and he hand over the bill within few minutes he hand over the bill he is not even bothering to see what you are purchasing whether it is oil biscuit or shampoo he is not bothering at all he is not even bothering about the uh, about the grams of the uh, item you are taking or quantity of the item you are it just scanning and handing over the bill so what he is exactly doing he is saving your time as well as his time and what he is scanning he is scanning something that is known as barcode that is known as barcode uh so well what exactly is the barcode since barcodes are very important you can find barcode on each and every object now so what exactly the barcode is so barcode is an optical machine readable representation of the data that gives something about the object that gives you something about the object and it can be either in the form of vertical lines so you can see here it can be in the form of vertical lines or it can be in the form of various shapes like triangle square or circles or any other shape or hexagon etc etc and it can be readable by optical scanner so optical scanner can give you the different that information that is stored in the barcode so in india we are using this barcode which is in the vertical form so so there are basically there are two types of barcodes one is one dimensional barcode and other is two dimensional barcode so one dimensional barcode is in the form of vertical lines and two dimensional barcode is in the form of shapes and there is no compulsion what kind of barcode you are using whether you are using linear barcode or whether you are using matrix barcode that is not compulsion but provided that it should be readable throughout the world okay so this is the minimum condition that is required to for the selection of the barcode so we are using upc universal product code that is vertical barcode one dimensional barcode in india mostly and it contain 12 numeric digits it contain 12 numeric digits and these numbers gives the information about something about the object so like four six digits gives us the information about generic com generic company prefix it gives the information about the company which company manufacture it at what date it is manufactured and history of the company and then next five numbers are also known as item reference number these numbers gives information about the properties of the item so product size package size what is the type whether it is chemical liquid solid or whether it is gaseous upon that information we can collect we can get from the item reference number and last number is a check digit which is obtained by some calculation of generic company prefix and item reference number we will not go into the detail part of that calculation and upc is this universal product code is used in united states canada uk and many other countries like india so this is about something about upc i hope you can you, you must have get some knowledge about the upc so question is since barcodes are on every object we the question arises in the mind that who invented the barcode the barcode uh, was first invented by norman joseph woodland and bernard silver actually idea was norman joseph woodland and he shared his idea with bernard silver uh, both were working in the drexel university uh, philadelphia and uh, with the help of the discussion which was uh, happened with bernard silver uh, norman joseph developed the barcode which was in this form which was in spherical form circular form later on as per the requirement they converted this spherical form into the linear barcode one dimensional barcode vertical lines and ncr is the first company that developed the scanner for scanning uh, this barcode and ringless gum which is very famous gum chewing gum uh was the first item that was scanned by using the scanner so this is about the history of the barcode and uh, norman joseph putland and bernard silver filed their patent in 1952 we require uh, scanners to read the barcodes so those are known as barcode readers so nowadays we are having a laser scanner we are having led scanner we are having camera based scanner your mobile can also be used as a camera nowadays you scan the uh, the, the barcode uh, in order to pay your money by google pay or uh, any other the money paying apps 
so your mobile can also work as a scanner so there are several scanners available in the market uh, so what are the advantages of this current barcode system there are many advantages it is very smaller it is very thin lighter uh, than other any other tax easy to use so uh, anyone can print and uh, based on the on the object it is less expensive since only ink and a paper is in one it is accurate and sensitive everywhere you, you can read the information store inside the barcode it saves the time of retailer and customers yes no need to stand in the big queues uh, for longer time and today barcodes are found on almost every item so these are the advantages but any system any technology it is having advantages along with that it is also having disadvantages so barcode scanner need a direct line of sight so you need to bring object to the scanner okay you cannot scan the object um, from longer distance not more than 15 feet and the scanner should be quite close and it it can be scanned individually so there should be a person assigned for the scanning so you need to bring the trolley to the the, uh, the cash counter the person will not come to you and so this is the uh, uh, this is the process of scanning the uh, object individually um, by a particular person who has assigned a duty it can be easily damaged you can damage this barcode by your nail and once it is damaged you need to replace the item or you need to replace the tag okay so there is no way to scan the product and people do this kind of job they change the tags they 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 misuse the tags they misuse this barcodes so this is the uh, one major disadvantage of the this current method that it can be misused it can be altered now i am coming to the next level of the lecture that is uh, the our work that is invisible barcodes now how we thought of inventing the invisible barcode technology just go through this slide it is uh, it is uh, some incidents air crash flight ms370 air crash it was happening 2014 you may be knowing about this uh, what exactly happened i will uh, just uh, go through the slide a malaysian airline the number is ms370 uh, it was um, uh, flying from kuala lumpur to beijing it took off from kuala lumpur airport for beijing and within 15 minutes it got disappear from the radar now what exactly is happened nobody is still knowing whether it got crashed whether it, it got hijacked nobody is knowing so there are more than 60 70 theories are there regarding this incident people are saying that it is crossed and it got crashed into the indian ocean some are saying that it it got hijacked and people all to 39 people are there uh, in their custody so there are lot lot many theories uh, available on the net and the disaster committee or search committee found that there are three wreckages found in the indian ocean the small pieces of the aeroplane and they are they are saying that it is believed that these these wreckages are of same plane they are not confirmly saying that these wreckages are of same plane just imagine the mental condition of the passengers 239 passengers the relatives of those passengers uh, so whether the person who was traveling into the aeroplane is died or whether he is alive they are still waiting for their arrival so they are in the dilemma now we are saying that the science is so advanced and we cannot answer this question whether these wreckages are of same plane or they are from different plane we are not having answer so you consider this incident uh, for next lecture for next slides now another another incident ghatkopar air crash ghatkopar is area in mumbai so those who are the foreign parties participant for them this is the information that ghatkopar is small area in mumbai one charter plane was flying over the ghatkopar and uh, it got crashed how many people died there in this incident five people five persons died four were traveling through the charter plane and one was a poor guy that was just walking over the footpath and oil of the plane um, failed and he got it completely burnt and he died at the spot the disaster committee or search committee submitted its report and report says that the aeroplane was an assembled aeroplane 
what is the meaning of assembled aeroplane means body of the aeroplane was made by other company engine was made by some other company so this kind of uh, uh, the the instrument or device is known as assembled device or instrument so here the entire aeroplane was assembled in that case if the things are assembled you cannot completely go for the uh, the insurance uh, claim so straight away insurance company will say that are uh, this this uh, uh, aeroplane is made up by different companies so how can you how can you claim for this so they straight away they will throw your uh, insurance application application to the dustbin this is the case of forgery so people do this kind of uh, uh, work they uh, change the engine of the uh, vehicles and body of the vehicle of different different companies so this we uh, this two incidences we concentrated so we thought that being a researcher can we work in this direction let us ask the question to ourselves can we invent some label and if we label if we label that uh, uh, if we ob- label the object by using that label it may be aeroplane can we read that label at any point of time can we label each and every part of the aeroplane like engine then outer body and anything any part can we label it can we read that label at any point of time maybe after many years maybe after 50 years after 2 2500 years is it possible can we uh, even after air crash if the aeroplane is completely burned can we still read that label can we invent a mechanism by which we can identify manufacturer detail information or product information forget about the uh, aeroplane suppose we have any object we got any object can we get the information about that object so who manufactured it at what date it is manufactured so this question we ask ourselves and uh, further we ask many question do non living things have dna this is the new uh, phenomenon new uh, this is very weird kind of question i am asking do non living things have dna like living things we are having dna and we utilize that dna we use that dna for solving many criminal cases and many uh, other uh, medical problems do non living things have dna like suppose if i am use i am inventing some label and if i am sticking that label to any object can i read that label at any point of time even after 2500 year of, or after 5000 years so can i use that label like dna will it be visible invisible would it be breakable non breakable or dna is breakable or it is degradable if we burn the body proof is over there is no any way to solve the criminal cases so is it possible in non, in case of non living things if yes can we identify non living object easily whenever we want if we label this way so then it is very easy to identify the objects like in earlier case ms370 aircraft if we label this way then we can easily read the label and then we can easily say that yes this object is made this object is belonging to that ms370 aeroplane so this question we asked and we started working in this direction and we prepared polish state synthesis of gold nanoparticles and i guess uh, in earlier uh, lecture cv uh, saksina said about the gold nanoparticles so similarly we also thought about the preparing the gold nanoparticles but in different way so we tried collecting the information about this uh, the synthesis of the gold nanoparticles and uh, we studied the properties of the gold nanoparticle through the literature and we found that there are ways various ways to uh, prepare the gold nanoparticle many people prepared the gold nanoparticle by reducing the chloroauric acid by tertiary amines by amines this is the normal procedure so we have utilized same terminology we have utilized same method uh, but in different way as i said i am a polymer chemist so i try to uh, incorporate polymer in every research so this a time also we had utilized the polymer but it is the prepared polymer it is the polymer that is available into the market so we utilize this polymer epoxy polymer epoxy resin oh, if i say the name of the polymer you may not be knowing 
you say you will say that me i may not be knowing that on the polymer but yes it is areldite areldite is available into the hard, uh, hardware shops so but we purchase this uh, areldite from huntsman company because huntsman company is supplying this epoxy polymer to the companies which are manufacturing the outer body of the aeroplanes so we thought that we can utilize same polymer if we want to give the answer to the problem we'll utilize same material so we thought that we can prepare same we can utilize same polymer we converted this linear polymer into the cross link polymer by using gf amine we have utilized many amines but just for an information i am saying that we have utilized gf amine so gf amine is used as a curing agent here curing agent is the word that is pioneered by uh, charles goodyear uh, which was accidental discovery of the charles goodyear when he uh, kept sulfur uh, in contact with the rubber so he then we uh, came to know that for vulcanization of rubber sulfur can be used as a curing agent so here we have utilized jeffa mine as a curing agent for uh, for the linear polymer in order to convert the cross link polymer now why cross link polymer because we wanted a we wanted a, a porous polymer so we utilized porous and J, by using jeffa mine we have created this environment tertiary amine environment okay let me go to the next level so this is the normal method by which we can use, you know, prepare the polymers by chloro reducing chlorosic acid with this uh, amines tertiary amine and we get a gold nanoparticle similarly if we prepare cross link polymer with this environment and if we are bringing gold solution to this in contact with this environment it can convert in the form of nano and you know that once the gold is getting converted in the form of nano it is invisible to naked eye it is invisible to naked eye so we utilize this terminology we have prepared various uh, polymers by using this so this is the uh, cross link polymer which we have prepared and when we are putting a drop of gold solution here it percolates inside because it is having porous nature the gold solution percolates inside the uh, object and while traveling inside the object it comes in contact with the um, tertiary amine environment and it gets reduced in the nano form and it becomes invisible to naked eye and uh, it can be visible when we are focusing the radiation of particular wavelength to this radiation to this nanoparticles and you can see the nanoparticles so these these are the disk which we have prepared by epoxy polymer uh, there are the methods by which we can prepare the disk by sandwiching the glass fiber or carbon fiber into the epoxy polymer we can give why uh, glass fiber or uh, carbon fiber because they give sturdiness to the polymer that is just the uh, use of uh, that is just uh, the aim to use this glass fiber or Uh, carbon fiber uh, which is sandwiched into the uh, epoxy polymer so this is the glass fiber disc uh, which we have prepared and we have written uh, the latest au code au stands for gold and code is just uh, we thought that we can use it as a coding purpose so au code we we have written by using capillary when we try to write au code uh, just a small drop you can put and it goes it percolates inside just within 10 second you can wipe out the uh, Uh, additional liquid additional solution and i will not go into the detail part of the characterization of gold nanoparticle uh, we have we use all techniques uh, to characterize the nanoparticles whether the the solution has converted in the nano form or not okay so this is the new uh, technology that we have proposed this is the disc that is made from the carbon fiber sandwiching the carbon fiber into epoxy polymer and if you put the drop of the gold a solution here of course chlororic acid solution it percolates inside and uh, if you write something like like au code so it will be invisible for uh, you in the normal radiation but uh, at ultraviolet radiation you have to optimize the wavelength at ultraviolet radiation it is visible so that is just a small uh, technology which we have proposed it is a simple thing nothing great uh, but we have mm, proposed it in innovative way so these are the two disks which we have prepared uh, this is the with carbon fiber and this is with the glass fiber okay 
so uh, let me go to the next slide so let, let us check the videos of the slide uh, yes this is the uh, disc with carbon fiber uh, sorry uh, glass fiber and we have written au code on the this and now we are flashing the radiation you must have seen that in normal radiation it is uh, the relators are invisible but at ultraviolet radiation the relators are visible we are changing the wavelength uh, to 54 nanometer it is clearly visible au code now let us check whether these uh, these relators or whether the nanoparticle formation is just above the surface or not let us just scratch the surface and let us check whether these are on the surface or uh, these are inside the object let us flash the radiation again mm, slightly visible 365 nanometer 312 nanometer again slightly visible and at 254 nanometer it is clearly visible but yes there is still question in the mind that whether these are at the surface or whether these are inside the object let us still crash the some more area these videos are available on the net you can check with uh, our name or my name now let's let us check whether uh, it is inside the object or not 365 nanometer then 312 nanometer slightly visible and 254 nanometer it is clearly visible so even after scratching the surface still we can see the letters uh, let us go to the next slide and uh, let us check with the carbon fiber disc. So this is the disc that made uh, that is uh, in which the carbon fiber is used. We have written the AU code again. 3, 254 nanometer it is clearly visible. Okay. So let us scratch the upper layer. Yes, you can see and in normal radiation, the disc will be, uh, look like this and there will be no later scene. Let us crash the surface. And let us check whether it is above the surface or it is inside the surface. 254 nanometer. It is clearly visible. So it is proved that the, the nanoparticle formation is inside the object. So we propose that this technology can be useful for aeroplanes in order to label each and every part of the aeroplane so that if there is anything happen with the aeroplane, we can read that information. Ships, expensive luxury vehicles and other automotive sector, we can use this. And in the defense also, in order to write the information, secret information we can use. So we uh, we communicated the DRDO uh, with this technology, and I'm very happy to say that DRDO has adopted this technology. They are using this technology for uh, writing information on the missiles. So Air and ARDB uh, department of DRDO, the, now they are, they are having the project with us, and now we are developing this technology for uh, for them in in the form of paint, in the form of paint instead of having epoxy disc now we are preparing paint for them so that they can write the secret information uh, uh, in on on the missiles and in paint technology also you can uh, utilize this technology you can just paint the wall and write the information which is invisible to naked eye which will not be seen to the naked eye but uh, with uh, flashing the radiation you can see the letters the question arises in the mind that we are using gold whether the technology is economical or not. So we worked on all aspects of this economic part. And I'm very happy to share that uh, this for tagging one wing of the aeroplane, we require only one less than one rupee, one cent, one less than one rupee. So, so this uh, technology is very highly economical. So it is easily, uh, it can be easily applied. So special properties of these barcodes are it is invisible so we can use this technology as a barcode so these are invisible no effect of temperature because gold is highly stable no effect of water and weather and non-degradable as long as your object is there epoxy object is there your barcode will be there no uh, it can remain as it is for several years like if it is uh, aeroplane is crashing in the sea and if you attack this uh, tag uh, with this technology you can read the information at any point of time no chance of alteration because it is inside the object so no one nobody can do the forgery 
uh, it can be used in different security purpose and tagging almost all non living objects uh, which are made from the epoxy polymer or which can be made from the uh, any um, cross link polymer which is having a tertiary environment so this way we can use uh, the technology for tagging the aeroplane because uh, the the body of the aeroplane is made from the epoxy polymer with 55% carbon fiber so there is no need to change anything I just uh, prepare the gold solution and just tag the prepare a stamp and just you can tag uh, the each and every part of the aeroplane so no need to do for any further modification and um, the luxury cars also you can uh, utilize this technology because luxury cars like uh, for example bmw uh, 3 series gt it is having 65 percent carbon fiber in the body so that you, you, you can you can utilize uh, this technology there also so this technology we have communicated to the the advanced material that is very popular journals in the material science um, and it got published the paper is having only six pages and uh, the impact factor of the journal current impact factor of the journal is 30.84 and it is one of the uh, highest impact publication of our university so uh, the so when we published this article the news was everywhere and the media was in our lab if you are doing something different the people will follow you so this way this time the media was there in the, our laboratory and so they wrote articles on our research and it started with the first Marathi news that was Bastuncha DNA and social means uh, the DNA of um, non-living things. So when this news came, uh, I I I got surprised. I have not done anything in in uh, on the DNA, and the news was related to the DNA. So I contacted reporter and saying that uh, so my research is not related to the DNA, and you you had given the heading that. It is related to the DNA of non-living things. So he said that, sir, you please go through the article and then you will come to know. And when I gone through the article and yes, yeah, we utilize this terminology in our next research, DNA of non-living things like that. Then we started with another newspaper and on, on the televisions also we were there. Why I'm showing this, uh, this, this photograph? Because uh, there are many, many students who are doing their postgraduate uh, courses here and they must be in the dilemma that what to do in the next so i'm saying that you please think about the research uh, you can see this student th this is my phd student who did this invisible barcode work so he's from very small village he was hardly uh, speaking english he was uh, having english problem also because he was his medium was vernacular medium and uh, he did this work so overnight he was staying in the laboratory and he did a lot of hard work now uh, just imagine where he is now he is a scientist in swiss federal laboratory and he's earning more than one crore in per annum so i'm just telling this to motivate you all just do research that think about the research and try to observe the problem that society is having study that problem properly in all aspects and then try to find the answer to that problem uh, being a researcher how i can i can collect the information how i can solve i can try i will try to solve this problem and then you try to give the answer in innovative way i'm sure the, the, the people will be behind you you will be a famous researcher so this is these are the photograph uh, uh, after preparation on this disc and after after our invention and these this, this is me in harvard university uh, for this work i had been to harvard university for a uh, few days this is our collaborator from harvard university amit nagar so uh, so this is all about invisible barcode technology i think uh, uh, alfred sir do i have a time for five ten minutes five minutes so five minutes sir, like because next speaker is already waiting yes sir. yes sir, yes Yes, sir. Uh, recently uh, we had invented antiviral coatings uh, for PPE kit and N95 masks for the safety of the doctors. So the story behind this is that uh, in Mumbai we have a lockdown since March uh, 2020, 17 March 2020. And one of my students who was staying in the hostel, uh, he could not uh, go to his place because of uh, the sudden announcement of the lockdown. And he was in the hostel, uh, he was staying alone and uh, only three or four students were staying. 
so he continuously calling me that sir let us do something let us do something uh, and let us try to answer at least one or two uh, uh, problems that people are facing so we being a polymer chemist we thought we had zoom meetings with uh, our collaborators and uh, we decided that let us do something for the doctor safety of the doctors because that time many hospitals were shut many laboratory uh, pathology labs were shut and we thought that let us answer uh, their problems so uh, we collected the data i will go through uh, quickly through the slides we collected the data how many doctors uh, have tested positive how many hospitals have closed unfortunately their data was not available on the you know, who site or any government site we collected the data from the newspapers and we again asked questions to ourselves can we make doctors more safe can we uh, prevent these doctors for having uh, from having viral infection can we prepare some virus proof pp kit and masks or can we invent some magical chemical that can be sprayed and the covid 19 virus will get over so we thought in this way and uh, we decided that we will prepare some antiviral coatings and we obtained pp kit from km hospital mumbai and we observed that there are many challenges it was hydro hydrophobic in nature even water was not sticking on the on the pp kit and how we can coat the antiviral coating on the uh, hydrophobic uh, pp kit and mask so, but these are many challenges uh, were in front of us and we are we also observed that there are four kind of antiviral coating by that uh, in in uh, we can so we we had also observed the mechanism we also studied the mechanism of antiviral coating how antiviral coating can work with antiviral anti with with the virus so uh, finally uh, by using medically grade polymer and by using some nanoparticles uh, formulation and we prepared the antiviral coatings and this is my group which we have prepared and this is the student and that was stuck in the hostel mr roshan rani and this is my collaborator uh, he is my first phd student who has his own company swachh urcha alliance and he is master in coating so we thought that we can collaborate with him and these are the properties of our coating that within 4 year 4 hours we can prepare the coating and these coatings are very stable safe to use medical grade uh, chemicals we have utilized in this and uh, is it can be easily dried in 15 minutes and we can also easily convert this coating in a spray form that time we were having only uh, the bottle of the perfumes and we utilized those bottles in order to convert it in, in order to spray it on the mask and it gives 100% efficacy uh, we have uh, submitted the sample to ccmb hyderabad and we got the result from hyderabad and um, more important is that low cost and it is economical so we propose that doctors can use so these are the result from uh, ccmb hyderabad that uh, they uh, tested this uh, coating uh, on against the sars covid 19 and we got the 100% uh, uh, 100% uh, more than 100% uh, efficacy actually and i got a call from ccmb hyderabad that what is the formulation in your sample because we are surprised to see the result and the results are more than 100% now they have tested it for uh, 30 minutes and 60 minutes because there is lot of long queue for the sample when we submitted the sample and we got the result after one one month and 30 one uh, month and 15 days means 1.5 months they took so it is huge queue so uh, we 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 uh, this was the advantage actually even after uh, uh, this many days the samples are stable and uh, now we are going to the next level we had a meeting with the ccmb scientists and uh, they have accepted that let us go to the next level and now they are they are undergoing some additional tests and soon it will be uh, in the last level uh, so this this coatings can be applied to the many uh, and this time also since it was uh, for the society so we had lot of Users on this entire laboratory for a few days was occupied by uh, the reporters, and uh, uh, this was uh, almost in all India. This news was there that Mumbai University has invented antiviral coatings, and those coatings are very active. So um, I hope the students will think about doing research in this way. And again, I am saying that you try to observe the problem and uh, try to answer that problem in through your research. I am sure. so you will be a great scientist thank you very much uh, i would like to answer few questions if you have
Yes, thank you so much, sir. Thank you, the... appreciate it. And now over to you, Saima. Yes. Sir. Thank you so much, sir, for such an interesting session. It acquainted us with a lot of new information. I never thought of such a deep chemistry behind barcodes. It was really interesting. Thank you, sir. Now I would like to mention that the platform is open for question answer session. Participant can raise their hands. Okay, we have our first question from Srishti. Srishti, you can ask the question. Very good morning, sir. This is Rishri Desai from uh, IT College. Sir, I have studied about the antigen antibody kits uh, which we use during the COVID testing and other testing, just like Vidal test. So, at that, in that kits, we use the gold uh, particles when we bind with antigen antibody kits. So, generally, I've studied that uh, we only use gold nanoparticles. And I couldn't find any justifiable reason that why we use only gold particles. Like, there's any other gold particle which binds well with the protein structures, or what so is? You're the... talking about which part? Whether you're talking about antiviral uh, coatings or you're talking about invisible barcodes? Because gold, I, I have used in uh, invisible barcodes only. And for antibody coating, there was a other formulation that uh, that I, I have not disclosed because it is uh, it is ongoing research. So I have not disclosed which anti which uh, nanoparticles or which uh, chemicals which formulation we had used. So you are talking about which part? So I am talking about uh, so just the uh, general antigen antibody kits which we use for different tests, Vidal test, COVID nineteen test kits which we use. So uh, sir, after the sample which we put in the sample well after that they have the gold coating with antigen coating like with the covid 19 antigen we have gold coatings so we only use gold coatings apart from that i have never studied there's any other metal coating in that so what is the chemistry i have studied somewhere that there is a surface chemistry behind, behind it but still i couldn't find any justifiable reason for that so i have not studied about this uh, antigen kits ma'am actually <laughs> Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you, Shristi. And now next question, Saima. Next question is from Suchi. Suchi, are you there? Yes. Yeah. Am I audible? Yeah, you yeah. are audible. A very, a very good morning to you, sir. It was such an insightful session. I absolutely enjoyed it. Um, sir, I found uh, invisible barcodes very intriguing. Uh, it was like we are protecting certain information, as you mentioned, that it was the DNA. But can we expect that in future it could be used to protect highly informative information? Like it's like we are we are in a way protecting something, and we are putting a seal of invisible barcodes over that, and then we are protecting in it, and it is uh, solely to one person who can just uh, you know. Uh, yes, ma'am. So actually, uh, as I said earlier, that there is uh, there are advantages, there are disadvantages also. So our system was also having some disadvantages. So invisible barcodes that we invented. it was having drawback that anybody who is having uh, ultraviolet gun they can read the information that was actually the major disadvantage of the information and if we are supplying this to drdo then then um, the 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 person from other part can read the secret information if he has uh, is having ultraviolet gun so that was the disadvantage so we uh, uh, overcome this problem By by some another technique that is and another modification that is elemental barcodes here. So you cannot read the information even if you know that there is information stored inside the object. You cannot read that information. That part I will. Uh, it is under uh, process now. We are uh, developing those technique you know, for the RDO. Okay, sir. So thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much uh, for your uh, you know like time. Our next speaker is almost all, already here, so like I will let you go. Thank you so much, and uh, like hopefully, like you will come here like in Lucknow and meet us personally, and uh, like it will be very good. And our students uh, liked your uh, talk very much. Thank you once again, sir. Greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for attending to our queries. I am sure it helped our participants to get a clear insight of the topic. Thank you, sir. I would like to hand over the mic to Mama. Thank you, Saima. Without any further delay, I now take this opportunity to welcome and introduce our sixth keynote speaker, Dr. Archita Patnaik. Dr. Archita Patnaik is a professor in the Department of Chemistry at IIT Chennai. 
Her research interests include molecular self-assembly and functional material. Having completed master's and PhD from Banaras Hindu University, she has also completed research tenures as an AVH fellow, a NASA fellow, and a Max Planck Research Fellow. She has been a member of subject expert committee for the member in chemical science uh, for chemical science, women scientist scheme of DST, and serve committee member in chemical sciences for early career research and national postdoctoral fellow scheme. She is also editorial advisory board member for the Journal of Chemical Thermodynamics and Journal of Chemical Sciences. We extend a warm welcome to you, ma'am. Over to you. Um, a very good morning to all of you. And it's, uh, it's wonderful listening to the very interactive talks. I uh, did watch uh, students being very, very active uh, uh, first of all, uh, let me thank the organizing committee and specifically uh, Dr. Lawrence uh, for inviting me um, to share with you a uh, few of my experiences, I would say. I wouldn't uh, really speak to you on uh, the core uh, research problems we do. Definitely, I'll touch upon that. But uh, more than that, I thought I would uh, share with you as to how a career is built because you are all uh, youngsters, you are all uh, looking forward to coming up as uh, tremendous scientists, terrific scientists, uh, very creative and all. So this talk will have uh, essentially two parts. The very first part would um, touch upon uh, some of my experiences, like I, as I said. So I will uh, start now sharing the screen with um, all of you. Um, so let me just uh, try sharing the screen. Uh, um, yeah, so, so I will begin with uh, by the, uh, just let me, Just a second, yeah. Um, yeah, so, uh, so what uh, I begin with uh, my salutations to the teachers, the process of our learning and, and our educational institutions uh, that have been bringing in so much insurmountable energies and the knowledge, the wisdom and the opportunities and that has been making our lives meaningful. And so definitely salutations to all the teachers that are present uh, now and all the teachers that have taught me and me and myself as a teacher for all these years to this wonderful institution of learning. Um, so uh, my research uh, has been mostly uh, constricted to restricted dimensions. That means I, I focus on the structured interfaces and so part of this talk uh, will, will be uh, focusing on the hydrogen bond directed functional materials at uh, modulated or controlled interfaces. Um, as we know, you know, when you restrict a dimension, when you go from bulk solution to uh, the surfaces, two dimensional surfaces, the whole science uh, changes, the whole structure changes, the whole dynamics of the process changes. So therefore, how do these thermodynamics and kinetics control the structures? such that their structure property relations um, become very characteristic and very specific. Anyway, um, so that I will be, uh, you know, touching up on um, after I speak to you more from my experiences as to how I had taken it up uh, as, as my career, how chemistry came into picture and what does education mean to all of us? And so when you see uh, the, the, what is the central object of our education? And that is how Sri Aurobindo has said, the central object of our education is to have clarity on a national level. Most often what we do, we are inculcated with a general shapeless idea and some enthusiasm corresponding to our sentiments and sometimes haphazard applications. So in order to enrich 
our education and the educational processes and the institutions, the conception is at the root of our culture. And so he says that in any country, the best education that can be given is to teach the students the true nature of the country, its qualities and its mission. And so their nation has to fulfill what is the quality and the mission of the country or the nation that has to fulfill, has to be delivered to the students. And its true place in the terrestrial concept without the spirit of imitation and without ever losing the sight of the genius of one's country. These are very strong words and these are extremely well-framed sentences uh, by Stuart Winder. And what it says is, uh, is, is a need of the hour in our country. So even if you look at the global science, the pursuit of excellence, the pursuit of excellence is an ambitious journey. And so if you remember uh, what um, our uh, father told us, Mahatma Gandhi told us, he said, live. Live as if you were to die tomorrow and learn as if you were to live forever. So therefore, commitment to creating a more diverse and inclusive chemistry enterprise for all of us that would like to pursue a career in chemistry or in, you know, in physical sciences for that matter, is, is very important. A more diverse and an inclusive chemistry is, is, is very, very important. Today we have gone from interdisciplinary to cross-disciplinary sciences. And uh, so an important essential facet is the continued growth and the factor of innovation. So when uh, we start to uh, you know, bring in a project, let's say we start to work on a project, essentially we conceive an idea. And we hypothesize that idea. That means we place before a hypothesis. And based on the hypothesis, we fix our objectives and hence the uh, necessary experiments. And the precision in the experiments is also very, very important. And after having collecting this, uh, collected the data, we try modeling this data, try to fit that to a theory. And then we find what are the intricate aspects of that system. I would say that this particular event is an applied chemistry conference. But you see the applied applications and the core theory, basic facets of science, they go hand in hand. And they're highly coupled, complementary to each other. They cannot leave uh, without each other. So unless our core theories, the core hypothesis and the core um, uh, creative thoughts are proper. I don't think we can apply any. So as a scientist, we need to really know this before we craft a career. And so um, what is there for science? I mean, understanding nature is science, actually. And uh, so understanding nature is doing science. Evolution of life is from the assembly of enzymes and membranes, I'm 100% sure. All of you. I've just tried showing here certain collages. You know, what do they tell us? I mean, the indirect meaning of this is if you bring in these collages and they uh, talk to each other in a specific fashion in space, you must have studied in your organic chemistry. You would have seen, you know, stereochemistry plays a very important role. And so similarly here, other than the thermodynamics and kinetics, here the spatial orientation plays a very important role. And that is where the change in the free energy at the two-dimensional surface makes a great meaning by bringing in the surface tension onto the picture other than the chemical potential that you see the surface excess as you see. These terms at constant temperature and pressure, you can make them very easily zero. So the change in the free energy on a two-dimensional surface would definitely depend on the area, surface excess, the chemical potential, the number of components one deals with, and the surface tension. But these are all very much controlled by the actual structure that you design. Like these molecular architectures or the superstructures are built from the unit tectons, very much like our, uh, you know, DNAs, very much like the 
basic building blocks of life. Similarly, I always felt that the career is built in collectivity. And so therefore I said that uh, when we do science, we need to understand nature. But when we do science, we need to also understand our environment. And hence inclusivity and collectivity play a very, very important role in taking up one's career. Uh, so the next slide, uh, I just wish to you know, define what we understand uh, by the meaning of building up a career. So it can be individual, it can be collective. And it, I tell you that even after 40 years in this uh, journey, I must tell you this is an endless site exploration. And so in the process, designing bold ideas, new ideas, imagining better ideas, then information is always more important. And so therefore, blessed are those who take a leap towards the future, not by simply picking on certain projects which have been already done and then varying a little part, a minor part and then going ahead. That is definitely not a very, very nice idea. So designing bold ideas is, is, is extremely important for moving ahead. Now, in thermodynamics, you have studied about state functions and path functions. And so when you look at you as an individual, and where we say our career is actually a journey, it is not a kind of destination that you reach instantaneously. And so if you bring in work as one of the thermodynamic parameters, we define work as not a state function. Why? Because simply cannot integrate do W from initial state to the final state and say that the total work done is a difference between the final work done and the initial work done. Whereas the total work in principle is a summation of all these minute little do Ws that you have done throughout your career and throughout our working life. And so therefore I say that this is an extremely important facet to understand when one steps into this kind of a career path, that work is a path function. And hence, you as the individual, you are the strength, you are the fiery spirit, you are the melting pot. But all these little do Ws that you do, they sum up and give rise to the final work that you Contribute to yourself first, contribute to your environment, contribute to your institution and to the environment, and hence a global contribution. So this is what I have been telling uh, the students here at IIT Madras uh, for over uh, two and a half decades. And I always tell them that your career clock has already started ticking. Even when you are a student, your career has already started ticking. And now you see what is uh, displayed on this uh, screen is, uh, see, I, it, uh, this talk cannot be interactive at this point, but I would have really asked you, I would have interacted with you, but what you're seeing is a cosine wave. And this, if you think, you can, you can explain this, you can uh, you know, discuss this in very many forms. So all that, that we are seeing is on your Y scale is amplitude, on your X scale is time. And you are going through maximum and minimum, maximum and minimum at a certain time. Right? This time can also be you know, converted to uh, theta, which has a different meaning altogether. So the moving wheel is giving us that. Now, what I meant to say by saying this is we as uh, doers, we as scientists, we as workers, or we as researchers, Many times we're confused. We uh, do not know whether we would focus more on to teaching, more on to research, or do I take up industrial problems? When you are a scholar, when you are a student, you also must be thinking, you know, what kind of subjects would I 
fix my attention more intricately. So, but in any sphere, one is singularity is the only focus. So, focus on a definite core. Interdisciplinarity has come on in a very big way. But to adapt to interdisciplinarity, you need to be a master of your core subject. And if you can pursue interdisciplinarity, it is always nice not to tweak the surface, but to be a master of multiple subjects. And this is possible. And uh, then I always, always thought of, um, we are as humans, we always think of recognition. So we think of our publication records, we think of impact factors, we think of edge indexes, we think of what is, what is the quality and the quantity of our uh, research outputs. You see, if you have designed your project as novel, even if you don't publish in a very high impact journal, it doesn't matter. Until and unless it is uh, just a repetition of something which is existing in the literature and then you are just speaking. So I always tell students that uh, it is very, very important. A perpetual winner is one who can equilibrate and endure him or herself. And that is the that is the this is the only clue that is the magic in taking up anyone's career as such uh, to the front. So uh, when we are teachers, I have always felt that personalizing teaching uh, has had a. I'm sure that there are many teachers in the audience, and I'm sure that they are terrific teachers. And uh, I hope that uh, they would uh, agree with me that personalizing teaching and going beyond and beyond being a teacher actually plays and pays. Uh, this has been a very tremendous experience, uh, you know, dealing with these uh, students who are uh, somewhere down the line. You know, they come from very humble backgrounds, but they are the key. And uh, so there has been tremendous learnings in the very process and the learning never stops. And I would say that we should always make this as one of our most important properties and one of our dimensions that uh, this endless learning for any researcher and for anyone that wishes to go ahead. So this set of slides uh, is, um, I'll conclude with this particular slide. And this, this is a paper which came in the, the journal Nature in uh, 2013. And uh, so there was a question as to whether a scientific genius is extinct. So the, the um, author of this paper is uh, Simon Chan. And so he uh, writes very concretely that he fears that this surprising originality in the natural sciences is a thing of the past. He says that this is what I had um, written here. And uh, so it's, uh, he says, he essentially brings in the distinction between who is a creative scientist and who is um, actually a scientific genius. I mean, I'm, I would, uh, I mean, I'm definitely, I would definitely bat for both. But he defines so beautifully, I'm sorry, I think this is just very... Uh, so he says, he defines that a creative scientist contributes ideas that are original and useful. But a scientific genius, however, offers ideas that are original and useful, but they are surprising. So sometimes the serendipity is being brought into the picture. So, so all that, that comes here, while discussing in my perception and my opinion is a scientific genius can always be very uh, very surprising i mean you you are ready to journey into the unknown think of an idea in, in that idea strikes you do not hesitate to pursue it and so he gives an example of uh, he says that uh, since he utters that scientific genius is extinct he brings in uh, the fantastic uh, posture that uh, Albert Einstein had exuded in his uh, non-famous times. So he says that the days when a doctoral student would be the sole author of four revolutionary papers while working full time as an assistant examiner at a patent office. 
And so he says, as Einstein did in 1905. But I don't agree with uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Simonton completely because we are seeing that. And per se, our country is moving more and more towards that. And it is with good hands, like innovative researchers like all of you. And so this is, the, there are very many opinions, there are very many doubts, but we are slowly reaching, you know, the, the, to reach that apple is, um, I would say that uh, there isn't uh, uh, much time and uh, space left. So now I'll just touch upon uh, our, uh, the kind of research that we generally do in our labs. So I'm focusing more and my research students um, have been mostly focusing on the curvature control surface pattern. We have just you know, heard about uh, synthesis of nanoparticles and how these uh, typical nanoparticles from epoxy resins could be used on the surfaces of uh, airplanes. You know? And so that was terrific uh, applied work. But this applied work, you know, one of you was asking why it is uh, the gold and why not any other metal. You know, it is a very simple answer that, you know, gold is a noble metal. You cannot afford to take. There's intense radiation over there and you can't afford to make any compound formation on the surface. So therefore, there should not be any oxides. There should not be any radiation um, a disintegration of the molecular systems that you take. So essentially as a, as a noble metal, gold has been used. But my work, as much as I'm going to talk to you, will be very core. And how the core chemistry or core science or core chemical physics can lead to systems which can be applied later. So we, uh, um, you, you see, uh, when we are talking of specific patterns, these, these uh, let us say, these nanostructures that are made, I'm speaking of curvature control. So that means these are, these are controlled in such a way. There are structural controls, there are morphological controls, there are environmental controls. They are done in such a way that their electronic properties are very characteristic of their geometries. And when you talk of their structures, there comes a parameter which is molecular tilt. So molecular tilt, is it possible to define and to quantify the direction of a chemical bond? You, you take for simple examples of a simple lipid. It will have a head group, it will have a tail part. The tail part will be hydrophobic and the head part will be hydrophilic. So is it possible as to how you can define a molecular tilt? For example, the direction of the chemical bond, because that controls beginning from a single molecule to look at to looking at the average molecular tilt angle and to look at how they self-organize, and not in the bulk solution but at a constricted dimension. That is, you 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 will see in the, the next slides as to how the typical molecular structure controls the molecular tilt and hence the electron transfer, because today any application you see depends, on, most of the applications, they depend on the electron transport characteristics. So chemistry at structured interfaces are mostly, they, they have to begin with proper design. And so therefore the design systems are these. You can have donors, acceptors, separated by bridges, you can have lipids, lipid bilayers, you have bifunctional nanostructures, and you can have various diaggregates, which are optoelectronically active, and you can deal with, you know, bio and photo inspired surfactants, which have judicious balance of hydrophobicity and hydrophilicity in the structures. And how does one look at this? One does real time spectroscopy. And it is not just the real time uh, spectroscopy, but these spectroscopies are characteristic polarization modulated spectroscopies. If you uh, linearly polarize light, if you polarize this as S and P, the direction of the electrical vector of the electromagnetic radiation changes. And hence, 
its absorption with the molecular system changes rapid and hence the intensities are very different for a s polarized light used for a particular system and for a p polarized the intensity ratios are very different and you can find out the dichroic ratios and there are certain mathematical formulations from where you can find out molecular orientation so since i said our focus has been on two structured interfaces interface modification you can look at this two dimensional surface tension you can one can do a lot of micro voltammetry in situ and uh, along with that there is a lot of molecular modeling electronic structure calculations and looking at their dynamics in these restricted dimensions as well as when they are isotropic in three dimensional media are are uh, actually the uh, demand of the day so uh, i um, i just i will be showing you certain examples uh, but i have very uh, restricted time so what i thought of um, uh, to talk to you about is the intricacy even in a simple hydrogen bond you know these hydrogen bonds the type of hydrogen bonds can control the interfaces very very intricately very very uh, crucially towards forming functional materials so what is shown in this particular slide if you see this sensor this is a water dimer and so we are just looking at the hydrogen bond that is being formed by um, okay not uh, the hydrogen bonds uh, being formed between two water molecules so what is shown over there there are two parameters which are important of course you know the hoh bond angle and then the hydrogen bond distance which is given as roh and the other one is the angle theta that means the rotation around this this hydrogen bond it should be very flexible right so therefore considering these parameter as well as if you look at this uh, right hand side panel you can see that between two simple water molecules you can have various kinds of interactions that means you can have electrostatic interactions polarization interactions charge transfer interactions you can have non bonded interactions like dispersion interactions exchange repulsions like you might have and van der waals interactions that you might have heard in the form of linear jones potentials these are called as non bonded van der waals interactions mostly 12 and 6 potentials responsible for uh, attraction and repulsion essentially but you see there is a intricate variation between what we understand by electrostatics and polarization what we understand between polarization and charge transfer so if you now look at this uh, potential energy profile what is plotted this is actually the distance between the two distance between the hydrogen and the oxygen between this in this water dimer and so you see the overall potential energy profile goes as you would have been taught the uh, structure of hydrogen molecule what you have done you while learning uh, the structure of hydrogen molecule you would have taken a cartesian coordinate axis you would have fixed one hydrogen atom at the origin and you would have brought the other hydrogen atom from infinite distances what if you look at the inner coordinates you have a nucleus you have two nuclei and you have uh, two electrons so you do have six different kinds of attractive and repulsive interactions and if you take cumulative you get a potential energy profile like this and so this tells you what is the binding energy that binds these uh, two water molecules right and this is the repulsion part which becomes asymptotic to your y scale to the energy scale and this is your attraction part now when i switch over to this uh, this uh, hydrogen bond that has been formed between hy in hydrogen molecule you have talked about a covalent bond between hydrogen and hydrogen atom hydrogen atom a and hydrogen atom b here we are looking at two simple molecules and their interaction and hence if you look at this potential energy this black curve uh, all are black but as you can see the minimum energy profile is the total energy that is a binding energy and so this binding energy in principle is a mixture of 
Bundle was that is the frozen interactions, the polarization term, and the CT term. The purpose of showing you this is to just give you an idea as to how intricate, simple, how intricate can the interaction between two simple hydrogen water molecules can be, and how intricate are these interactions. So when you switch over to different systems. And if you modulate your interface structure by a hydrogen bonds, you will you have to essentially deal with every individual of these terms. And uh, so our uh, our group has been mostly working on uh, hydrogen bond switching at gas liquid or air water interface. We have been controlling very seriously hydrogen bonds at the Air solid interface where we have made use of uh, self-assembled monolayers taking gold one on one as the unit lattice, and we have really sensed electrochemically sensed very intricate molecules like um, uh, let's say dopamine and so on. Um, and that happens via packing constraints. And here, as you can see, these are all not born in kind of head groups, and these head groups are experiencing different categories of hydrogen. Now, if I go over to this particular example where we are seeing hydrogen bond switching, what is it? This molecule which is taken, and this molecule is shown in an XYG coordinate axis. It's a uh, alkoxy benzoic acid, simple, simple molecule. And what is shown? It's molecular tilt angle theta is shown. We quantify these molecular tilt angles by doing polarized spectroscopy, which I'm not going to discuss. These are slightly intricate and complex aspects, but you can always deal with you know how these molecules can form dimers. So in the formation of a cyclic dimer, we are showing the two different hydrogen bonds that are formed at a certain geometry. But can you change these cyclic dimeric head groups to a cyclic dimeric head groups? Yes. So when you do these experiments in the two dimensions, you can control the molecular orientation and the density. And so you will see what would be your ultimate products? I have not shown here the products. I have not shown the applications over here. But these are the conceptual basis. Now here at solid water interface, we are looking at synergistic pi stacking with hydrogen bonding. So here you take two dissimilar amplifiers and create a packing space in which you can trap a molecule and you can actually sense these kind of molecules in situ. So this is what is the beauty of uh, actually uh, controlling this, this interface in very many ways. And there are very simple examples, but they are extremely intricate examples. And in the last example is a liquid-liquid interface examples, where you can study very many weak interactions like hydrogen bonds, and you end up with non-classical crystal growth. And, uh, Um, for this one requires to, uh, uh, I would say, you know, uh, anybody who is really controlling uh, this uh, seminar, kindly feel free to stop me at uh, any point you feel like, uh, because there is there is a lot to say. No, please take your time. Like, take your time. Students are enjoying your talk. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Al. So here uh, you are seeing, you see two water molecules in the hydrogen bond, which is all shown here. What are we doing here? How do we proceed ahead? We actually molecular model these structures. We calculate the electronic structures of this, and we are not writing the codes. There are expert members who are writing, theoretical chemists are writing these programs. And so this is a density functional theory based calculation for water dimer. And See, when you think of a hydrogen bond being formed between two water molecules, what happens? One is a hydrogen bond donor. One water molecule is a hydrogen bond donor. The other water molecule is a hydrogen bond acceptor. But in the process, what is happening? We generally say that we should have a heteroatom present in the system so that we can have, let's say, OH kind of, or we can have NH kind of hydrogen bonds formed. But the intricacy with the hydrogen bond is 
right? So what is known over here, this is the bond distance. So now this water molecule is the hydrogen bond donor. And this is the hydrogen bond acceptor. But what is the orbital picture? What happens? How this uh, uh, hydrogen bond is formed? So we, we understand that by bringing in this very concept of charge transfer. That means there is charge transfer from the non-bonding molecular orbital of the oxygen. On oxygen, there are lone pairs of electrons. So charge is transported from there to the anti-bonding sigma star molecular orbital of hydrogen, which is the hydrogen bond donor. This water molecule is the hydrogen bond donor. So what really is happening? The hydrogen bond formation is going by transfer of non-bonding electron density from the non-bonding orbital. Uh, no, this is not correct. It has to go to the sigma star anti-bonding orbital, which is empty, and from the unoccupied uh, non-bonding molecular orbital of oxygen. So now, how do we see in this particular, this is called as electrostatic potential profiles or electron density difference maps. How do we create? We create also by making also the molecular product by the computational program. And how does this, this is called electron density difference map, electron density of accept, uh, electron density of A, electron density of B, the two water molecules, minus the hydrogen, electron density of the hydrogen bonded water dimer. So you see that here the electron density is decreased, here the electron density is increased. So that means there has been a transfer of charge from this non-bonding to this. And so, I mean, the idea behind telling you this is that we can be very intricate in analyzing, in dissecting out our systems of study. And so when we study, so these are a little bit intricate. Uh, see, life is not so easy. And when we go to complex systems, we cannot do you know, this kind of very accurate calculation. So sometimes we have to adopt to very many different ways in which we can do the best. So QMMM is another kind of uh, treating the complex systems. And I, I just thought I'll just flash it, but I shall not. And why do we do, you studied, we looked at the water dimer, but suppose I want to think of, you know, an amino acid being recognized by a lipid bilayer. That example I'll just show. And so, so for this molecular recognition, it is very difficult to deal with very simple systems and then go ahead with stuff. So now, uh, you see, even though we are chemists, we are different categories of chemists, but I said that we cannot maintain a stand so abruptly core so abruptly rigid flexibility must be there but cannot be always a line spectrum and you know the natural line widths are always associated with spectral features so we should give some permission right so so this this slide you have seen that um, this is a paper from chemical physics journal of chemical physics it says that when you are looking at these two dimensional patterns it is just not the molecular synthesis as we, we as chemists, but we should also look at the chemical physics that is existing at the interface. Only then we can understand the characteristic hydrogen bonds. Even if, if we have coordination polymers, we can think of the coordination of metal centers. We can, we can unravel different categories of interactions and hence we can tune Sorry, ma'am. Sorry. Go ahead, please. Okay. So this is uh, one of our paper and I think um, I would uh, add. So this paper has been published in 2015 and here we are looking at the molecular recognition of uh, this amino acid phenylalanine uh, with a lipid, uh, which is a very known lipid, like a phospholipid. And uh, so this is the phosphatidylcholine liquid. We shortly we call as DPPC. M many of you might be knowing. And we see that in this process of molecular recognition, what is the role of water? 
because water is already there in the system. So what we do? Because phenylalanine as an amino acid is chiral. So we deal with both chiral acids. You deal with the L phenylalanine, we deal with the D phenylalanine, and we see the lipid is the L lipid. So what is what is the preferential enantioselective interactions that can happen at that interface? And how selectively molecular recognition is happening in this particular case with a D enantiomer? Imagine and please remember, please note that it is a L lipid, but it is selectively recognizing the D enantiomer of the amino acid. And so this work has been done very selectively by bringing many things, by doing molecular dynamics calculations, doing electronic structure calculations, doing real-time polarized FT, IRAS. This is called infrared reflection absorption spectroscopy. And uh, so we see even that the water bands are confirmation sense way. That means if you switch over from S to P, the water bands. What are the water bands? You'll see water bands as oh, it's stretching frequencies. So they have been also seen that they are highly confirmation sensitive. And so these are the systems. So this is the lipid and this is the amino acid. Proton donor, proton acceptors. Um, maybe we can, uh, so I just want to show you. See, this is the coordinate axis. I was telling you that my lipid molecule will be like this. I have air, I have water. I have my system monolayer, which is between two dielectrics. So there is a lot of nonlinear optical phenomena that is present over here when you are trying to unravel a chemical phenomenon. So this is why this is a little complicated, but we should never shy away from this. And uh, I will uh, just, uh, in this I had tried to show you how the intensities change. See, if your molecule has a dipole and it is orienting in a slanting fashion on the substrate, on the surface, its intensity is different from if a molecule with a dipole is orienting flat on a surface. So this orientation of these molecules can be controlled by using polarized light. And this is where molecular orientation plays a very, very important role. Right, so these are, uh, I uh, would, so this was our experimental setup. Molecular system, this is water surface, then you have a detector coming in and uh, detecting this reflected light that is coming from these lipid layers. And you have in this surface the phenylalanine, which is the amino acid taken. And uh, so these are the experimental setups. I'm just flashing it. I'm sure that when you grow up, I'm just addressing uh, the students. And when you grow up, I'm sure that. I was also a student like you. I, I uh, you know, I did my master's at uh, Banaras Hindu University, and we didn't have much of, uh, you know, very high class instrumentation. Neither did we have a great library in those times. But it is possible. It's always possible if you want to take a leap, and that is why I told you in the beginning that. Uh, uh, endure and equilibrate and take a leap always. And there is a possibility. That is always possible that we can go ahead with. So these are the typical spectral footprints for S polarized spectra, for P polarized spectra. And uh, they're very different. And uh, if you think of their, uh, let us say this is the lipid and this is a uh, this lipid on water surface has a tilt angle of 26 degree. If you take in water phase an amino acid like tryptophan, its tilt angle changes by 10 degrees. And it completely changes the further structural organization. I shall not discuss it in completely. So coming back to this uh, DPPC phenylalanine system, if you just look at these first two rows, binding constants are shown. So the L phenylalanine is binding with this lipid with a binding constant much lower than the D phenylalanine, DPA with DPPC with this. And if you see structurally, the orientation of the molecular tilt angle of the lipid is at least seven degrees higher to that. So we are bringing and we are addressing enantio selectivity by controlling the individual molecular tilt angles. And 
so the purpose of showing this slide is to show the intricacy in designing the intricacy in expanding our thought process to what we will witness in the later part of our experiments and uh, so this is uh, just if you see these two figures this is a p polarized spectrum and you see this is the just the water band i tried to show and please don't uh, look at all this but this is dppc l phenyl alanine dppc d phenyl alanine this green and blue paths if you see this is these are the ch stretching frequencies symmetric and anti symmetric and this is the water uh, oh stretching frequency part and this part is completely baseline whereas for s polarized if you see there is fine structure over here and this fine structure if you further analyze you will see this fine structure because this is oh stretching frequencies you are seeing so you see just that one band this just one band i have tried to deconvolute here and i can see that it has some four five independent peaks that you can look at and so you can see that there is a water dimer formed water trimer formed water tetramer formed water pentamer formed so water in Uh, along with this phenyl alanine is staying in very many differently coordinated uh, state but as we see the intensities we see that this intensity is very large for a trimeric water so we are saying that at room temperature water is heavily populated it is hydrogen bonded but it is heavily populated with trimeric water and you see what is the beauty of doing computation if you do this computation beginning with this uh, pentameric water which is called as a tetrahedral dice you see that ultimately there is a trimeric water cluster which is very stable what is showing the trimeric cluster at 1200 femtoseconds means it is 1.2 picoseconds and picosecond is a bond vibration period and we are doing vibrational spectroscopy so this particular slide is a beautiful um uh, what should i say it uh, there is a beautiful mapping between the experiment and the calculation or the computation it tells us that even at room temperature in water trimeric water is maximum and uh, so here we try to show how the trimeric water interacts with the phosphate head group of the lipid and so on and then we say how even at this time this trimeric water uh makes hydrogen bonding and so on uh so ultimately so these are different categories of hydrogen bonds symmetric double donor a single water molecule interacting with phosphate a single water molecule interacting with phosphate can give you asymmetric single donor so all this unless you do computation you can't you can't go to such intricate level i, I because i have to tell you something important i'm just flashing these slides uh i kindly uh, i beg your excuse pardon for this actually and uh, so these are various ir uh, things these are uh, some of the electron density difference maps and here i try to show you see you have trimeric water molecule you have the d phenyl alanine you have the l dpp silicate and when you optimize this structure so this is how this water molecule this is water molecule this is your lipid uh, this is your I mean, I said, and this is your lipidic tail, and how they interact. There is a distinct difference between the interaction uh, between the. So we have been recording via the IR bands of these typical interactions. There is a dif typical difference in the hydrogen bonds between the D phenyl alanine with lipid and L phenyl alanine with lipid with the trimeric water cluster. So. all that that i wanted to infer here is that that you can be enantio selective even at a constricted interface if you are doing intricate experiments and computations so uh, this was one kind of uh, work that we uh, we uh, did in terms of molecular recognition uh, by adopting to in situ spectroscopy and there are beautiful experiments where you can control the shape and controlling the shape 
actually relates to the electronic structure. If you can control the uh, colors of the compounds, you know how the colors are correlated with the electronic structure. So that example that I was giving you of the benzoic acid, if you look at this, there is a, a cyclic dimer which is formed through hydrogen bond. You can have two variables. One is rotation around this hydrogen bond. Another is internal rotation around this single bond. And so when a cyclic dimer becomes a cyclic, it undergoes under controlled conditions, molecular association, and gives you nanostructures, which are tremendous. These kind of nanostructures are ellipsoids. And these are two-dimensional ellipsoids, which are generally not discussed and generally they are not formed. So different categories of structures you can control by changing the structure, by changing the environment and so on. And these are the uh, various pathways I have, uh, we have shown. You can calculate the uh, energy barriers. You see a cyclic, so there were different conformations. So you can see the cyclic dimer via a transition state to a cyclic and then coming back to cyclic. And what are the energy barriers? That the energy barriers have to be crossed in order for such cyclic a cyclic thing to happen. And what makes this at the two dimensional interface is the surface tension or the surface pressure that we are compressing this. So these are also other parameters, where these uh, rotation around the uh, CC rotation. And similarly, the OH rotation, and these are various parameters um, I just, I wish to just, uh, I maybe I'll take five to seven minutes to complete. I, so there was a very interesting article that came in 2020 in the Journal of Chemical Education. And this is to give to us teachers, uh, uh, you know, a very intricate uh, idea as to how to look at a class, how to look at a uh, series of students, because in a class, we have an admixture of students. Some students are very bright, some are in the middle, and some are in the bottom. So this particular uh, paper is a fantastic statistics, uh, very, very involved statistics. By taking two different categories of, uh, three different categories of students with respect to their performance, and two different kind of questions they are being asked. One is a conceptual question, another is an algorithm-based question. That is normal. If you have a formula, you fix the thing, and then you get the answer. So in here, um, this, uh, I mean, I've just, uh, it is uh, difficult to actually talk about. Uh, but I'll show you in the next slide, what is the question that is asked to the students? Um, OK, in the next, next slide. So what uh, they are they're saying here, what is the difference between the deep versus surface learning approaches? So in the deep versus surface learning approaches, the middle achieving students select a deep learning approaches. Those are in the middle, middle performers, similar to those chosen by high achieving students. And also a combination of surface approaches that included the lower achieving and the higher achieving. So the middle tier students, they are now uh, focusing as to how to improve upon themselves. I'll just, uh, so again, you know, I wish to draw your attention onto this box one. I hope you are able to see this and read this. The question that is asked uh, is, it's actually, it says calculate the, uh, you know, standard uh, reaction enthalpy. For this particular reaction, magnesium 2 HCl forming magnesium chloride and hydrogen gas. And they have given the standard free energy of formation of HCl and magnesium chloride. And they have, this is, these are multiple choice questions and they're giving answers. The actual answer is A. And uh, so now this question is being taken to two different students. So in this, the first student who is rated one, the second student who is rated three. So obviously the second student is a good, bright student. So what this second student, how he approaches this question and how this student approaches this question. So this, I'll just read out one sentence. This student says, okay, so I will calculate delta H. So I would have to find delta H. 
And then I will use some equations, which equations the interviewer is asking, which equation are you following? So I'm looking at the Q equals N delta H and all this, the student is not very sure of. He says, so I know that it goes from uh, magnesium to this and all. So he really protests. So yes, I, I wouldn't, ultimately the student says that, okay, I'll go back and check. But the bright student says that I'll calculate the value of the heat of reaction for this given reaction, magnesium solid and hydrogen uh, chloride. Uh, what they're forming, they're forming magnesium chloride soluble plus hydrogen gas. So he says that due to the fact that the hydrogen gas and magnesium which are solids, they are both in their elemental states and so their values, heat of formation are zero. So this is one of the excellent clue a student has given and the interviewer is noting that. And then ultimately he gives the right kind of answer. So obviously this paper in the Journal of Chemical Education is uh, taking different categories of questions and then trying to view different categories of students which are top class, which are in the middle tier, which are in the bottom sphere, and they are trying to see how they can improvise on them. Who is doing a surface learning? Who is doing a deep learning? And this is uh, this was a terrific paper and uh, not only statistics, but the ideas that are given is terrific. So they're suggesting that instructors could identify problem solving behaviors by asking students to solve algorithmic and conceptual questions allowed during class. And uh, I also felt that I had adopted uh, to a certain extent uh, this uh, principle in my class. And I found that uh, I could uh, you know, give some uh, attention to uh, my students in the class. I mean, this is, uh, and then uh, I would say that, you know, all in the world is not only chemistry. As an individual, I always have thought that um, our vocation lies at the crossroads of our passion and strength. And it's always, I mean, in my personal opinion, it's always nice to pursue something sidewise. Sometimes you become very dry like a machine. And it is, it's uh, so the many phases of chemistry has taught me that, uh, you know, keep a vocation, but it lies at the crossroads of our passion and our strength. So to give an example here, uh, this is, this, he, she is a, she is Dr. Uh, Anna, and she is a molecular biophysicist in the University of California at uh, Los Angeles. And she, <laughs> she designs and sells science-inspired items, the molecular jewelries. And you'll be surprised the kind of uh, jewelry she has designed and they had tremendous um, of the ads, offers, uh, the guys have been, so what you see, these are typical molecules as he has put up on necklaces, all right? And uh, so it was, uh, it's, it was really fascinating to look at um, how this uh, really goes. And ultimately as an individual, when I said that, do I have the courage to follow my dream? And I'm sure some of you might have read this book and uh, some of you might not have. Please go through this book, Jonathan Livingstone Seagull. It's a story, it has been made as a movie and it's a terrific book written by Richard Bach. And it talks to us about the story of a bird who is determined to be more than ordinary. You know, seagulls, it's a seagull. And the seagulls uh, are a little heavy and aerodynamically they can't fly very, to very high altitudes. But this particular seagull, whose name is Jonathan Livingstone, he didn't want, you know, just to fetch, go in the morning, fetch food and come back and be satisfied with life. He said, I will soar high, I'll touch the sun. And he was not taken in, in his group. He was singled out. He, but... His passion has, has taken him on ultimately how he, he wins back the trust by showing what he can do. And so this is one of the inspirational uh, fables of our time. And uh, uh, with this, uh, I, would, uh, I would like to wish this student category all the very, very best.
and uh, i would um, i'm so grateful to the organizing uh, committee and uh, specifically to uh, dr alfred lawrence uh, who has been writing such wonderful such nice emails and uh, I'm, i'm very thankful and i really enjoyed interacting with you this um, i really uh, stop my uh, lecture and i would uh, like to take questions if you have thank you very much thank you i'm so sorry that i have taken so much time oh, no, uh, like, I'm, i'm very sorry yeah thank you so much like the, the, the your talk was so informative and uh, so motivational you know like thank for both the students and for the teachers and uh, like uh, i really admired it and um, we are really blessed to you know like hear your talk you know like uh, thank you so much and whenever you are here in lucknow you know, please do visit us at we like we will love to have you and hear from you anyways like we will shift to saima saima go ahead with the question and answers thank you thank you so much ma'am for briefing us so much about the futuristic aspects of chemistry it was indeed a very informative session thank you ma'am Okay. now i would like to mention that the platform is open for question answer session participant can raise their hands and put forward their question is yes, akriti yeah akriti Good you can ask the question uh, thank you for such an enlightening and uh, enriching session ma'am uh, we have talked about the infrared reflection absorption spectroscopy is it uh, somewhere related to the fourier transform uh, infrared uh, spectroscopy and if it is uh, related then how it, how is it enhancing uh, its capability to form the thinner uh, layer of the sample as well as uh, deducing the molecular orientation at the same time wonderful question that uh, you have observed even though i just flashed you have observed so thank you very much for this question see this is uh, this is like uh, a normal fourier transform infrared spectroscopy but because we are focusing on the few angstroms of my molecular layers it has to be in the reflection mode and so when it is in the reflection mode you know number of molecules which are there on the monolayer are very few not 20 20 maybe few thousands but because there are few thousands and i am controlling this see uh, if you remember the coordinate axis i showed i am freezing the molecule in the xy plane and i am allowing the molecule to rotate only with respect to its z axis so therefore it cannot have any translational motion as it can and hence the orientation is frozen there right and so when the orientation is frozen i am using polarized light i am using angle dependent polarized light at different angles and then there are simple formulas which can take the intensities of specific uh, transitions like you are looking at the vibrations uh, let us say uh, symmetric and asymmetric ch stretching frequencies and the transition dipole moments that are associated with these you know in spectroscopy transition dipole moments are very important because that the transition the modulus of the square of the transition dipole moment give us the oscillator strengths which are nothing but intensities unless we have proper intensities we can't analyze anything even if you are doing a three dimensional ir spectroscopy you have to have the proper percentage transmittance here we are talking because it is in a reflection mode but the beam is being absorbed we call it as reflectance absorption and then because the molecules are so few but the data we get are of the third place decimal value and even that is very intricate and very precise and so we make use of a uh, simple optics equations to find out the molecular orientation and do very precise experiments in situ did i answer your question akriti yes ma'am thank you so much ma'am uh, our next question is from dr imran khan yes yes sir uh, dr khan please hello yes. hello myself dr imran khan from chemistry department is of left over college ma'am you wonderfully correlate life with work and you told as work is a path function yes and thus motivate us that we should add some small small work and ultimately it means a lot my question to you ma'am uh, you correlate the dimer of uh, dimer acyclic dimers and the cyclic dimers of the interface 
uh, on interface energy yes. uh, and the uh, uh, what you have shown in your slide that a cyclic dimer has little bit higher energy uh -huh. so what is the reason uh, the comparison of cyclic dimer and the a cyclic dimer yes. and the energy of a cyclic dimer is little bit higher what yes. is the reason behind it uh, if i want to yeah, yeah, sure. uh, clear yeah. about it yeah i think this is a very marvelous question uh, you see first thing is uh, how do i distinguish at the interface that this is a cyclic dimer and this is an acyclic dimer uh, you may remember uh, from some of the slides we are also tapping the uh, carbonyl stretching frequencies the phosphate uh, stretching frequencies isn't it so when there is uh, the cyclic and the acyclic dimers are correlated with the hydrogen bond when there is a two sided hydrogen bond i had a cyclic dimer and when that one of the uh, uh, one of the hydrogen bond is uh, is uh, is vanishing because it is switching once and how this switches from the uh, cyclic to acyclic the driving force for switching is the surface tension because we are continuously compressing our film that is there present on the two dimensional water uh, phenyl alanine surface so at a particular surface tension we are looking at the packing of these molecules with a specific orientation and so when this kind of driving force is applied to the surface the cyclic can switch to an acyclic and they have been monitored by doing in situ ir so we are we have a detector right away fixed and uh, such experiments are very sensitive experiments uh, but uh, yeah so i mean what i wanted to say is currently students are not wanting to do such kind of experiments i mean i feel uh, very sad about it but they are extreme excellent experiments so cyclic to acyclic goes because in the first case there are two hydrogen bonds in the second case there is one hydrogen and when you go from cyclic to acyclic that barrier energy that you saw one was 10 point some kilocalorie another was 9 points so cyclic to acyclic acyclic to cyclic is that happening yes it is happening at different surface pressures when you are uh, actually you are literally playing around with this uh, single layer that you have formed of the liquid so you know liquids are highly oriented they they, are, they form first bilayers and they the tails are beautifully oriented and so there is no, not much of uh, random errors that you can bring into the system and that energy was computed whatever i showed uh, did i answer the question sure ma'am that means dimerization leads to the stability which suppresses down the energy yes initially dimerization is for di dimerization is happening because of the structure because of the twin okay. tails because of there this alkoxy benzoic acid has uh, two alkyl tails um, with an alkoxy group and so because of that uh, it is it is uh, orienting in certain fashion and the head groups in the water surface are forming a uh, dimer thank you thank you so much uh, thank you ma'am professor archita uh, patnaik and thank you for giving your precious and valuable time for us for our students and uh, one student just now asked me called me and uh, you requested to ask on her behalf like uh, is there anything that uh, students can have a, you know like a internship program at your lab or something like for a week or two week actually what happens is you know because this current situation has completely killed all of us Mm -hmm. and now they have completely stopped external students coming in even the local students mm -hmm. our ma own master city students are not doing their projects mm -hmm. so their their classes are held online uh -huh. only few students are being called so near near future like we will be hoping like in maybe next yeah, year yeah. or some what in near like, future we can uh, we can definitely uh, explore the things thank you thank you so much professor archita patnaik thank you for giving your precious time and namaste thank you so much now thank i would so much ma'am thank you
Now, before we move further, I would like to thank HDFC Bank, Reliance Industries Limited, Reliance Digital, and Cappuccino Blast for being our event sponsors. Thank you so much. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Archana Talwar to continue with the student present presentation session two. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Saima. Uh, a very good morning to all of you present here in this three-day international conference. On behalf of Department of Chemistry, I welcome all of you in this session of students presentation. Indeed, it is a great honor for all of us that Professor MGS Zaidi from Govind Vallabh Panth University of Agriculture and Technology is with us and has graciously accepted our invitation and is ready to judge students presentation session. Thank you so much, sir, for taking out time from your busy schedule. On behalf of your, uh, on behalf of Isabella Thoban College family, I welcome you, sir. Thank you, uh, Professor Zadi, for accepting our invitation. Now I request um, Reham to kindly introduce our esteemed judge for this session. Over to you, Reham. Thank you so much, ma'am. Taking the event further, I would now like to welcome and introduce the judge of the event, Dr. M. G. H. Zadi. Dr. M. G. H. Zadi is a physical chemist, educator, inventor, and an academic administrator. He completed his BSc, MSc, and PhD from Lucknow University. His doctoral work was on synthesis of some newer high temperature resistant polymers. He served at various Indian universities at different academic capacities. His research interest involves synthesis and processing of polymer materials. Sir has made academic contributions to various reputed scientific journals and is a member of editorial board of various international journals. He holds six patents has advised more than 30 students for postgraduate research, authored more than 100 research publications, reviews, monographs, and book chapters in international journals and scientific magazines. We extend a warm welcome to you, sir. Over to you, sir. I request Professor Zedi kindly say a few words. Over to you, sir. Sir, you are mute. Kindly unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Good morning to all of you. First of all, I would like to express my deep sense of reverence and gratitude to the organizers of Applied Chemistry Exploring Futuristic Application for Sustainable Development at uh, uh, IT Poly Lucknow. Uh, since I belong to Lucknow, therefore all the events, uh, scientific events particularly, <laughs> those are conducted by various institutions of Lucknow are highly encouraging for me and I am always interested to be there. So I am also thankful to Dr. Charles and Dr. Parikh for considering me uh, as a uh, judge for your uh, this session. So uh, I would like to say that uh, uh, the academic personality of a student is basically uh, due to his uh, presentation, his way of presentation, how he presents his subject. And uh, in this way, uh, we are always been um, in process to guide students how to present, how to prepare the slides, how to uh, how to express uh, the science, what they have done through their work. So uh, I don't know how much uh, students are connected right now uh, for presentation, but uh, definitely I will be enjoying to hear your presentation of all the students. So I would like to request to please start the presentation of a student so that uh, I can understand what the students have done and how I can greet them for their good work. Thank you so much, sir. Continue, Deha. So, yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir, for enlightening this event with your presence. 
Without any further delay, let's start with the paper presentation. So the rules are, each participant will be given 10 minutes out of which eight minutes are for paper presentation and two minutes are reserved for question answer session. The presentation is requested, the presenter is requested to turn on his video while presenting. All the participants are requested to finish their presentation within the allotted time. With this, I would now like to invite our first presenter, Ms. Nikita Tiwari. Over to you, ma'am. Nikita? Nikita is here? Uh, this is a last call for Ms. Nikita Tiwari. Moving further, I would now invite Ms. Nitya Dube. Over to you, ma'am. Just wait, like, I think so, like, we have to mate, uh, you know, like, see, they must be okay, here. Sir. I will just... Okay, sir. Just hold for a second. Allow to... Okay, now, uh, now Nik Nikita, are you here? Can you unmute yourself? No, uh, Nikita is not here. Uh, Nitya, Nitya is here. Yes. Nitya? Nitya, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, hello? Am I audible, sir? Yes, you are. Yes, sir. I'm sharing the screen, sir, now. Yeah, please. So, your name? So, my name is Nitya, Nitya Dube. Yeah. I'm okay. from okay. IIT Kanpur. Okay, okay. So, you can share your screen. Yes, please. Yes, sir. Uh, sir. Uh, sir, one minute, sir. Take your time, please. Yes. Uh, sir, <clears throat> I guess uh, uh, I have shared my screen, sir. Uh, I think it is visible. Yes, it is visible. It is visible, yes. yes uh, so, uh, good afternoon to all of you. My name is Nitya Dube and uh, I'm uh, really happy that I got this opportunity to uh, give a presentation and uh, uh, review paper in this uh, uh, conference, in this inter international conference. So uh, the topic of my uh, uh, PowerPoint, uh, today's, uh, the topic of my today's uh, presentation is the speculative study of possible natural remediation method for uh, airborne polyaromatic hydrocarbons engendering several respiratory diseases in humans. So, uh, as we all know, <clears throat> polyaromatic hydrocarbons are carcinogenic and toxic. And uh, apart from it, we also uh, know that they are spread firstly through food, and then uh, and then uh, their uh, and their particles get attached with the sediments, soil, and food, uh, so, and air. So here we are going to talk about uh, the airborne polyaromatic hydrocarbons. Firstly, I have to define it. So <coughs> polyaromatic hydrocarbons, they actually belong to the subcategory of polycyclic uh, organic matter. They have more than uh, two uh, more than two fused benzene rings. And uh, uh, and on the basis uh, of their carcinogenicity and the toxicity in their environment, US EPA, EPA has uh, um, uh, segregated 16 pHs. Uh, actually, they have uh, selected three P, uh, 16 pHs in which uh, I have mentioned on the they are mentioned on this uh, I have mentioned on the screen which is naphthalene, anthracene, uh, chlorothene, phenanthrene, silene, and the other the derivatives of uh, PHS. Uh, moving to the next slide, uh, according to uh, their molecular weight means, PHS are divided in, uh, into two parts. 
on the basis of their molecular plate. First, the uh, higher were molecular pHs and the low molecular uh, pHs. So low molecular pHs usually contain uh, less than five rings and uh, they have relatively, uh, they are characterized by relatively, uh, uh, characterized by relatively high temperature of uh, condensation and uh, are absorbed on the airborne particles. Whereas if we uh, go to the higher pHs concentration, means uh, high, the pHs which contain more than five rings, um, they are uh, uh, also get bound with the uh, particles, the air particles, and causes toxicity in the air. And uh, also that the adsorption is usually affected by both temperature and humidity. So if uh, temperature and uh, humidity get increased, then their gas particle pHs also get increased if uh, they contain more than three rings. So they are. Uh, I have mentioned all the all uh, some other subparts like semi volatile, which contain four ring pHs like pyrene and phenanthine, which uh, uh, can be found in both phases. And gas part particle coefficients are most susceptible in the influence of environmental factors. Moving to the next slide. Now the question arises: Where do airborne polyaromatic hydrocarbons come from? So, uh, as I already uh, uh, said that uh, usually they are uh, uh, get uh, so produced in air from uh, two sources. The main sources are basically from the two sources, which uh, the main source is divided into two parts. I have, uh, so the first is uh, natural sources and the second is unnatural sources, so, uh, which are man-made sources. So uh, on the uh, and they uh, uh, get uh, <clears throat> entered in the atmo atmosphere in the form of particles. So if we discuss about natural sources, so volcanic er eruption they get uh, produced from volcanic eruptions, erosions of sedimentary rocks which uh, containing petroleum hydrocarbon. Third is forest fires, brushes, and decomposition of vegetative matter fall. Unnatural sources, which are very common, and uh, we all are suffering from uh, it uh, nowadays, like combustion of fossil fuels uh, for power generation and power generation, tobacco and cigarette smoking, agriculture based and residual burning, and pesticides, motor vehicle operation. So, if we if we conclude all these natural and unnatural sources, so we get that the, you know, the particles. Uh, which are produced from these uh, <clears throat> combustions get fused with the uh, uh, particle bond site pHs and then they become airborne polyaromatic hydrocarbons, which is uh, eventually responsible for the toxicity in the uh, air. Now, uh, moving on the consequences. Consequences on the exposure of airborne polyaromatic hydrocarbons. So here I again uh, uh, divide it into two parts, the short term and the long term. The short term are very common, and uh, the which include nausea, skin irritation, eye irritation, confusion. Although um, only uh, not only polyaromatic hydrocarbons particles, but uh, there are few other analytes which are responsible for the same. But uh, um, these are the main. The short terms are uh, main, uh, the main, which and uh, they can be cured. But if we move to long term, uh, long term, if a person is uh, getting exposed to airborne pHs uh, at a very, in a very long, uh, um, through prolonged stage, then uh, it uh, uh, he get exposed to uh, so it, um, it. It might he might have he or she might have asthma and uh, impaired respiratory function and uh, <clears throat> in uh, more uh, drastically, if we say lung cancer. So it is also estimated that uh, every eight children worldwide is being affected with asthma. It means the concentration of airborne particles, airborne pHs is more in the environment now. So moving uh, the last point, which uh, says lots of things, if we compare with other analytes and if we compare uh, it with the, uh, our uh, today's pandemic situation, that pHs is uh, also, also the exposure of airborne pHs also influences innate and adaptive immune system, the immune response. It means it also ruins our immunity. So it uh, also ruins our respiratory system and along with the immunity. So it means uh, if we uh, research uh, it on more, then uh, we uh, we can find that it is also um, 
uh, uh, co-friendly with COVID-19. I mean to say that uh, it can also be responsible for uh, causing COVID-19. COVID-19, it means uh, it is, uh, um, if we uh, say we are best friend to each other, each other like uh, uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbons and the COVID-19. So if a person is being affected from uh, uh, from the exposure of polyaromatic, uh, airborne polyaromatic hydrocarbons, then the immunity and respiratory system is uh, being uh, affected. And, and then after that, if, get, if it uh, get exposed to the COVID-19, then the situation get uh, even get adverse. So here I have concluded some studies which uh, uh, also ex uh, explain the consequences of airborne polyaromatic uh, hydrocarbons. So the first study, it is basically uh, conducted in Czech Republic, which show the concentration of pHs. And it was found that the prenatal uh, pHs exposure causes higher respiratory mobility. Another study in Kharkov, Poland, which uh, shows the vulnerability to the airborne pHs resulted in reduced birth weight. Another which uh, shows the ut utero exposure of offspring to the pHs of normally regulates the development of lungs, which outcomes uh, respiratory symptoms early afterwards. So it means that um, not only adults, but the offsprings are already affected with air one polyaromatic hydrocarbons, either uh, through the inhalation, the pregnant woman inhaled it, and uh, uh, through the food, obviously. So one point uh, which I like to uh, I like to add that. Uh, uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbons are um, usually uh, the first exposure is we get exposed through food and uh, 3 to 20 percent uh, uh, the uh, 3 to 20 percent the second it basically comes with the air one uh, uh, polyaromatic pHs means uh, 3 to 20 percent the second most uh, susceptibility of a particular person to uh, through uh, uh, with pHs is uh, through air so uh, in uh, Japanese research paper, I found that the concentration of the airborne polyaromatic hydrocarbons being seasonally variated means it varies seasonally and uh, it is remarkably more in indoor environment than outdoor. But uh, um, uh, as we uh, know that the uh, attentiveness requires both on indoor and outdoor, but uh, <clears throat> nowadays it is being... Uh, you see that it, it, is, it is being uh, reported that the indoor uh, uh, indoor uh, environment has more airborne pHs. So uh, like uh, one example I like to share, here I have uh, concluded three uh, uh, examples from the three research paper. In Mesh, he concluded uh, that he measured the concentration of 23 pHs in indoor and outdoor environment of 10 homes near the roadside and urban sites in the northern central part of India, in which he found that uh, in kitchen, there is a, a depression, uh, the concentration of uh, airborne pHs is more in comparison to the, in comparison uh, to the uh, uh, outdoor environment. Same as in the um, Minishin uh, uh, et al. Uh, paper, paper, he, uh, he, uh, he conducted a study to access the pertinence of the indoor air in beneficiation to extent of the urban population, in which they have found that the concentration of benzopyrene was higher in the indoor environment than in the outdoor. And in the Navoma, uh, he also performed this particular experiment and he uh, collected several samples from and in the uh, 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 relate the relationship in indoor and outdoor personal air study, in which he found that uh, concentration of indoor samples was more, which is uh, in comparison to the outdoor ones. Now, um, I uh, uh, now we come to the analysis and the instrumentation part. Usually, pHs is being uh, uh, analyzed. Uh, the airborne pHs. I uh, you know, perform this particular uh, uh, experiment in my lab. So we uh, require a quartz filter of PM 2.5 and PM 10. We collect the sample from uh, we collect the air sample through uh, uh, in the quartz filter, and after that we cut it. And uh, after cutting uh, it, we transfer it to the 25 ml of vial, and uh, we add one to one ratio of DCM and hexane, and then sonicate it. And after that, uh, after 30 minutes of sonication, we transfer uh, tra we centrifuge it. 
and we perform this particular uh, experiment three times so that we get the, the complete uh, concentration the complete uh, analytes in the three uh, uh, in, in the three form the sonication we perform three times and centrifugation and transfer it to the 20th uh, 5ml of volumetric dust and after that we uh, uh, move further to the column chromatography so why we do column chromatography because uh, uh, firstly column chromatography purifies the compound and uh, it uh, the principle is basically works upon the polarity and the hydrophobicity and uh, fir, uh, uh, and when we get the purified compound we rota vap it and uh, after rota vap uh, rota uh, uh, rota vap uh, vaporization we move further to nitro nitrogen purging so uh, we reduce the volume of the uh, sample to 1 ml to 2 ml and transfer it uh, to the gc vial and we analyze it to the gcms so overall uh, ph is usually um, analyzed through gcms and uh, in some of cases i have also seen that it is also performed on hpls so it is <clears throat> another thing moving further i have proposed a hypothesis in this review paper in which uh, um, as we all know that uh, uh, we have many air filters which uh, can eradicate and combat the situation they have one ph is from the environment but uh, i have mentioned here that cm2 to 265 city fluence uh, f7 and there are many more which are uh, used in the ventilation system for hospital offices and for public building and but what about common people common people cannot afford uh, these uh, high uh, cost uh, costing uh, air filters that's why we uh, have proposed an um, uh, a very highly cost effective and penny wise uh, effective uh, uh, method through which we can uh, erad eradicate or, or combat this uh, situation so uh, we <clears throat> uh, yeah, there is a term called bioremediation in which we use plants and animals and here we have uh, chosen some 11 plants and uh, this particular remediation process is also known as phyto phytoremediation so <clears throat> the hypothesis is here that we all know that there are many indoor plants which can uh, <clears throat> uh, which can work upon benzene in eradicating benzene so we uh, uh, we uh, give an idea that uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbons uh, have a structural unit of benzene see with your time limit uh, uh, yeah 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 uh, one minute more so um, uh, uh, we have uh, the structural unit of uh, ph is basically benzene so if uh, a benzene if uh, a plant which is eradicating benzene from the environment uh, could also eradicate phs from the indoor and outdoor environments so that's why we have proposed 11 uh, natural uh, indoor and uh, uh, outdoor plants which can combat air phs from the environment so these are english lily uh, red edged uh, draciana peace lily chinese evergreen floristic sananthina aloe vera genet crate snake plant money plant water net and barbitan daisy and english i so these are the references which i have taken all the content from thank you so much for your precious time thank you thank you so much ma'am that was indeed an informative presentation now the floor is open for the question answer session any queries okay i have a query in like uh, they are like a very good uh, presentation indeed you have worked indeed you have worked hard so uh, tell me like you have studied like uh, there is a relationship between uh, indoor and outdoor airborne particles so can you tell me like what are the five or let it be three you know like uh, common uh, sources for indoors Uh, who are emitting uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbons and then like uh, us epa has recommended 16 uh, you know like uh, 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 most important uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbons out of that which one you think will be the most toxic one and why sir uh, firstly uh, uh, 
the indoor and uh, if i talk about the outdoor uh, sources through which uh, uh, airborne particles uh, airborne pages get uh, <clears throat> enter into the atmosphere and is basically the combustion and the volatilization and uh, combustion is can be of anything like biomasses like coal renewable sources which uh, which usually contain hydrogen and carbon so eventually the outdoor uh, uh, phs airborne phs are uh, come from usually come from there and uh, uh, sir i uh, part of the second question sir please like according to you like which, uh, which among 16 us epa recommended uh, polymeric hydrocarbons which one is most toxic uh, sir uh, uh, according uh, to me uh, i have read uh, many research paper on phs so they have concluded that benzopyridine benzopyridine is more toxic so Uh, in terms and, of it, I have to go through uh, or more research papers so that uh, I can find the root cause of it, and because uh, it, uh, I think it uh, requires sincere attentiveness because uh, uh, airborne pages uh, is now becoming more uh, more and more uh, uh, adverse in the environment, uh, spreading of it in my good good so good. Like like we have another two questions. Uh, I think so. Reham, Reham, continue with uh, giving opportunity with Nidhi Singh and Asta Yardia. Hello, sir. Uh, hello. Hello. Uh, hello, Nitya. Hello, ma'am. Uh, Nitya, I just wanted to ask you. You talked about the low molecular weight and high molecular weight PHs, right? Yeah. So, what do you think? Which of which one of them is more carcinogenic? um according to me uh, the carcinogenicity uh, if we uh, it is very simple if we compare it uh, carcinogenic uh, carcinogenicity or jo cancer causing all the uh, the pages are both are cancer causing but okay. if we uh, uh, move, uh, if we focus on the uh, uh, the concentration means the their molecular weight so higher molecular weight and uh, their concentration there might be some interpretation am i audible yes ma'am you are audible no. ah. yes ma'am uh, so uh, higher uh, molecular weight uh, phs i uh, is more carcinogenic in comparison to uh, lower molecular weight so if we move further towards uh, low carcinogenic so like it is anthracene naphthene or pb They they could be carcinogenic, but I think higher one is more, a more toxic. I think so. Somebody is using YouTube also while you know, like seeing her. Anyways, <laughs> like we will go to the second question, like from Asta Upadhyay. Asta Upadhyay. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, uh, ma'am. I would like to ask uh, how pHs are actually formed. how phs are actually formed uh, as i already uh, mentioned in my ppt that uh, they are uh, uh, usually get to um, uh, uh, combustion then combustion and uh, volatilization uh, both uh, are responsible for the formation of phs if we see that uh, phs is basically made up of both hydrogen and carbon so uh, uh, like you have been uh, you have muted yourself yeah so in uh, that is i uh, the combustion and volatilization are uh, responsible for the combustion Exactly. Okay, like uh, Rehem, I think so. There is some technical issue. So we will go to the next speaker. Thank you so much, ma'am, for attending the queries of our participants. Going further, I would now like to invite Miss Karnika Shivasta. Hello, ma'am. Sir, sir, my son Nikita, so I am here. Okay, Nikita, you are here. Okay, okay so yes. Rehem, so please. I would now like to invite Miss Nikita Tiwari to proceed. Over to you, ma'am. 
Nikita, I'm unable to share. You are unable to share. Nikita, let me see you. Just uh, can you open your video? Yes, now you can. Uh, I think so, Nikita. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Content. Okay. Is it visible? Yes, it is, Vita. Yeah, okay. So, myself, Nikita Tiwari. Okay, I have to start the video also. Okay? Yes. Can you? Because you are using your uh, mobile or you are using from laptop? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Actually, I'm in labs. Okay, okay. Go ahead. So, so myself, Nikita Tiwari, I'm PhD scholar working under the supervision of Professor Anil Mishra from the Department of Chemistry, University of Lucknow. So the, my topic for today is computational models, a sustainable approach to reveal the inhibitory potential of benzoanthracene and its monohydroxy derivatives against human sex hormone binding probability. So I will start from the introduction. Basically, I got this idea while uh, studying on the topic, uh, I was interested in uh, working on air pollution. So I started with the study of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. These are the ubiquitous environment pollutant that we can uh, find everywhere. We can inhale it, we can um, uh, eat it with our food, we can get it from the environment also. And these uh, benzoanthracene is all, is a most important part of the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. And uh, this can be hydrolyzed because uh, ben, um, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons does not include any functional groups. Uh, it's basically carbon and hydrogen. But uh, while we intake it uh, inside our body, these get hydrolyzed by cytochrome P450 enzymes. And it's... These hydro hello yes ma'am these these hydroxylated compounds uh, have a structural st structural similarity to DHT that is hydro uh, hydro testosterone uh, molecule it is it is a natural ligand of human sex hormone binding globulin and this is a protein we have taken this protein because um, phs have shown endocrine uh, di disruption uh, potential so we have taken this protein it acts as a uh, carrier for the uh, bound and unbound sex hormones and it provides access to the target uh, tissues and so we have investigated our, uh, the objective of our study was to report uh, the inhibition of uh, the of the protein with the help of uh, by these by these ligands specific, specifically we are we have targeted benzoanthracene and its monohydroxy derivatives and uh, we have proved it using computational models for our uh, for our study we have taken benzoanthracene as, as a parent molecule and uh, along with it we have taken eight other um, uh, hydroxy uh, hydroxy benzoanthracene derivatives for this we have optimized uh, optimized all the compounds and after the optimization, we have uh, calculated other properties as well. And uh, along with DFT uh, calculations that we have done for these proper, for these molecules, we have done molecular docking so that we can uh, um, calculate the binding energy between the protein and the ligand. So um, we have the materials that we materials and methods that we have used during our study. First one was DFT calculations, that is density functional theory calculations. These calculations were done using Gaussian 09 program. First of all, we have drawn our structures of the of the DHT as well as our benzoanthracene and its derivatives with the help of Gauss View 5. And after the uh, after these structures were drawn, we have optimized it with the help of Gaussian 09 program, and we have used basis set 3 to 1 G. Uh, and um, after the uh, optimization of DFT, uh, after the optimization of all the compounds, we have calculated other properties such as hardness, softness, and uh, ionization potential, electron affinities, and electron negativity, electrophilicity index. Some uh, all the other properties we have calculated with the help of Gaussian 09 program. So these are the uh, compounds that we have optimized with the help of DFT. First one that we can see that DHT, this is dihydrotestosterone. It is a natural ligand of SHBG. And we have uh, optimized benzoanthracene and all its uh, derivatives. 
So after the DFT calculation, we have done molecular docking procedure. In uh, for for the molecular docking, we have used auto dock tools, and uh, auto dock tools basically helps us to find the binding energy between the macromolecule and a ligand. Macromolecule is referred here as a protein that we have used SHBG, and um, we have used ligand as benzoanthazines and its derivatives. Uh, for the uh, for the ligand, we have used already used DFT and optimized it, but for the protein, we have Obtain our obtain our protein structure from the protein data bank, and we get it uh, as a PDB as uh, in it as PDB format. After that, uh, while starting with our DFT cal uh, docking calculations, first of all we have docked DHT that is known ligand. We dock uh, DHT with the SHBG, and we have taken it as a positive control. It means that we have taken it as a reference. After calculation of uh, uh, this binding energy, we have calculated other binding energies with uh, with Benzoanthazine and its derivatives. Okay, and after the uh, uh, find, find, finding of the binding energies, we have uh, um, uh, we have visualized our uh, complex that the dog structure with the help of lake plot software. So results after the calculations, we are here with our uh, results. Uh, we have calculated homo lumo gap that is highest occupied molecular orbital and lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. So we uh, see that more the uh, homo lumo gap, the compound will be. More stable, it will not react fast. So, uh, so here we can conclude that uh, we we require any pollutant to be uh, to be potentially uh, uh, act as inhibitor. We we require small homo lumo gap, okay, so that it can transfer its electron and electron transition can be shown very quickly. So here we have calculated homo lumo gap uh, for the uh, uh, like th there is a table we have tabulated it. Here we can see that DHT is having homo lumo gap, that is delta E uh, around 5.97. And uh, in this chart, we can see that delta E value is lowest for 10 hydroxybenzoanthazine, that is 3.71. So from the DFT calculations, we have clearly seen that 10 hydroxybenzoanthazine is showing lowest uh, delta E value. And uh, in order to prove it, because computation models cannot prove all the um, all the experiments, so in order to prove it, we use more than one computational model. So after calculating the delta E value and other properties, we have done uh, this is this is a pictorial diagram for four and nine and ten hydroxybenzoanthazine. Uh, this is homo homo lumo, and uh, this is the, the arrow is showing that uh, uh, what is the homo lumo gap between the uh, uh, between between them. Okay. So we can see that 10-hydroxybenzoanthazine is showing uh, the least uh, homo lumo gap. Okay. After uh, this, we have to prove it from other model also. We have done docking. In the docking, we have um, taken a protein and ligand, and we have in, uh, done the do done the docking procedure. After that, we get the results. We get the DHT that is dihydrotestosterone is showing minus 10.94 binding energy. Whereas binding energy of benzoanthracene and its derivatives is ranging from 8.5 to 9.04. So it means that there is not much variation between them and they are showing a little correlated uh, binding energy. Okay, and after that, um, with the help of autodog, we have also seen that these benzoanthracenes are actually occupying the active site of the protein. It means that they are uh, trying to replace the natural ligand of the protein. So these, uh, we can uh, here see the uh, table. Uh, in this table, we have seen that DHT is showing minus 10.94 binding energy. And when we say, uh, go down to the table, we can see that 10 hydroxybenzoanthracene is showing the least binding energy among all the ben benzoanthracenes. And it is comparable to the binding energy of the DHT as well. So, from the DFT also, we have calculated that the 10 hydroxybenzoanthracene is showing the lowest homo lumo gap. And here also, we can see that it requires only a little bit of binding energy and it can bind to the active site of the protein. So uh, we have seen that uh, not only the uh, non uh, only the hydrophobic bonds are there. We have seen that uh, there are uh, some hydrogen bonds as well, and we have we have also shown the um, uh, bond length. We have, we have also shown the um, uh, bond length. Okay. Uh, then after that, we have uh, our conclusion. Uh, we have seen that uh, 10 hydroxy, 4 hydroxy, and 9 hydroxy benzoanthracenes are seen to be more in a more potent inhibitor than uh, parent benzoanthracene uh, ben benzoanthracene molecule. Okay, so uh, this is the result. This is the dog structure that we have obtained from the we visualized from the lake plot software, and we can see that uh, DHT is showing two hydrogen bonds. Uh, four hydroxy is also sh showing two hydrogen bonds. 
these hydrogen bond bonds are also uh, uh, also responsible for the bind less binding energy for these molecules. So the conclusion of our study was that we have seen that benzoanthracene is present all over around our environment, and we have computationally proved it that this can be a potent inhibitor for the SBG protein. That is, we have used density functional theory and molecular docking in order to prove it. And we have seen that in case uh, in any matter, if uh, SHBG will get affected, it will not allow um, not allow its regular function. So it can it is seen from this study that uh, benzoanthracene can easily mimic the binding uh, binding site of the natural ligand of DHT. So we have concluded that out of all the benzoanthracenes, then hydroxy benzoanthracene is uh, found to be more potent inhibitor. Um, compared to its parent benzoanthracene. Okay, uh, that's, uh, that's it. These are the references that I have used for my study. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Now the floor is open for the question answer session. Participants, please raise your hand so that we can Hello? unmute yourself. Hello. Okay. Yeah, you have explained very well. Uh, you correlate the androgen with patch. Have yes, you sir. correlate estrogen with patch? If it is, then no, the same. Uh, okay, you haven't uh, correlate estrogen. No, sir. Uh, only I have taken it. Uh, okay. Basically, hydroxy group is must for the binding affinity with the uh, competitive bi uh, binding affinity. Uh, for patch or some other uh, functionality can uh, mimic that particular. Yes, sir. Sir, any type. any function. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Any functional group can sir bind, uh, can uh, functional group can bind to the active site of the protein, but it uh, um, actually active site of the protein, but it uh, actually. Any any function group can bind to the active side of the protein. It doesn't matter. With, but uh, it the matter matter is that whether the compound is uh, energetically stable or not. Whether its um, homologo gap is uh, least. That whether it can uh, transit an electron. That um, because ligand is a donor. Uh, here it is a donor and protein is an acceptor over here. So whether it is uh, available, uh, it can easily donate an electron or not. So the compound must be stable. It doesn't matter whether. Which group or uh, any uh, methyl group also shows uh, binding and binding with the active site of the protein. Hello? Oh, okay. Thank you so much, ma'am. Our next presenter is Mr. Kamlesh Kumar Yadav. Over to you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, he is Dr. Kamlesh. It's okay, sir. Th thank you so much, Larin, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, should I share my screen? Yes, please, sir. Okay. Uh, today I am uh, here to present my uh, paper. Uh, entitled an overview of environmental contamination of chromium and micronuclei formation phases. Uh, okay. Basically, uh, I am going to uh, discuss uh, how the chromium reaches in the aquatic please environment full screen and how it reacts with that. So please, uh, no, yes. Uh, yeah, now it's okay. Still, should I continue? Yes, yes, please. Yes, yes. So, you can continue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, ha, yeah. Okay. I'm going to discuss how chromium enters in the aquatic environment and then how it interacts with the genetic material DNA and how the chromium can be tested uh, uh, and uh, uh, in the aquatic environment. Uh, chromium was first uh, discovered by the French chemist Wachlin in the Samarian red uh, ore. It's a transition metal. Uh, the addict table in the group 6B. At present, the ores of chromium are found in India, South Africa, Zimbabwe, Finland, and Philippines, etc. It is the chromium is the sixth most abundant heavy metal in the earth crust. 
एंड क्रोमियम इज यूज क्रोमियम क्रोमेट्स रिफ्रैक्टरी मटेरियल्स क्रोमियम स्टील सीमेंट फंजी साइड एक्सेट्रा एंड क्रोमियम हैज यू नो की मल्टीपल ऑक्सीडेशन स्टेट रेजनिक फ्रॉम माइनस टू प्लस सिक्स आउट ऑफ दीज ऑक्सीडेशन स्टेट ट्राइवेलेंट क्रोमियम एंड हेक्साइलेंट क्रोमियम आर द मोस्ट स्टेबल फॉर्म्स एंड द क्रोम डाइवेलेंट क्रोमियम इज द मोस्ट अनस्टेबल वन इट्स टॉक्सिटी डिपेंड्स ऑन इट्स ऑक्सीडेशन स्टेट हेक्साइलेंट क्रोमियम इज द मोस्ट टॉक्सिक वन नाउ the how chromium reaches in the in aquatic environment and how it reaches to the human being urban and mu municipal waste industrial waste rural waste and fuel combustion all produces you know some kind of uh, chromium the this chromium reaches to the soil water and air and finally from these environment into the ground water and it contaminates ground water here you know ki and also it reaches to the uh, uh, water bodies re like river lakes pond so you have been uh, sir uh, unmute kar liye sir please unmute yourself डॉक्टर के के प्लीज अनम्यूट यूर सेल्फ नाउ ऑडिबल सर हाँ यस नाउ योर वॉइस इज कमिंग ओके ओके मैम now how chromium interacts with the dna so necessary for the metabolism normal metabolism of glucose and it, it is somehow uh, it is also involved with the insulin function it also suppresses the cholesterol level in mammals you know some studies suggest that but uh, above the permissible limb uh, in toxic uh you according to the us epa it's permissible limit the 100 ppm and uh, according to the icmr uh, it is uh, it should be present in the limit of 0.05 mg per liter its oxy uh, you know its toxicity depends on its oxidation states earlier i have uh, mentioned that the chromium 6 is the most toxic one however uh, you know ki its genotoxicity is the result of intracellular reduction of chromium 6 to the its most stable form chromium 6 and there are production of some intermediate chromium uh, 5 during this reduction process inside the cell there is the production of ros that is the reactive oxygen species that reacts with the cellular dna chromium can damage dna in several ways like uh, it it can induce single and double strand breaks and which can be measured in the form of chromosomal aberrations micronuclei sister chromatis exchange and alteration in dna replication and transcription here i am going to discuss about the micronucleus test which is the most you know ki widely used and easy test to detect or to assess the genotoxic potential of the you know ki any genotoxic compound like the chromium uh we can use fishes as one of the experimental animal because uh, you know ki uh, uh, they live in the in such a environment where the final sink of all the contaminants is the water micro uh, uh, mn test is one of the excellent tool for both in vivo and in vitro genotoxic studies micro nuclei are formed in the cell after the irregular cell division process during the ena phase when chromosome fragments or the whole chromosome is delayed with respect to the rest of chromosome it forms a small secondary nucleus called micronuclei in fishes micronucleus test can be per performed in erythrocyte cells 
gill cells kidney cells hepatic cells and fill cells but the most studied and most useful cells are the erythrocyte cells because these cells have the higher mitotic index that means the high division of red we can use only that cells which are you know rapidly multiplying now this is the uh, uh, flow chart of the formation of micronuclei uh, during the normal cell division process uh, if there is no pollution or there is no any genotoxic agent the no cell normally divides and the uh, progeny or the cell daughter cells are formed are in normal in condition but when there is any genotoxic agent in the environment that interacts with the natural uh, division cell cell division process and then the there is you know ki uh, 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 interference in the spindle formation which is important for the cell division when uh, uh, genotoxic agent like chromium is present it interacts with that division process and the you know ki uh, the, the some amount of dna or chromosome lags behind and it does not incorporate into the main nucleus when then there is formation of micronuclei so the, these micronuclei can be assessed very easily uh, 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 at the spot when we are going to monitor the genotoxic potential when uh, any genotoxic agent is present in the uh, uh, in any you know aquatic body we can capture the fish we can take some little amount of blood make a, uh, the, on the spot we can make a slide stain the slide and can easily test the formation of micronuclei now come to the end conclusion uh, mn test can be used and as an important bioindicator of the presence of genotoxic pollutant in the water fishes live in very intimate association with their environment therefore very susceptible to any change in it fishes being on the top of aquatic food chain may directly affect the health of human beings therefore it is important that the release of fluent from the elephant and textile intrinsic uh, uh, industries that uses chromium should be minimized and fishes should be reared in chromium free environment thank you so much thank you sir now the floor is open for the question answer session the participants are requested to please raise their hands to get themselves unmuted hello yes yes sir wonderful presentation sir congratulation although heavy you, metals sir. are toxic to uh, biological system and you discuss yes, about the chromium uh, does electronic yes. configuration has any role uh, to chromium toxicity no sir there, i uh, i don't think there is you know any role of electronic configuration the oxidation state uh -huh. matter mm, uh, it, the oxidation state of chromium ranges from minus to plus 6 out of these oxidation states plus 6 is the highly toxic because it generates ros that is a reaction uh, reactive oxygen species and this reactive oxygen species interacts or reacts with the genetic material uh, uh, causing the you know ki uh, uh, chromosomal fragments or the micronuclei yes, sir. okay sir. thank you sir thank you so much sir any question thank you thank you so much sir moving further i would now like to invite miss karnika shivasta over to you ma'am Karnika, I think is uh, not available. Reha, move forward. Okay, ma'am. Thank you so much. Now I would like to invite Miss Sakshi Gupta. Maybe she also has not connected with us. So I have. I, would... I have. Oh, sorry, sorry. Thank you. Over to you, ma'am. Okay.
Ma'am, you have requested to yeah, switch on your video. Yeah. All participants are requested to show their videos. Please yes. open your videos. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Is my screen visible? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay, so good afternoon, respected teachers. Myself, Sakshi Gupta, and I'm going to present on the topic biomaterials and bioactive nanoparticles in immunotherapy. These are the contents of my presentation. Moving on to the introduction. What is immunotherapy? So immunotherapy is a biological therapy in which the treatment of the disease is achieved by either the activation or suppression of the immune system. It uses the substance made from living organism to treat cancer. Biomaterial. Biomaterial is a substance that has been engineered to interact with biological systems for a medical purpose. It can be either a therapeutic or a diagnostic one. So the main property of this biomaterial are they are bio biodegradable, biocompatible, and less toxic. Example, liposomes. The bioactive nanoparticles. They refer uh, uh, to the effect of a drug or a compound on a living organism, tissue, or a cell. So nanoparticle promises changes in many significant areas of medicines, material science, construction, etc. Now let's understand what is cancer cell. Actually, they are different from healthy cells because they can divide more rapidly and they form a mass of tissue called a tumor. Background of cancer treatment. In 19th century, there was a birth of oncology, which is the study of tumors. And uh, at present, they are the, the most common methods used for the treatment are chemotherapy, radiation therapy, immunotherapy and hormone therapy. So what are the drawbacks of immunotherapy and chemotherapy? is that uh, besides destroying the cancerous cells, they also destroy the uh, healthy cells also. So we, uh, so thus uh, there is a need of a drug delivery, uh, which dis uh, that can selectively destroy only the cancerous cells and not the healthy cells. Therefore, nanotechnology delivers system that can lead uh, to much improved drug delivery accuracy. So what are the challenges is, uh, as I have already told that they can destroy healthy cells also. So therefore, uh, there is a need of nanoparticles and its advantages is that it has improved bioavailability by enhancing aqueous solubility. Actually, the most of the anti-cancer drugs are hydrophobic. So uh, in nature, so by using these nanoparticles, uh, these nano carriers, uh, we can uh, encapsulate the drug inside these nanoparticles and it will also increase the bioavailability of the drug. And its small sizes enhances its use and particularly in imaging, that is it can be used as also markers to track the nanoparticles. Its drug delivery uh, to the exact location, it has a lesser side effects. The detection and diagnosis of the cancer is easy and fast. And degradation of drugs in the body before reaching their target is also prevented. As the nanoparticles are less than 200 nanometer, therefore they are not screened out of circulation of liver and spleen. So how the cancer treatment has been improved by nanotechnology treatment is that, uh, here we can see, let me use a pointer, that Earlier in traditional treatment, the drugs uh, act like a bomb. So what happens is uh, they destroy cancer cells, okay, but they also destroy the healthy cells, as we can see. But using these nanoparticles, there is the specific uh, destroy. Uh, the cancer cells are destroyed and not the healthy cells are destroyed. Now the active and passive targeting. The active and passive targeting... Uh, is of the nanoparticles. So passive is based on the retention effect of a particle of certain hydrodynamic size in cancer tissue. And active is based on nanoparticle functionalization for a specific targeting of cancer cells. Actually, what happens in passive targeting is the, uh, as we can see it uh, via diagram that the in tumor locations, their cells having a leaky blood vessels. So, uh, 
so uh, they have uh, a re good retention and uh, permeability and this effect is called as epr effect when blood vessel shows the retention and permeability and due to this the nanoparticle will go and bind only to the tumor locations and in active targeting uh, what we do is we add the antibodies or peptides which can especially go and bind only to the cancer cell we can also add an imaging agent to this antibodies also so therefore uh, we use the nanotechnology based drug delivery in which uh, the drug loaded nanoparticle releases higher doses of drug for a prolonged period of time uh, period of time which completely completely inhibit the growth of cells what happens is uh, when we use the anti cancer drug in earlier treatment is that the anti cancer drug develops a resistance and it is developed because of the p glycoprotein which is capable of uh, pumping the anti cancer drugs out therefore the new research shows that the nano particles are able to get anti cancer drugs into cells without triggering the p glycoprotein pump now the question arises that uh, uh, how can we introduce nanoparticles uh, with means that uh, how our immune system doesn't destroy these nanoparticles so this is because of this peg polymer it is a polyethylene glycol which is fda approved it is water soluble and it has low immune response and it is biocompatible and this technology of covering the uh, nanoparticles with this polymer is known as stealth technology so what is the advantages or uh, uh, advantage of p egylation is that it has an increase in the size to reduce kidney filtration it has an increase in solubility due to the pg hydrophilicity and decrease accessibility for proteolytic enzymes and antibodies so the nanomaterials used for the ca uh, cancer diagnosis and treatments are uh, gold nanoparticles dendrimer liposome i have discussed some so first is liposomes that are used as drug nano carriers for, so liposomes are a biomaterial and it is low uh, in, and it shows low toxicity because it is made up of natural non toxic phospholipids and cholesterol and they can be used as drug carrier and can be loaded with a huge variety of molecules as a small drug molecules proteins nucleosides even plasmid or particles it has a versatile and variety of applications and liposomes can have both hydrophobic and hydrophilic loads its exterior liquid uh, bilayer is chemically reactive and therefore can acts as a tag which can be antibodies antigens cell receptors nucleic acid etc and these liposomes ranges from 50, 50 nanometer to 800 nanometer so their aqueous core can encapsulate millions of drugs inside it and one more advantage of this liposome is that its lipid by layer is transparent therefore uh, it can acts as a marker to track this uh, nanoparticles or drugs inside the body the next is dendrimer which is used as drug nano carriers so dendrimer are artificial polymer and dendrimer come from a greek word dendron which means tree and meros means part here we can see that uh, these dendrimer in the diagram we can see uh, it has a several drug locations like this cavity in this cavity we can have encapsulated drug and this surface we can have adsorbed drug so that the drug can be absorbed on the surface and it has also have cleavable linker and we can conjugate a drug here also so we can attach the drug to this dendrimer in different ways and we can also make multifunctional dendrimer because uh, based on uh, the nano carrier which will be having the therapeutic agent yeah yeah yeah, yeah i just am finished and can also be used as imaging agent and this nano particles are used uh, on the principle of uh, photothermal ablation in which it uh, the nano particles are excited via light and uh, it is converted into heat and can destroy cancer cells at 42 degree celsius then there are super pegra magnetic nanoparticle these can act as a magnetic drug targeting and can be modified by improving the solubility and specificity of iron nanoparticles 
so there are some disadvantages of nanomaterial is that not any nanoparticle will work because it depends on the biocompatibility and stable nanoparticles will only work so there are a uh, scope of researches in the future 2 to 3 years as it is more specific so the conclusion of my presentation is that the use of biomaterial and bioactive nanoparticle can help in early detection and treatment of diseases and these treatments show higher degree of accuracy efficacy and are safe to use thank you so much these are the references thank you so much ma'am the floor is now open for the question answer session yes What are the dendry marks and how do we what synthesize? Are, uh, Sorry, ma'am, there is noise. Uh, can you please repeat? What are dendry marks? Yes, ma'am. And how do we Can I ask you a question? And how do we synthesize them? And how, okay, uh, synthesis, uh, ma'am. Actually. the synthesis part is uh, actually it is a polymer so synthesis part i have not discussed here synthesis part so i will not able to tell this the synthesis of the dendrima is there any other query from the participants Thank you so much, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Moving further, I would now like to invite our next presenter, Miss Priya Tripathi. Over to you, ma'am. Thank Priya, you. Thank you so Priya, much. Just, yeah. Priya, just wait. Like I think so. Professor Zaidi was asking something. Sorry, sir. I didn't hear. Sorry, sir. Sir, Professor Zaidi, yeah, you wanted to ask question. I am here. Yeah. Yes, sir. Please ask. Professor Zaidi. Professor Zaidi, unmute yourself, Aap and you can ask question. your question. Okay, okay. Maybe some network issue. Sorry, Rehan, go ahead, please. Okay, sir. I would now invite Priya Tripathi for her presentation. Over to yeah. you, ma'am. Thank you, thank you so much, Rehan. Wait, let me share my screen. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Is my screen visible? Yes, ma'am. Shall I start? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, a very pleasant afternoon to one and all present out here. Before starting my presentation, I want to ask you all a very basic question: That would you drink a black fruity or a clear Pepsi or how about a pink butter or green ketchup? Isn't it amazing? Here, welcome to the era of eating with the eyes. A very pleasant afternoon to one and all present out here. This is Priya Tripathi, MSc, second year student from Department of Biotechnology. So the today's topic of my presentation is natural colorants, a perfect substitute of synthetic colorants. So before starting, I I want to tell you all that after the green revol revolution, the demand of various colors has been increased among the consumers. so at that from that very time point the 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 idea of the nature has provided us various color we can we can say that ki nature provides a palette for our palette so before starting i want to give you all an introduction that today's consumer are proactively seeking food products that contain safe ingredients in them so color is one of the most important ingredients upon which the quality of foods and flavors <clears throat> sorry can be judged so what why do we need colorants and what are they we need colorants to improve the texture and taste we need colorants to make food uh, look more attractive and appetizing and informative to provide colors to the colorless and fun food and to allow consumers to identify products on <clears throat> site now what are food colorants according to fda the food colorants Hello. is any dye or a yes. pigment or substance which when added Hello. or a yes ma'am yes and you are saying something no beta continue beta okay 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 thank you sir apply to a food or a drug or a cosmetic to a human body it is capable of reaction and imparting color 
So we have two, basically we are going to discuss the two type of food colorants. The first one is synthetic and the other one is natural. The synthetic color, colorants, synthetic colorants are the colorants which are derived, uh, which are synthesized chemically in the, uh, in the labs. So the food synthetic colorants are coming from basically from a coal petroleum or a coal tar. So they are, so we have basically some of the food dyes over uh, food colorants over which are approved by the Food and the Drug Administration. Some of them are Brilliant Blue. Then we have Indo Indigo Tine, which, uh, which imparts a dark blue color. Then we have Fast Green, Allura Red, Erythrocyne, Tartrazine, Sunset Yellow, and Ponsau 4R. So these are uh, the example of some of the synthetic colorants which are approved by the FDA. Then these are some of the uh, some of the dyes uh, food colorants which uh, with along with the name and the shade they provide and where we are using for example bright blue is also known as the brilliant blue which are using in power powders jellies confectioneries and icing and syrup so we have n number of uh, uh, synthetic colorants like sea green cherry red oranges along with the common uses then we have banned artificial food coloring. How this is uh, other from the synthetic colorants? These are completely banned by the food uh, administration. These are red number two, four, and three, orange number, yellow number, and violet number. These are the label numbers which are which are printing on the food packets. So we must ab avoid these food colorants because they are uh, they are detrimental to uh, they have detrimental effect on human health. Then. These are some of the stats that uh, consumption and the use of synthetic colorants, despite of knowing the fact that they are hazardous, they have detrimental effect on human uh, human health. Still, we are we still uh, they are in uh, market. So the blue portion is the synthetic use of synthetic colorants were permitted by FDA. Then the red portion shows the use of non-permitted synthetic colorants and the yellow portion is the organic. So we have different uh, stats regarding the use or the consumption of the food colorants. And uh, this shows that from past a decade, the consumption of synthetic colorants uh, uh, in food has been increased to uh, make food very attractive or appetizing. So the, the synthetic colorants, the danger in your kitchen, the synthetic colorants have a detrimental effect on our health, which are some of them are potential danger, dangers are allergic reaction. They are uh, carcinogenic con uh, con contaminants. Kidney and brain and bladder tumors are caused by these. The tumors of the immune system, possibly the adrenal and the testicular tumors. Then uh, it's had been, uh, in the studies, it has been found that they are causing a thyroid uh, tumors also, inhibition of nerve cell development and genotoxicity. And it also contributes to ADHD uh, risk, which is a behavioral disorder. And it is also causing a hormone disruption and hyperactivity in children. So now let's relate this the use of synthetic colorant to our main theme of the uh, conference, that is sustainable development. How the synthetic colorants and environment are related? Is it harmful or is it useful? So the food colorants have many health and environmental concerns. Uh, food colorants affect environment in uh, many ways. Uh, I'm discussing here too, the direct and the indirect ways. In direct ways, it affects, uh, it uh, causes pollution, bioaccumulation, energy consumption. It is non-biodegradable uh, biodegradable in nature. So it, it stays longer in the longer in, in nature. And it also leads to the biomagnification. The indirect ways are desertification, biodiversity related issues and other environmental concerns are like use of chemical, which are non-biodegradable, high BOD and COD, then high, high suspended particles are there. They are carcinogenic and mutagenic and promote toxicity and many more. So here I can say that synthetic, synthetic colorants are not environment friendly. So what's the solution? Here arises the biggest question of the presentation that what's the solution? So the solution is natural colorants. Natural colorants are generally derived from vegetable foods, minerals, or insect originated. And they're also known as bio colorants. Here are some of the list of the bio colorants which are approved by the FDA, like beta carotene, anthocyanin, chlorophyll A, B, then we have bacterial chlorophyll, natto extract, beet juice, blue spirulina extract, paprika, turmeric, and the blend of two or more uh, natural. We have n number of natural colorants, but I'm specifying some of them, which are, we are using on a uh, regular basis. 
then for example we have a biocolorant annatto which gives a orange color so we are not we are not we need not to use a tartrazine or a sun uh, yellow sun yellow color which is carcinogenic and mutagenic we are we have a option we have a substitute we can use annatto which gives a orange color the source is seed extract and we can use in dairy product oil butter or baked items so these are some of the list like we have beta carotene beet powder and the sources like carrot and the beet and the shade which shade they are giving and we have the common uses of these colorants and these are uh, some of the like tamarind fr uh, fruit juice paprika riboflavin saffron turmeric and vegetable juice so these are these bio colorants exactly they are giving exactly the same uh, shade which we are uh, uh, we are getting from the synthetic bio colorants so these are some of the natural carotenoids like fucoxanthin beta carotene and lycopene and this is uh, the natural chlorophyll which uh, which we are able to find in abundantly in nature like chlorophyll a and b and bacteriochlorophyll then here are the application of natural colorants the bioactivity of natural colorants they are they are found to be anti cancer anti anti they have a, uh, they are rich in antioxidants they are in anti inflammatory immunoregulatory uh, they have a apoptotic effect they are uh, they have antimicrobial property now let's talk about the limitations of uh, uh, natural colorant this is the biggest drawback we have uh, in uh, bio colorant when it comes to bio colorant first of all they are very costly so cost is one of the drawback availability we do not have a, a large number of yielding of bio colorants then we have quality varies with the sources for example the spirulina which we are culturing in our uh, for a, for a specific part of a country uh, has that gives a different concentration of protein uh, and then the other than the other countries is spirulina so the uh, the quality varies with the sources then the sensitivity processing conditions such as ph temperature light and etc there are many biocolorants which are sensitive to light we are sensitive to ph then they are sensitive to temperature so now here a question being a budding biotechnology here the okay let me find up here the question arises that how biotechnology can solve these problem so biotechnology can solve these problem by bacterial culture ag uh, algal culture fungal culture and uh, genetically modified organisms so these are the name of the food biocolorants the original sources is plant but with the help of biotechnology uh, logical sources we can modify the organism and we can obtain the uh, that same color on a large variety so my recommendations are we must update our techno uh, technology we must update our reactors we must update uh, the the biochemical process uh, and the biochemist uh, biochemical process engineering so that we can uh, there is a scope of development of new eco friendly pigments and transgenic strains for over production of biocolorants and these are my references thank you so very much organizers and my mentors for being so supportive and um, motivating thank you so very much Thank you so much, ma'am, for such an illuminating presentation. Now the floor is open for the question answer session. Is my screen is, is still visible? No, ma'am. Oh, okay. Thank you, Rahim. Thank you, ma'am. The participants are requested to question the presenter. Please raise your hands if you want to get yourself unmuted. I think no question, Reha. Go for the next participant. Okay. Thank you so very much, organizers. Thank, Thank you, you ma'am. Reham, you know, like participant can unmute themselves by their own. Oh, okay, sir. Thank you. So, Doctor Imran has Dr. raised. Imran, I want to ask, huh? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Doctor Imran, you want to ask question? Yes, sir. Yes, please go ahead. Okay. Yes. My, yes, sir. Am yes, I audible? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm loading a clock, sir. Phone. Okay. Uh, a very well presentation. Thank you, sir. It would yes, be sir. possible to make natural dyes available to such a large population. And you have uh, discussed how biotechnology can cope up with it. Yes, sir. Uh, do you think the fast uh, nat natural dyes are so fast as synthetic dyes? Uh, there is fast. some limiting application. Uh, 
we can limit yes. to a particular application to the natural dye but yes sir uh, we cannot substitute uh, uh, synthetic dye from the natural dye do you think everywhere we uh, natural color colorants or the natural dyes are applicable Yes, um, sir. In my personal, thank you so much for the question, sir. In my opinion, sir, we have, uh, if I'm, if I see from the, on the behalf of the biotechnology like, logical aspect, that sir, we have upgraded the extraction process. We have upgraded our technologies, which are very good at extraction processes. So we are able to uh, extract the core material, the core pigments. And uh, if we talk about the sensitivity, like uh, uh, in earlier days, the biocolorants were pH sensitive. temperature sensitive and chemical sensitive but nowadays with the help of genetically modified organism with integrated crops uh, management uh, system integrated uh, crop designing system we are able to extract the color on at a industrial level with the more accuracy and with the uh, without harming the exact core pigment so so with the help of biotechnology and biochemical engineering process we yes we are able to extract the pigment on a large scale and uh, definitely sir it could uh, it could uh, it can substitute the synthetic coloring sir definitely so like we have uh, industrial methods are electric field based method then we have a pulsed electric uh, field method these are sir the said they were published in a paper of 2021 so in this technique it was found that without harming the core material of the pigment we can extract the intercellular matrix and it could definitely substitute the synthetic color sir am i audible thank you ma'am I would now like to invite our next presenter, Miss Shambhavi Mishra. Over to you, ma'am. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Okay, now I'll be sharing my screen. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Shambhavi Mishra from Department of Biotechnology, Sabala Thoban College. Um, the topic for my presentation is the role of plant growth promoting rhizobacteria for eco-benzene agriculture. So, um, as we know that in current cultivation method, there is a huge use of nitrogen and phosphorus fertilizers, which has led to soil, water, and air pollution. um it also affects soil fertility by making them unobtainable to crops so crop produced are needed to be disease resistant um soil tolerant and heavy metal stress tolerant and they should have uh, enhanced nutritional characteristics and this all can be achieved by using soil microbes preferably bacteria and the most promising bacteria that we could use is pgpr that is plant growth promoting rhizobacteria because they don't have any side effects and they promote the plant growth and plant health the plant promoting rhizobacteria or pgpr term was coined by the kluper and the swanton and pgpr bacteria are present within the rhizosphere now what is rhizosphere so rhizosphere um, is a kind of uh, soil atmosphere which uh, is a kind of a soil atmosphere surrounding the plant root and it is enriched with microbial activity there are two different kinds of pgpr the extracellular pgpr and intracellular pgpr bacteria that uh, occupy the rhizosphere on the rhizoplane or um, within the root of within the cells of root uh, are the extracellular plant growth promoting rhizobacteria and it includes the azospirillum bacillus and chromobacterium intracellular plant growth promoting rhizobacteria are those bacteria that uh, dwell inside the particular nodal structure of the root cells and uh, they include allorhizobium and rhizobium pgpr 
PGPR enhances uh, the plant growth by two different mechanisms, the direct and the indirect mechanism. Um, direct mechanism involves the role of PGPR in nutrient fixation and securing plant productivity. Now, uh, bacteria like Azotobacter helps in the nitrogen fixation as nitrogen is most vital nutrient and it is extracted from soil in the form of ammonium and nitrogen. Second most important nutrient is phosphorus and uh, bacteria like Pseudomonas or Bacillus solubilize, uh, uh, solubilize phosphorus in form of monobasic and dibasic ions. Now there's the third major nutrient that is potassium and it plays a role in seed and root development. Potassium is absorbed in its ionic form by acid thiobacillus bacteria. PGPR can uh, secrete phytohormones, which are organic substances like auxins, gibberellin, cytokinin, and ethylene that influence the biochemical and the physiological processes of plant. PGPR secrete indole 3 acetic acid, which is responsible uh, for the root growth stimulation. And uh, uh, PGPR produce auxins, which is uh, responsible for the root elongation and root branching in plants. Cytokinin is also secreted by PGPR and the Pseudomonas fluorescence G, uh, G2018 bacteria secreting, cytok secreting cytokinin uh, regulates the arabidiosis development. Now, uh, next is... Yeah. Next is the siderophore production by PGPR. So siderophores are small organic molecules which are formed by microbes, mainly PGPR, that enhance the iron uptake in iron-limiting conditions of plant. Pseudomonas bacteria consume siderophore, which is present in rhizosphere, for fulfilling its iron necessity. Now comes the indirect mechanism, which includes the method by which, uh, uh, by which PGPR prevents dangerous outcomes of phytopathogens under environmental stress, abiotic stress tolerance. So abiotic stress includes uh, extreme temperatures, drought, high wind, salinity, floods, which has negative impact on crop production. Tolerance to these stress includes the deposition of some metabolites, uh, for example, abscisic acid, polysugars, proline, and uh, the production of enzymatic and um, non-enzymatic antioxidants. Next is biotic stress tolerance. So biotic stress mainly includes the pathogens such as uh, bacteria, viruses, fungi, and nematodes, which are uh, responsible for the decrease in the agricultural yield. And this all can be... Um, the, this all can be uh, resolved by using PGPR, uh, such as uh, Bacillus, Thuringiensis, and many more bacteria. And it also, and it has also been observed uh, that soaking roots or the seeds of plant in PGPR cultures provide resistance to biotic stress. PGPR uh, are responsible for the formation of volatile organic compounds. What are volatile organic compounds are uh, mainly produced by bacteria, including Bacillus, Pseudomonas, and Arthrobacter. And the best two volatile organic compounds are acetoin and 2,3-butadienoyl, uh, which is mainly produced by Bacillus bacteria. Now comes the secretion of defensive enzymes. So secretion of defensive enzymes by PGPR enhances plant growth. Enzymes such as beta-1,3 gluconase and ACC deaminase and chitinase are usually concerned with the lysing uh, microbial cell wall and are mainly uh, functioning uh, in defense against the fungal pathogens and they regulate the plant growth also. Key role of PGPR as biofertilizer. So um, biofertilizers have become very important for the organic farming. And uh, these are the combination of the living and latent cells. Biofertilizers are a mixture of PGPR such as pseudomonas or bacillus with manure, which uh, promote the plant growth. 
and there is an increase of mineral content in rhizosphere after applying the biofertilizer mainly nitrogen potassium and phosphorus are found and it uh, promotes this soil fertility too beneficial and harmful aspects of pgpr so in beneficial properties most of the pgpr uh, advances the plant tolerance and they allow the plant to grow under environmental stresses um some produce cyanide which is a growth promoter and uh, cyanide is a secretion of pseudomonas species next is oxen oxen is produced uh, to promote the plant growth at low concentrations rhizobiotoxin rhizobiotoxin can overcome the negative effect of stress uh, which is induced by ethylene and it acts as the inhibitor of ethylene synthesis process now if we talk about um, the harmful properties so um, oxen which is secreted by pgpr uh, sometimes when kept at high concentrations can prevent the plant growth uh, rhizobiotoxin uh, induces the foliar chlorosis in soya beans and legume plants negative effect of pgpr uh, um sir yes shambhavi am i audible i actually yes, my yes. meeting was cancelled maybe some technical issue please continue okay okay wait i'm sorry aap logo ne kahan tak suna tha uh I mean, I think I ended here only. I'm sorry for the technical issue, but now I would like to continue my presentation. So, uh, in conclusion, as I was saying that uh, due to the rise in the human population, there's uh, always an increase in the demand of food all over the world, and so there is an eventually there is an increment in the agricultural produce and which leads to the decrease in the soil fertility so this must come to rest by making better choices using intensive agriculture and biofertilizers and many more processes so pgpr has major in influence in this uh, in this case of uh, bioremediation or if we talk about the biocontrol or biofertilization which employs good crop productivity and soil fertility and the involvement of nanotechnology along with the pgpr will also help to reduce the damages which are made to ecosystem uh, i mean within the rhizosphere pgpr process with the nanoparticles or nanofibers coated with gold or um, aluminum and silver metals uh, are shown to uh, improve the plant growth by acting as a portable nano fertilizer and nano fungicides also there are nano bio fertilizers which are used to regulate the delivery of the fertilizer into the target cell of the plant so that we uh, don't uh, get the undesirable damage and we can easily condense this process by micro encapsulation or nano encapsulation thank you um, thank you to the faculty of and the departments of chemistry and biotechnology and the principal ma'am for providing us such a great opportunity thank you
Thank you so much, Ms. Shambhavi. Now the floor is open for the question answer session. Um, is my screen still visible? No. Um, is my screen still visible? No. Uh, one thing I would like to ask all the participants who are presenting uh, from the white course, if you please just, it's not visible. Uh, your screen is not uh, visible. We are not able to see anything. If you just turn it on the horizontal mode. So if you just turn horizontal mode. I think so it will be much more better. I Participants are requested to please question the presenter. As we have no questions, so we'll move further with our next presentation, which will be given by Priya Chaturvedi. Over to you, ma'am. Ma'am, we are unable to hear you. No, ma'am, you're not audible. No, ma'am, you are not audible. Permission is allowed. There is yes, no power on permission. Yes, ma'am. That's the reason why I just cross-checked myself. Ma'am, mm -hmm. you have the permission. Dr. Talwar, can we proceed to the next speaker and let her uh, clear her snag and then she can come back? Yes, yes, definitely. Yes, ma'am. Let him call the next participant. Yes, so our next presenter is Ms. Shadma Nafis. Hello? Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes. Okay. You are audible. Okay. Just a moment. Is my screen visible? Yes, ma'am. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. 
Uh, um, hello everyone. My name is Shadman Nafis. I am MSc Biotechnology, final year student. I am going to give a presentation on the topic of overview on biomedical nanotechnology. In this presentation, I will be talking about how biomedical nanotechnology is applied in treating different diseases uh, using nanoparticles. Okay. First, I will start with the nanotechnology. The term nanotechnology was coined by Norio Taniguchi. Uh, nanotechnology is used to gap is to is used to bridge the gap between the classical and the quantum mechanics. Nanotechnology is used is applied in the development of nanomedicine, which play a significant role in the disease prevention, diagnosis, treatment, and vaccine development, and much more. So, uh, I'll next uh, I will move and move towards the application of uh, biomedical nanotechnology. There are many applications <laughs> available. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Hmm. Hello. Hmm. it is some technical. Oh. Somebody is unmuted. Oh, please continue. Okay. 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 Okay, I'll continue. Uh, so the there are many applications <laughs> available for nanotechnology. If you <laughs> are, excuse me. Other participants have requested to please mute themselves. Thank you, ma'am. Please proceed. Sorry for the glitches. Ma'am, we are unable to hear you. Hello? Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, now you're audible. Okay. Can I continue from here? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, so the applications of uh, biomedical nanotechnologies are uh, in the field of nanomedicine, uh, which include uh, the drug delivery, gene delivery, and the uh, and uh, for the and for the cancer treatment. Okay, and the second uh, application in the nanoscale uh, imaging, which is used for the optical imaging and which like Raman imaging, and it is used in devices like MRI, PET, and and uh, and SPECT. Okay, um, biological 3D printing. Uh, it comes. Uh, it is used in the medical applications like uh, skin graft, bone graft, implants. Okay, in the field of bioinformatics, nanotechnology is used uh, to develop biomarkers, and and the nanomaterials are being developed to use uh, uh, to deliver the drug therapy. Okay, I'll move on to the next slide. Okay, sorry. So I'll talk about nanoparticles. Nanoparticle is consequently something that is so small that cannot be seen with the naked eye or even through a conventional microscope. Uh, these uh, particles can occur naturally or being manufactured by humans. Uh, in comparison to the bulky compounds, nanoparticles have a great surface area to volume ratio. Okay, nanoparticles is uh, uh, any material having at least one of its dimension ranging from one to 100 nanometers. There are various nanometer, uh, nanoparticles available and they are used for diagnostic and therapeutic purposes. There, there, these are some examples of uh, various nanoparticles, uh, silicon nanoparticle, gold nanoparticle, vessels, carbon nanotubes, uh, and much more. I will include some of it in my presentation. Okay, first I'll start with the missiles. Uh, missiles are the uh, amphilic structures with hydrophobic pores and hydrophilic shells, as you can see here. Uh, they are spherical and they are water soluble. And it allows the easily it allows to deliver intravenously very easily. Okay, uh, and uh, they are used in the drug delivery and and are used as a potential self-adjuvant vaccine to treat uh, herpes simplex infection. 
Okay. Uh, the second one is the lipid-based nanoparticle. These are the most widely studied nanoparticle and are commonly used in the drug, drug delivery and the cancer therapy. Okay. Uh, so uh, here, the, uh, the lipid-based nanoparticle, it can be categorized into liposomes, nanoemulsion, solid lipid nanoparticles, and nanosuspensions. Liposomes uh, are actually um, are used for drug delivery and a liposome can uh, used in a solution. Actually, they are delivered by the way. Uh, they are poured in a solution of DNA and drugs and they are taken up by the cell. This is a Sorry. Wait, hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hello? Hello? May I order? Am I order? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. You're ordered, ma'am. Okay, okay. Uh, liposomes can fuse with the cell membrane and it can be easily delivered through different uh, parts and it can easily cross the bilayer membrane of the cell. Please open your video. Okay. Okay. Am I, am I visible? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So and the, then I'll talk about the dendrimers. Dendrimers are the complex synthetic structures. These are highly branched. They are used in gene therapy, drug delivery, targeting ca cancer cells, and mostly used in the treatment of HIV and herpes, herpes simplex virus. So these are the most adaptable and adjustable nanoparticles uh, due to the ability of, uh, uh, of high dimension structure and surface activity. These are widely used. Uh, they are used for multi-purpose nano multi-purpose nanomedicine for oncology drug delivery, and uh, they are also used in the devices like MRI. <laughs> yeah, the next one is the metal nanoparticles. So, so metal like uh, gold and silver, these are commonly used as nanoparticles, uh, and and they are all and then they are used to diagnose and treat virus diseases like HIV, herpes simplex, hepatitis, and influenza virus. Gold nanoparticles are used in bi biological imaging, electronics, and material research. Uh, these particles uh, size vary ranges from five nanometer to four hundred nanometer in diameter. And gold nanoparticle, gold nanoparticle can easily penetrate the cell. Uh, we have seen, and it is being reported in various research papers. In the HIV virus, it 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 enters the gold nanoparticle penetrates the HIV virus where the replication occurring in, and it is seen in the lymphocytes and macrophages. Okay, uh, and the different. Uh, uh, diseases like uh, like HSV and human papilloma virus, dengue, uh, all these diseases can be treated with using nano met this gold nanoparticle. Okay, so the next one is the quantum dot. These are these are also widely used uh, uh, nanomaterials, and these are the semiconductor nanocrystal with uh, with high optical and electrical characteristics. The quantum dots are employed in various imaging and treatment purposes, uh, and they are effective against anti-AIDS medicine and to transport the uh, drug like squavenate through the blood-brain barrier. Uh, the, so the, the last, uh, I'll try to give, summarize this. The future perspective of the nanomaterials recently, nanomaterials like itrosin nanosphere, Nanomaterials like nano gold nanorods, titanium oxides are used uh, against the Other participants are requested to please mute themselves. Uh, these hmm. different nanoparticles uh, have uh, an coronavirus activity. They are used to in the detection and the diagnosis of coronavirus, the SARS-CoV virus. Okay, and the, these are these nanoparticles are also used in as a nano disinfectant, and it was being developed uh, and named under EWNS. Okay, and it is it was very effective against the influenza virus, uh, and it can be used as a surface disinfectant. Uh, another most famous approach was the development of the biosensor, a Fed-based biosensor. Here you can see in this image. Uh, 
Now the sample a nasal sample is collected from an infected person, and then hmm, it is being uh, applied through this uh, biosensor here. It is this uh, biosensor. It is being developed by layering the graphene sheet with silicon oxide, and uh, and the this is SARS CoV. Uh, by but the SARS CoV virus has a spike particle. Okay, so the spike protein. Sorry, the spike protein it gets bind with the it gets bind with the graphene sheet and and also find bound with the SARS CoV antigen. This uh, sensor is mostly used to differentiate between the antigen of SARS CoV and MERS CoV virus. Uh, so I'd like to conclude my presentation. So uh, a few words. Nano-based methods are effective in boosting medication delivery to a specific target location, which increases the residence, uh, residence duration and increases the drug use efficiency. Liposomes and gold nanoparticles were discovered to have antiviral property. Uh, nanotechnology also have a large potential in prevention, disease, diagnosis, treatment, immunization, and research of various viral diseases. The global desire to provide efficient technology to tackle has promoted the researchers and companies to shift their traditional approach to move towards the nanotechnology. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity. And, and if there is any question, please do ask. Thank you so much, ma'am, for such an enlightening presentation. For such an enlightening presentation. The floor is now open for the question and answer session. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. I'm sorry, sir. You're not audible. Nanoparticles and their implication into lens system. Not audible. Yes, sir. So you're not audible. So your voice is cracking. Professor Zedi, your voice is not coming. Sir, your voice is cracking. So you can write question in the chat box also. We will read for you. Sir, you unmute yourself first. Reham sir has written question in the chat box. No, ma'am, not yet. No, ma'am. Ma'am, maybe okay. it's a direct message for you. Not me. Professor Zedi, you can unmute yourself. I think uh, uh, sir signal is weak. So we are not able to get his voice. So uh, Dr. Talwar, what you can do is ask Dr. Zaidi to send the questions to you so that on his behalf, you can ask him because okay. he's a very Fine. senior scientist from Panthagar University. So we would definitely like to have some questions for and queries from him. Okay. Fine. Fine. Sir is writing again. He is uh, muted. Okay. I am writing.
I think so. The chat box is also not able. He'll be unable yes. to write in the chat box. Yes. So you can directly ask him the questions. No, I am asking. Yes, sir. You can write to me. The, the chat, chat box, box is, is enabled. enabled. It's, it's not, not the same. Okay, you carry on, Reha. Now, now it has been enabled. Okay. Ma'am, should we proceed? Yes, yes. Okay. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your presentation. Thank so our next presenter is Ms. Vishakha Pandey. Excuse me. Yes. It's not Vishaka Pandey, it's Gyanshi Mishra. Okay, sorry, sorry. My apologies. It's... Sorry? Priya Chaturvedi. Priya Chaturvedi. Ma'am, please proceed. Can I pro proceed? Yes, ma'am. My base down, base down. What happened? Ma'am, Priya Chaturvedi wanted to present. But maybe there again, there is a, some connection problem. No, ma'am, she's there. Okay. I'm audible now. I'm audible now. Yes, ma'am, you're audible. So, good afternoon, respected teachers. So, I'm Priya Chaturvedi. On behalf of the Messi Biotech Department of East Urban College, Lucknow, I'm going to give an informative presentation on the topic Nanotechnology, a Modern Weapon for Cancer. Before starting our presentation, I would like to say, as we know, science is a proof of mankind. It can lead humans to a better crop living and an array of incurring diseases that were once considered as an incurable. This presentation emphasizes on the cancer drug delivery, cancer drug targeting, application in cancer diagnosis, as well as the treatment with its future expect. In my first slide, I'm going to talk about what is cancer, about nanotechnology and the currently used method for the cancer treatment and why they are risky. So, the cancer is a rapid multiplication of the abnormal cell that grow beyond their unusual boundaries and spread the other part of the body. Finding the innovative treatment for cancer is a major problem in the worldwide. But now, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, surgery becomes the currently used method for the cancer treatment. All these methods are very risky because they may damage the normal tissue and there may be incomplete eradication of the cancer. But nanotechnology offers the means to aim the chemotherapies straight away and selectively to the cancer cell. The recent progress in nanotechnology based application in the cancer diagnosis has been summarized in the flowchart. So in the flowchart, there is a use of nanotechnology in the cancer by uh, in vivo tumor imaging and the detection of the biomarkers and the detection of the cancer cell. Cancer diagnosis through nanoparticle. When we talk about cancer diagnosis through nanoparticle, then uh, 
Then nanotechnology based detection methods are developed as an encouraging tool for cost effective cancer diagnosis. Currently, there are many techniques to detect early stage of cancer like histopathology, cytology and imaging technique, but I'm going to talk about nanoparticles. So nanoparticles is basically used to diagnose cancer because uh, it helps to seize cancer by markers such as circulating tumor cells, circulating tumor DNA and exosome. Then the question arises, how it will help? So the answer will be, the large surface of the nanoparticle facilitate easy adhesion of the peptides, antibodies, small molecules, and the other components. These components later can bind and recognize the specific cancer molecule. Different strategies to target cancer cells using nanoparticle. I'm going to explain this topic in a nutshell. There are two major tumor targeting strategies. First is the passive targeting cancer cell and second is the active targeting cancer cell. Both are uh, widely studied. These two studies are correlated and work too efficiently deliver the drug particle to the target site. But when we talk about uh, passive targeting, it is basically the uh, assemblage of the macromolecule, including the nanoparticles in the neoplastic tissues. This process depends upon the enhanced permeability and the retention effect, which is known as EPR effect and the tumor microenvironment. This technique, in this technique, drug targeting occurs because of the body's natural response in the physiochemical characteristics of the drug. When there are some advantages, there will be disadvantages. So in passive targeting, the limitation is like in tumor, targeting cell is not always visible diffuse because of the gap between the endothelial cell. For understanding this limitation, uh, you can see the figure. So in, in this figure, basically by EPR effect, how nanoparticles can uh, passively excavate it through the leaky vascularization, allowing the accumulation at the tumor region. So in this case, drug may be released in the extracellular matrix and then it will diffuse through the tissue. Active targeting. While active targeting of the drug carrier initially utilizes the benefit of the passive targeting, it accumulates into the tumor region and subsequently it will bind to the target cell using the targeting ligands. Targeting ligand that will lead the receptor mediated internalization of the nanoparticles into the cell. So when we talk about advantages, there will be disadvantages. So here the limitation will be mainly the targeting ligand may expose the nanocarrier system to reticular endothelial system, which will result in the higher accomplishment of the nanoparticles occur in unwanted organ over the expected one. In the active targeting, there will be a no EPR effect. In my next slide, some approved drug some approved nanomedicines for cancer. Newly developed therapeutic nanoparticles have shown greater anti-cancer efficacy and lower toxicity than their corresponding free agent. There are some therapeutic nanoparticles are already approved by FDA for the clinical use. There is a, you can see here the list below. Uh, all these are the approved nanomedicines for the cancer. Now the challenges while using nanoparticles. There are like four main challenges while using nanoparticles, like oxidative stress, lung inflammation, uh, cell injury, neuro, neurotoxicity. Oxidative stress and lung inflammation can result from the free radicals or the oxidative activity of the nanoparticle, which may eventually lead into the genotoxicity. Neurotoxicity, we can see in both in vivo or in vitro, and which may also occur when a few nanoparticles tends to cross the blood-brain barrier through the intravenous route. Future prospect and conclusion. Conclusion is like nanotechnology has shown a lot of promising field in the cancer therapy over the years. By their improved pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamic property, nanomaterials have contributed to improved cancer diagnosis and treatment.
when we talk about future prospect nanoparticles can be considered as a future of cancer treatment the prospering field of nanotherapeutic is a promise is a promising that and the convenient early diagnosis and the therapy of various diseases particularly cancer is providing the personalized oncology medicine and is opening gate for the further investigation at last i hope this presentation can be bit helpful for you and i would like to thank president ma'am principal ma'am head of the department organizer so teachers for giving me such a wonderful opportunity and thank you all for those who are present here thank you so much thank you thank you ma'am for your wonderful presentation the floor is now open for the question answer session as we have no questions so we will move further with the next presenter i, I would now like to invite ms shikha ban vishakha bande to proceed vidu divyanshi yes ma'am no, divyanshi oh sorry ms divyanshi to proceed i'm sorry so shall i start yes sure yes. give me one minute so good afternoon to everyone My name is Divyanshi Mishra from Department of Biotechnology, Isabella Thoban College. So my topic is presentation is biopesticide and eco-friendly yes, alternatives. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, you are requested to please share your slides. Is it not visible? No, ma'am. Sorry. is it visible now no ma'am Mr. Vyanshi, are you there? Maybe there is some connecting problem, so we'll move further with the next presenter, Miss Neelam Kumari. This is the last call for Miss Neelam Kumari. Sorry for the interruption. Shall I Divyansh? start? Okay, okay, ma'am. Please continue, Devyanshi Mishra. Please continue. Thank you. Thank 
Is it visible now? Yes, ma'am, it's visible. Please continue. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Pranshi Mishra from the Department of Biotechnology, Isabella Thaban College. So my topic for presentation is biopesticides and eco-friendly alternative to chemical pesticides for sustainable agriculture. So as we all know, India is an agriculture dominated country and pesticides have been <coughs> pesticides have been proved very efficient in boosting the agriculture sector but chemical pesticides have many harmful effects so we need a sustainable alternative of chemical pesticide which is not harmful for environment and other living organisms in this slide uh, in this slide, there are some harmful effects associated with chemical pesticides. When the chemical pesticides is sprayed on plants, their particles are scattered by the wind and pollute the open water bodies as well as affect the other living organisms. So the chemical pesticides many may cause many potential damage to our health as well as to the environment. Uh, harmful effects from chemical pesticides are classified into three categories. First one is acute effect. This is also called short-term effect, like uh, stinging eyes, rashes, blisters, skin irritation, and nausea. Second type is delayed effect. These are long-term effects like loss of memory and anxiety and trouble concentrating. Third one is allergic effects. It may cause Skin sensitization includes swelling, redness, itching, pain, and blistering. So this table includes some specific chemical pesticides with their IUPAC name, structure, and harmful effects. First one is carboxin. It is slightly toxic. Symptoms can include vomiting and headache. Recovery is very rapid if the exposed individual is treated quickly. Second type, second one is chlorothalonil. Breathing chlorothalonil can irritate the nose, throat and lungs, causing cough. It may also affect the kidneys as well. Third one is glycophosate. Products containing glycophosate may cause eyes or skin irritation. Fourth one is bromacil. Bromacil available as a herbicide. Exposure to bromacil can cause cellular thyroid changes and decrease in body weight. Fifth one is carbofuron. Exposure to carbofuron can cause weakness, sweating, nausea, and vomiting, abdominal pain, and blood visions. So here are two diagrams. First one is of pesticide pollution. As I told earlier, after the spraying of chemical pesticides on plants, sorry, as I told earlier, after the spraying of chemical pesticides on plants, the particles of pesticides are scattered by wind erosion and run off into open water, contaminate public water supply as well as fish and other seafood. And the second diagram is on biomagnification. It occurs when toxic chemicals like DDT, whose remains in the environment, are consumed indirectly by organism in the higher food chain, consumes the lower organism containing such chemicals. The chemicals can get accumulated in the higher organism. Now let's come to our main topic, biopesticides. So biopesticides are naturally occurring compounds or agents that are obtained from animals, plants, microorganisms, and are used to control agriculture, pests, and pathogens. As a sustainable alternative of chemical pesticides, biopesticides are introduced in the field of agriculture. So advantages of biopesticides. They are effective in very less quantity, these have a target specificity that means they kill only targeted animal or organism and do not damage the soil, water supply or the wildlife, including the beneficial insect. They can control pests by non-toxic mechanism. So the next is 
categories of bio pesticides so there are four major categories of bio pesticides first one is microbial pesticides these are naturally occurring microorganism biological toxins material derived from microorganism such as bacillus thuringiensis or bt second type of bio pesticide is plant incorporated protectants these are genetically modified plants in which specific gene are inserted to produce a pesticide inside the plant these pesticides develop inside the tissues of the plant third one is semio chemicals these are organic compounds used by insect to convey specific chemical messages that modify behavior or physiology example insect pheromones allele chemicals etc fourth one is bio chemicals pesticides these pesticides reduce or destroy the pest by non toxic mechanism such as neem oil canola oil etc so this diagram shows mechanism of action of bacillus thuringiensis as an insecticide the primary action is to lyse mid gut epithelial cells by inserting into targeted membrane and forming pores it causes insect to stop feeding and it leads to starvation or death so now we move towards bio pesticide as tool of integrated pest management or ipm ipm aims to suppress pest populations below the economic injury level Uh, so bio pesticides can be used as a tool of ipm because they are less expensive to develop these are natural compounds and don't contain any harmful effect they may have little or no residue these are used in integrated strategies with traditional pesticides to increase crop yields by working synergistically with chemical pesticides to extend application timing and allow timely reuptake intervals next is current status of bio pesticides so execution of bio pesticides is still restricted as compared with synthetic chemicals pesticide due to expensive production methods poor storage stability susceptibility to environmental conditions etc currently there are 175 bio pesticides registered globally while india has only 12 registered bio pesticide in which six are bacterial two are fungal and two are plant products so this slide contains 12 registered bio pesticides in india so here are 12 registered bio pesticide which are registered in india the most common neem based bio pesticides and different subspecies of bacillus thuringiensis now we move towards conclusion bio pesticides are potential weapon to fight against pest and to reduce pesticide pollution more research should be conduct to completely replace chemical pesticides with bio pesticide and more attention should be paid on the commercialization of these natural alternatives awareness program should be organized in which farmers and common people should be educated about the side effects of chemical pesticides and usefulness of bio pesticides so thank you to all respected teachers and organizers to giving me this opportunity to present my topic thank you so much Thank you so much ma'am the floor is now open for the question answer session Hello Yes sir Yes sir uh, Divyanshi you presented very well uh, Thank you sir I just want to ask is there any success story using bio pesticide uh, in agriculture uh, removing agricultural pest Is there any success story Yes, sir. Neem-based bio pesticides and uh, Bacillus thuringiensis, uh, including bio pesticides, are very useful in the field of agriculture as well. And you you explained that 
bacterial some bacteria bacteria are working as biopesticides yes sir bacteria itself is working as a biopesticide or some or bio by product they are producing which acts as biopesticides uh, sir anti antimicrobial substances such as limonene camphor uh, these are the used in making of natural biopesticides we have one question from katyani joshi and the question is which tropic level is more sustainable to biomagnification and does biopesticides also show biomagnification to a certain extent the question is susceptible sorry ma'am susceptible uh i think more susceptible to biomagnification so Apex predators are more sustainable. Susceptible. Sorry, sorry. Thank you so much, Divyanshi. Moving to our next presenter, we have Nishi Nishi Yadav. Is Nishi here? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes ma'am. Nishi, please unmute yourself. Please unmute yourself. You're not audible to us. Am I audible? Yes, now you're audible. Good afternoon, everyone. It's indeed a pleasure to be part of this conference. I'm Nishi Yadav on behalf of my group members. Prajans Bulzar, Neha Agarwal, under guidance of Dr. Padma Hazra, is published is is given my review article on the beneficial reuse of plastics in road construction. In today's era, the use of plastic has increased tremendously. It could be attributed towards the impervious nature of plastics, its lightweight and easy portability. Talking about the statistics. The production of plastic all over the world has crossed 400 million metric tons per year, and particularly about India, it is 3.3 million metric tons as of 2018-19 data. Looking at the pie chart of production of single-use plastics according to the United Nations Environment Programme data 2018, we find that the packaging industry alone produces 36 percent of the plastic waste. Other industries like building and construction, textiles, and electronic industry they also contribute. In the plastic waste generation, as we know, plastic is a non-biodegradable substance. It takes thousands of years for its decomposition, so it's a major threat to the environment. So, India, which is moving forward with its sustainable development plans, is moving forward now with the three R policy: reuse, reduce, and recycle. Here, we are focusing on recycling and reuse. One of the ways to reuse plastic is use it in the construction of roads. Use of plastic in road construction is gaining importance because of its higher durability, greater performance, more life, and low construction cost. Initially, the idea of plastic roads was given by Dr. Raj Gopal and Vasudevan from the Department of Chemistry, Tiagraj College of Engineering, Madras. 
He investigated that coating of plastic reduces the porosity, absorption of moisture, and improves softness and soundness of food. The polymer coated aggregate between mixed forms better material for flexible pavement construction. Talking about the composition of plastic roads, plastic road, plastics from various sources like the from carry bags to the and squeezable bottles, packaging material, etc., it is collected. And these plastics they contain low density polyethylene, high density polyethylene, other polymers like polystyrene and polyvinyl chloride. These are harmful for the environment, but they are useful when it, they are considered in road construction. Many scientists have worked in the area of plastic roads. First one being Dr. R. Vasudevan that I have described. Later in 2014, S. Dombi sir, he has elaborated about the sexual replacement of vitamin with plastic by the wet mix process. In 2008, Verma SSR studied that plastic increases the melting point of vitamin. This technique not only strengthens roads, but it also increases its life. In 2012, Amit Dabangi Ital, in his journal, he has summarized the use of plastic in vitamin. It improves the mechanical properties which were, are required for flexible roads. Rukandia sir, he has prepared a semi-dense vitamin with concrete mix using Martian methods in his study of study the use of waste plastic and waste rubber tires in flexible highway pavements. Now moving forward towards the steps of construction, steps in construction of plastic roads. The first step is collection of plastic waste. Plus, the, our rat pickers and kabadiwala play a significant role in collection of this plastic waste. After that, segregation of these waste is done. Then these waste are properly cleaned and dried. And then they move towards the spreading. In spreading part, these waste are broken down into smaller particles of 2.3 millimicron to 4.7 millimicron with the help of a spreading machine. After this process is over, these substances, the aggregate, which is the concrete part that contains sand, gravel, etc. It is heated to 165 to 170 degrees Celsius in a mini hot mixture plant, and then it is transferred into a mixing chamber. Vitamin, it is also heated at 160 degrees Celsius in a different plant. Then surface coating is done. In the mixing chamber, the shredded plastic, it is added with the hot mixture and it gets uniformly coated all over the uh, surface of aggregate mixture. After that, mixing is done. You take vitamin, it is added immediately and the contents are mixed properly. After all these mixing processes, the uh, uh, laying of roads is done. It is done at 110 to 120 degrees Celsius. A roller is used for this, which makes the road compact and uniform. Various steps of construction of roads they are given as I have described first the cleaning of plastic and plastic waste is done then spreading it is done then this aggregate plant they are transported into the mini hot mix plant then aggregate that is transported into puddler then finally then addition of plastic is done after that addition of vitamin done is done then aggregate of plastic waste and plastic vitamin mixture is done and finally the laying of roads is done when we compare plastic roads with ordinary roads, we find that plastic roads are more light and they are more hollow. As a result, the uh, pipelines and electrical verification could be done easily, and they are more they have they are more flexible. They are they are, and their lifespan is also large. Talking about advantages of plastic roads, they they have more strength and high performance as compared to the ordinary roads. And as we know, vitamin it's a non renewable source of energy. It is obtained from petroleum. So this vitamin, use of this vitamin is reduced by about 10% by use of plastics. And also the, these plastic roads that have formation of holes is also less in these. And these roads are more economical and eco friendly As everything has pros and cons, so does plastic roads too have. Plastic roads, um, during melting of plastics, the structural weakness may occur and which may cause premature failure of the roads. And also after the first rain, the after the road has been laid, it may cause some leaching problems. As a result, the road can become sticky. Also, many times the plastics in the roads, it's break down into microplastics and may find its way into the soil, which causes some amount of water pollution. Finally, I would like to conclude that in a country like India, where we need so a large amount of road connectivity, it is a good way for using the plastic waste at the same time constructing roads too. So in a way, by using plastic, we are moving towards a cleaner and more sustainable 
environment and leaving a green and clean and planet for our future generation. Thank you and have a nice day. Thank you so much. Now the floor is open for the question answer session. Uh, so, uh, Nishin, uh, question is in the chat box. My question to you is that first of all, which kind of plastics can be used for manufacture of roads? Ma'am, all the types of plastics, basically the reusable types of plastic, like from the plastics that we get from uh, bottles, etc., packaging materials, and also the thermos setting plastics. That, can that you are give there. me codes? Can you give me codes of which plastics we can use and which we cannot use? Can we use six Number or six. maybe three? The plastic code. Can you tell me which codes can be used? Recycling codes are there, na? So which plastics we can use and which we cannot? Uh, ma'am, ma'am, the plastics which contain the polymers like polystyrene, polyvinyl chloride, etc. These plastics. So can we use polystyrene? Can we use polystyrene? Yes, ma'am. We can use poly. We can use polystyrene. We can use polyvinyl chloride. And Bacha, we can't. These are the two. No, no. <laughs> these are the two we can't use. We can't use these. You can only use four P low density. And the others yes, you can't. Low right? Okay, ma'am. Only four can be used. Others you can't use. And what is the ratio of bitumen to plastic which is taken? Ma'am, uh, it's taken into in. Uh, between is to classic, it is in one is to one ratio. You need to go through it, Pacha. We have a question from Katyani Joshi, and her question is Heating plastics such as PP or PE release moderate to high toxic gases like, like carbon monoxide, formaldehyde. So workers engaged in road laying are particularly at risk from these emissions. So is there any way by which we can tackle the situation? Yes, ma'am. In the industry, the, the gas absorbers could, could be used. In the uh, gas absorbers can be used like catalytic converters and smoke absorption absorbers, they can be used, which will absorb these gases. So this is a, a way in which it could be done. Thank you so much. Thank you. Moving on to our next presenter, we have Dr. Neelam Kumari. Over to you, ma'am. Dr. Neelam, ma'am is here. I think ma'am is not here. Ma'am, she is here. Ma'am, she, she is here. here? Okay. Uh, she is here. Dr. Neela? Are you hearing us? Well, am I audible? Yes, yes now your voice is coming. So a very good afternoon to all present over here. Uh, so my topic for presentation is goat milk as a functional food. As we all this uh, presentation is not visible to us. Okay. Uh, I'm trying. The, please okay. wait. For Is it visible? 
Is the screen visible? Please. Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes, ma Thank you. So uh, the topic for my presentation is goat milk as a functional food. As we all know that goat is mainly considered important as a source of non-veg food. But uh, many of us do not know its various therapeutic aspects. So I have chosen this topic for today's presentation. As functional food, goat milk is basically nutrient, nutritionally vital and plays a considerable role in providing essential nutrients. As uh, like all other food, it is rich in protein, vitamin and fatty acids and other nutrients. But it has certain other nutraceutical components which make it uh, special in comparison to other food. It has certain bioactive peptide with effective antioxidant capacity. It is important for memory and learning and particularly uh, is controlling the Alzheimer uh, side effects. Then goat milk has better digestibility, alkalinity, buffering capacity, which make it uh, a convenient food for the infant and those who are suffering with lactose intolerance. It is a valuable source of taurine for the human unit and the adult population. The carbohydrate present in goat milk are oligosaccharides, glycopeptides and glycoproteins, which are considered to be beneficial component of human nutrition and these uh, oligosaccharides are an important prebiotic and infective in, uh, anti-infective properties containing uh, material. Uh, goat milk is important for the development of mucosal barriers, uh, for the uh, synthesis of certain vitamins, metabolism of bile acids, production of salt chain, fatty acids, reduction in pH, and ultimately improving the immunity of the human population. The quantity of small size casein mycelis is completely higher in goat milk than cow's milk, which justifies its better digestibility. Goat milk has lipids, which include ganglocytes, glycolipids, and glycosphingolipids and cerebrocytes that are significant bioactive component. Infants suffering from GIT allergy, uh, actually goat milk has been found to be hypoallergic uh, property and uh, infants suffering from GIT allergy and chronic enteropathy against cow milk have been reported in various studies to be cured by goat milk supplementation. It has also immunomodulatory properties, uh, which may be attributed to the uh, compounds uh, like peptides, oligosaccharides, which modulate host inflammatory cytokines. Uh, as we all know that in every monsoon season, uh, human population, especially in North India, is suffering with uh, uh, dengue viral fever. And uh, in dengue control, and especially in improving the platelet count, goat milk has been found very effective, though its availability, its uh, uh, abundance is very limited, but its role in improving the platelet count because of the uh, mineral selenium, it has been found very Excuse significant. Excuse me, ma'am. Ma'am, can I disturb? Your slides are not moving, and if you can put it on slideshow, it will be visible to us. Okay. Let me try. Ma'am, the topmost bar, there is slideshow written. I'm trying, please wait. It's just after home. Just see the topmost bar. Home insert. To the right of animations, ma'am. Slideshow. Slideshow. Ma'am, slideshow. Upper, upper. After the animation, it is written slideshow. Yes, ma'am, to the right. This is. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Actually, this is yes. Hmm. Yes, ma'am. Now it's visible. Yes, ma'am. 
so coming to the next slide immunomodulation the immunomodulatory properties of goat milk may be attributed to the compounds presence like peptides oligosaccharides which modulate post inflammatory cytokines and it is uh, goat milk is highly significant in the control of dengue fever uh, with the presence of the mineral selenium which has been found positively correlated with the decrease in platelet count and it also uh, is important in anti clotting effect uh, occurred due to the presence of selenium other features of goat milk that it has also important role to play uh, as anti cancer agent as anti atherogenic uh, compound and also improving git function it has various other health benefit like nutrient for neonatal brain development antimicrobial properties and immunomodulators but it has certain limitation because it has some meaty flavor and its availability is less also there is some limitation of vitamin b which uh, can be controlled with its adequate combination with other foods and flavor improvers while uh, developing its various product because the value addition of goat milk is quite limited and various products are not available in the market so uh, further researchers further studies are required to be completed uh, while exploring the nutraceutical potentials of goat milk thank you Thank you so much, ma'am. The floor is now open for the question answer session. I have one question. Yeah, ma'am. Uh, ma mm -hmm. uh, when goat milk is so uh, has lot of nutritional value, why not any company is marketing? Uh, maybe uh, it's uh, the limitations of the research studies and it's nutraceutical exploitation because. Uh, companies are mainly diverted towards the product which has high uh, availability and which are in demand because its demand is less therefore companies are not focusing uh, as soon as we will be demanding its product companies will be diverting its trend towards the development of various product related to good thank you Any other question? Ma'am, I have a general question. Yes, sir. In the village, people say that the newly born baby has to be given goat milk. Dein. Is there any scientific reason behind it or it's a myth? Uh, sir, they are uh, correct because goat milk has higher amount of lactic acid bacteria and it's hypoallergic. So studies have shown that the children, those may be suffering with lactose intolerance, they have better digestibility with the presence of goat milk, number one. Number two, ki iske jo fat globules hote hai, wo bohut small particle ke hote hai, aur in mein jo, uh, uh, kya jo inka size hota hai, aur fat ki jo quality hoti hai, they are of medium chain triglyceride. So its digestibility is better in terms of its fat, fatty acid component. Therefore, the uh, rural population or native population is correct in terms of explaining its uh, valuability uh, while giving goat milk. Thank you so much, ma'am. Ma'am, there is one more question. Yeah. And the question is, does goat milk is full of cholesterol and saturated fat? If yes, then will it cause heart diseases in humans? Uh, no, studies have shown that goat milk has anti-atherogenic properties also because of its fatty acid composition, because of the MCTs and because of the uh, cholesterol lowering effect. So it is not causing at all the uh, cholesterol or heart diseases. There is one more question from Neha Chakrabarti. Yeah. Yes, Neha, ask your question. Unmute yourself. Neha, unmute yourself and then ask question. Yes, ma'am. 
um good afternoon ma'am i have one yes. query regarding the uh, regarding goat milk as a cure for dengue yeah i mean ma'am agar uh, usme kaun sa uh, uh, active ingredient hai jo cure kare because de de dengue is a viral disease and we need a anti viral medicine banana bahut kathin kaam hai to goat milk as a cure for uh, dengue ye kaise hua uh, thank you neha uh, for asking this question i can share uh, with you my own experience recently my nephew has Uh, got infected with dengue and he was admitted But in the hospital dengue can be cured on its own no ma'am uh, a yeah, uh, viral yeah. has its own life cycle no no uh, it's it can help it, it is not controlling the virus it is improving the platelet count through its selenium component through its bioactive peptides because it is controlling the cytokine storm it is controlling through its interleukin uh, activity it is controlling through the interferons therefore it can control the overall outcome or the recovery of patient it is not controlling the virus ma'am is there any clinical study i mean yeah, we can if, go, if you go on the go if you go on the Uh, if if you uh, read the research papers you will have uh, what uh, what i have mentioned it is based on the research paper you if you go on the research papers you will find many article based on the role of dengue uh, role of goat milk in controlling the platelet count and role of goat milk in it okay ma'am thank you ma'am yeah, thank you thank you so much ma'am for such an informative presentation i would now invite Ms. Shadma Khan to take over. Hello, is my voice audible? Yes, ma'am, you're audible. Okay, so let me share my screen. Is my screen visible? Yes, ma'am. Okay. A very good afternoon to everyone present here. My name is Shadma Khan, and I'm here to present about the topic: the role of idemola sequences in reducing plastic waste, current updates, and future prospects. So, why plastics? Before we go to the question why plastics, we need to know what are plastics. So, what are plastics? There are a wide range of synthetic or semi-synthetic materials that use polymer as their main ingredient. They are a polymer of long chain carbon. where carbon atoms are linked in chains and produced in long chain molecules pet is one of the most widely used plastic which is used in the production of drinking bottles and drinking bottles one can find them from railway station to bus stop they are almost everywhere so what is pet the iopac name of pet is polyethyl benzene 1,4 dicarboxylate it is a synthetic resin made by copolymerizing ethylene glycol and terephthalic acid widely used to make polyester fiber You know there are a lot of advantages of plastics. They are durable, they are lightweight, and have low manufacturing price. If they have these many benefits, then why are we so hype in degrading it? In the case of plastics, the one advantage has now become the disadvantage. That is, their non-biodegradability and durability make it almost impossible to degrade biologically, and this has become the most major concern because. our addiction to single use plastic has led to a large scale plastic production which results in large scale plastic accumulation you know in our structure of pet is the main problem in its usage of pet because it is non biodegradable in nature which makes it the most common component of accumulated plastic waste the current update says that if the practice continue to prevail there will be more plastics in than fishes in the ocean by 2050 the production rate of plastics have tripled over the last few decades and the graph of plastic waste has grown exponentially 1 million plastic water bottles are purchased every single minute across the globe and unfortunately less than 10% of all the plastic produced is recycled every minute a garbage trucks worth of plastic pollution ends up in the ocean oceana estimates that 17.6 billion pounds of plastic enters our oceans annually So, what are the harms of these plastic? How is it harming our environment and us? Let's see the harmful effects of plastics. First thing, plastic never goes away. It remains on this earth forever. And 
toxic chemical that leach out of plastics are found in every one of us in every blood and tissue of all of us exposure to them is linked to cancer birth defects impaired immunity endocrine disruption and other ailments in simple we can say it affects our health and the toxic chemical chemical that leached out of plastic also gets absorbed by the soil so it also spoils our ground water aaj ke sath sath mein 4 din chutte even plankton the tiny creature in our oceans are eating microplastics and absorbing their hazardous chemical so the question here is arises what are we doing to stop this accumulation what are the strategies that we are practicing for the plastic waste management a few of them are they like recycling chemical degradation methanolysis ammonolysis in laboratories and industries and uh, we are also using reduce to reduce the use of plastic use of renewable energy for recycling you know these all are not only time taking and costly but also require a lot of labor and expertise in the handling of chemicals and uh, i've signed mm, and the main disadvantage of these strategies is that they do not provide much solution for the already accumulated plastic waste and how it can be degraded as i have told before recycling only is of 10% of the plastic just 90% of the plastic is used is not recycled so to help this biocatalytic degradation can be applied as an eco friendly alternative to degrade plastics In 2016, scientists tested different bacteria from a bottle recycling plant and found that Iridocyte kinases, a 201F6 strain, could digest the use of plastic. The use of single cell, single use drinking bottles made up of polyethylene terephthalic material. It works by secreting an enzyme known as ptase, which results in the breakdown of certain chemical bonds that is ester bond in PT, resulting in a smaller molecules. that the bacteria can absorb using carbon in them as the food source so basically there are two enzymes ptase and mhtase it is for seen and noted that this bacteria the idonella sakaisis 201f6 strain could break down a complete thin film of pet in almost 6 week if kept at 30 degrees centigrade pet is the condensation polymer used in plastic that is highly resistant to biodegradation it is industrially produced by either terephthalic acid or dimethyl terephthalic phthalate with ethylene glycol to date a very few species of fungi but no bacteria have been found to break this polymer so uh, this bacteria the, which is now found can actually help in this the bacterium was discovered by the japanese team led by dr kohi yoda from kyoto institute of technology and dr kenji miyamoto from kyoto university here you can see a picture a false color scanning electron microscopy image of iridocyte sakaisis moving on to the next slide what is the main mechanism behind it how this bacteria works first this bacteria is a gram negative and aerobic beta proteobacteria it adheres to the pt material and secretes with enzyme which generate mono 2 hydroxy ethyl terephthalic acid that is mhet then mhet taken up by cell and hydrolyzed by second enzyme mhetase to furnish the two starting monomers that is ethylene glycol and terephthalic acid these monomers are then catalyzed by bacterium as its sole carbon or food source here you can see a flow chart representing the pt how this pt is degraded to its monomer unit that is ethylene glycol and terephthalic acid this figure shows a sustainable way to deal with plastic pollution such as bioremediation through special chemicals through recycling of pt monomers and bio treatments or through material recycling Um, this is the chemical conversion of pt into its monomers in this pt is breaking pt breaking to mhet using enzyme ptase and mhet degrading to eg plus tpa that is ethylene glycol and terephthalic acid using enzyme mhetase let's see what are the advantages of these mechanism why should we use this bacteria 
First thing, it provides hopeful concept and solution for degradation and recycling of other degradation resistant plastic animal materials. However, terephthalic acid could be isolated and reused. This is the main uh, benefit of this, that this could provide huge savings in the production of new polymers. And it can be modified on large scale as well as small scale, though the large scale uh, is not uh, yet to try it, but we can try this. And it can grow on low crystallinity, PET, and degrade it to liberate carbon dioxide and water. So let's see what the future of this bacteria can avail. The ability of the bacteria to remain stable in its composition even after repeated culturing could allow its usage directly in the environment for bioremediation. And more focus can be given to discovery of such microorganisms that can help in biodegradation of waste. Okay. So we can also look for alternative for our renewable resources and save non-renewable resources for future generations. To conclude with, Plastic accumulation is a serious concern and needs immediate attention for better discovery, for better future. We can conclude that this newly discovered bacterial strain of plastic degrading bacteria, idonosakinesis, can be a great start in the process of biocatalytic degradation in the area of bioremediation and sustainable development programs. And thank you for so much for everyone for providing me with this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. The floor is now open for the question answer session. Is my screen still visible? No, ma'am. Okay, thank you. We have one question. Why is plastic compared to a sponge? Excuse me? Hello? Yes, we have one question that why is plastic compared to a sponge? Actually, plastic tends to absorb harmful chemicals from its surrounding, which is why it is compared to a sponge. Thank you, ma'am. Is there are there any queries? Reham, yes. there's one more question from Gunjan Goswami. Good afternoon, ma'am. Yes, uh, ma'am. Uh, I want to ask that is there any criteria to decide whether uh, such and such micron uh, plas uh, par, ma, pr, this plastic is good for use and it can be biodegradable or uh, uh, less than this micron that uh, plastic will not be uh, in the biodegradable form? Is there any criteria for such? Uh, there, uh, I don't. Uh, well, uh, to be honest, I don't know about the criteria, but. Uh, Researches are being done to see which back, uh, which um, plastic is more better and which is not not better. So actually, ma'am, I want to have idea that we are using uh, plastic in various forms uh, in carry bag type in plastic bottle. So which is the most? Uh, how can we uh, uh, categorize them that this is most dangerous? So we can avoid them in our daily usage so that they are uh, they can be something like eco-friendly to nature uh, okay thank you for the question so um, we can just say with the uh, plastic with low molecular weight uh, the chemicals with low molecular weight can be uh, better for will not be that much harmful and can be degraded or reused easily. Like PET, it is high molecular weight first thing and it cannot be degraded easily. But uh, so that is the reason we are trying to introduce some microorganism that can enzymatically break down it, break it down. So. Okay, ma'am. Mostly, uh, as one more thing, mostly polyvinyl chloride is widely used toxic plastic for health as well as the environment. So we can find an alternative for using PVC. Okay, thank you. Punjan, okay. hello. Yes, yes sir. Yes. No plastic is biodegradable. Uh, we yes, are sir, trying actually... to recycle it. The only, yes, uh, uh, the only way to uh, make it harmless is to recycle and reuse. 
and repurposing so, is there actually it was some article where i have read ke plastic uh, less than 60 micron that is why the polyethylene and the polypropylene polyvinyl chloride they are very very toxic and okay. although the monomeric unit has low molecular weight okay sir okay mm. thank you hello uh, ma'am yes. can i ask yes please ask Uh, ma'am my question to you is that people are already reducing the use of plastic bags for carrying things around but mm-hmm. the major amount of plastic trash comes from uh, packaging materials of foods like chips chocolates bread so what can be the substitute for this like we cannot use paper much because it is also harmful for environment so okay. so there is this bioplastics uh it has been discovered and uh, invented that use of bioplastic can be a best alternative for all of this okay ma'am so ma'am uh, after how many like what can we expect like after how many years or months it can be available in the like market for daily use for uh, so that people can use it i think uh, uh, it uh, it was uh, discovered in 2014 so by the end of uh, like 2024 or 2025 it would be in the market okay thank you ma'am okay thank you can i say something uh, bio yes. so when you talk about bioplastics so they are available in the market but it is very very expensive so that is one concern why we are not using it the option which she is talking about probably if you see now the plastic uh, uh, the use which we are using in chips and everything they have become multi layered plastic under ek metal ki film hai upar plastic hai isliye wo recycle nahi ho pa raha hai but if we use the ordinary plastic polyethylene uh, plastic containers jo hum log jab pehle aate the wo simple pla- uh, chips aate the plastic uh, polythenes mein तो वो आराम से रिसाइकल हो सकता है बट द प्रॉब्लम इज ऑफ द वेरी ब्यूटिफुली प्रिंटेड प्लास्टिक जैसे लेस के आप ये देख रहे हैं कंटेनर्स देख रहे हैं पाउचेस गुटका के पाउचेस देख रहे हैं वो एकदम रिसाइकलेबल नहीं है सिंपल पॉलिथीन अगर यूज किए जाए तो वो रिसाइकलेबल है बिकॉज वो लो डेंसिटी पॉलिथीन है आराम से रिसाइकिल हो जाएगा मल्टीलेयर नहीं होगा इसीलिए और ज्यादा वेस्ट हजार हो रहा है ना मैम इसीलिए क्योंकि तो इसमें कलरेंट भी यूज कर रहे हैं सिंथेटिक है वो प्योर तो नहीं डबल, वो पांच पांच छह छह लेयर्स डबल डबल मार पड़ रही है फिर वो एनवायरमेंट पे उसमें मेटल भी यूज है सब कुछ यूज है इसीलिए वो अब रिसाइक्लेबल नहीं रह पा रहा है थैंक यू इफ यू डोंट हैव एनी क्वेश्चंस रेहा कॉल नेक्स्ट पार्टिसिपेंट Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, but there is one participant who is raising her hand. Please proceed. Uh, yes, ma'am. I had to ask one question. Very slight query. Yes, please ask. Uh, so yeah, uh, ma'am, uh, we had read it when we were in class twelfth that uh, plastic could be mixed with bitumen and it could be used in the construction of roads. So uh, is that a way that we could put an end to the plastic waste by building up ro- kilometers of roads? Uh, uh okay so just before my presentation a girl uh, also presented about this bitumen mixed with plastic to make the roads and uh, we found that uh, it was said that it also have so many harms like the chemicals people inhale like the laborers like the laborers that are uh, making the the road inhale those chemicals and can get infections like lung infections or severe problems it is not the end but uh, yes it may her help to a certain level in recycling because as i said only 10% of recycling is done and 90% is not is not used it is also still as accumulated waste so it can help but not completely okay thank you ma'am Thank you so much, ma'am, for attending the queries. Now we'll move to our next presenter, Miss Jagrati Sharma. Oh no, 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 Sakshi Rai. Sakshi Rai. Okay, ma'am. Next presenter, Miss Sakshi Rai. Yes, ma'am. I'm there. Wait, I'm sitting next to you. <laughs>
Can I start? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Sakshi Rai, student of MSc Finals, St. John's College, Agra. Firstly, I would like to thank Isabella Coburn College for giving such a golden opportunity. So, I am going to present my review article with the title "A Review on Green Hydrogen: An Alternative of Climate Change Mitigation," under the guidance of Dr. Mahima Havel Masi, Assistant Professor, St. John's College, Agra. Let's introduce my topic. I start. I would like to start with a question: What is climate change? Climate change refers to long-term shifts in temperature and weather patterns. Climate change is due primarily to the human use of fossil fuels. Which releases high amount of CO2 and greenhouse gases into the air. To overcoming those challenges, green hydrogen plays a very critical role. So we may move to the next slide. What is green hydrogen? Green hydrogen is a major source of clean energy, and it is a hydrogen-produced fuel obtained from electrolysis of water. Why we call green hydrogen a clean energy source? Because it is a hydrogen fuel that is produced using renewable energy rather than fossil fuels. It helps in reducing greenhouse gases and help countries to achieve their climate goals. So, coming to the next slide, greenhouse gas emissions and net zero emissions. Greenhouse gas gas. Emissions in today's atmosphere, or some future expectations, you can see in the figure. CO two emissions must decline by about twenty five percent, or by twenty thirty, from two thousand ten levels, reaching net zero by twenty seventy. You can see in the figure of greenhouse gas emissions and its effects on the average change in atmospheric temperature for different scenarios. As you can see, the rise in temp uh, rise in ever Average global temperature will cross 3.5 degrees Celsius by 2100. However, with the strong determination to bring the global emission to net zero by 2060, the temperature rise can be brought back within the limits of 1.5 by 2100. So, net zero emissions is the situation in which a country greenhouse gas emissions are eliminated. from the ecosystem through carbon absorption or sequestration to achieve this all greenhouse gases will need to be captured and stored by carbon sequestration so why we use green hydrogen as a clean energy source because it it has the lowest energy content by volume but highest power content by weight and it creates zero harmful zero harmful emissions unlike fossil fuels the main reason for using green hydrogen is that the production of green hydrogen is fueled by renewable energy sources such as wind or solar and the end product of this is only oxygen so this is a very environment friendly option and we also call it a renewable hydrogen so let's move to the next part of presentation that is production of green hydrogen as you can see in the flow chart there are two renewable methods to produce hydrogen that is by biomass natural gas propane coal etc or by wind solar hydro are some energy source materials biomass currently covers 14% of the total primary energy consumption due to its abundance and ease of accessibility across many countries currently the two main processes to produce hydrogen from biomass are through thermochemical or biochemical process thermochemical processes include pyrolysis gasification steam reforming and supercritical gasification whereas biochemical processes include biophotolysis biofermentation and dark fermentation in the biochemical process biomass can be converted into biofuels 
through various processes, including anaerobic or aerobic dig digestion, fermentation, and acid hydrolysis. On the other hand, energy source materials like wind, solar, and hydro are used in hydrogen production by electrolysis using carbon-free electric sources. In water, electrolysis, gaseous hydrogen and oxygen are generated from water. So let's weigh the pros and cons of green hydrogen, just like a coin has two faces. Some advantages of green hydrogen are, it can help, it can help to decarbonize parts of transportation industry. Green hydrogen can be used where generators cannot assist. It, it can avoid the need for extensive grid build and it is easy to store. So let's discuss about some disadvantages. Some disadvantages of green hydrogen are electrolysis and steam reforming. The, main, the two main processes of hydrogen production are extremely expensive. So hydrogen energy is very expensive and this is a major drawback of this. It takes more energy than conventional fuels and it is extremely dangerous and combustible. So let's let's move to the conclusion. Similar to renewable, renewable energy, the governments must establish ambitious national objectives for green hydrogen and electrolyzes potential by 2030. Initiate an incentive scheme for the production of electrolyzers. Due to high, energy, high pricing and a lack of supporting infrastructure, governments have a number of challenges in paving the way for its new kind of energy. Countries like USA, Ch Russia, China, and Germany using hydrogen-based energy. India's largest hydrogen-making plant, state-owned Gale India Limited. Currently, India PM Narendra Modi will be launched. Modi launched National Hydrogen Mission on August 15, 2021. This mission was launched to push for clean energy security for India. To enable sustainable growth, the society needs renewable energy production and constant development and commercialization of advanced technologies. So the time is now. Thank you. Is there any questions? Thank you so much. Now the floor is open for the question answer session. Simple question, Sakshi. What is the difference? Is this green hydrogen different from hydrogen gas which we get in cylinders? Yes, ma'am. What is ma the difference? Ma'am, green hydrogen is a hydrogen produced from renewable sources, uh, renewable sources like uh, solar, wind, wind energy, etc. And uh, that hydrogen is different from this. Uh, how are you producing uh, hydrogen from solar? Ma'am, actually, I don't know. And from wind? And ma'am, these are the ma'am in by electrolysis method. So then you are using water, right? Yes, ma'am. And uh, from water, how are you getting hydrogen? By which reaction? And this is the electrolysis in which hydrogen and the oxygen are produced. So for that, you require electric current, right? Yes, ma'am. That is what I'm asking. Is, is it uh, easily done? How expensive um, is it? Then it is very expensive because the, in the main um, uses of electrolyzers in this process and the electrolyzers are very expensive in today's time for so this is expensive. And storage also, I think storage is also a very difficult task because the hydrogen is really inflammable. Yes, ma'am. Hello, Sakshi. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, you are talking about the 
green hydrogen as a better source of energy yes sir so uh, for under developed countries or developing countries where infrastructure is a main problem do you yes, think sir. practically this thing is happen possible in these countries well only mainly in developed countries but uh, it can be done there also if they want thank you so much moving on to our next presenter we have miss jagriti sharma uh, reham jagriti is not here maybe we she is not connected with us today yes ma'am so we'll move on to akriti miss akriti over to you ma'am I audible? Yes, ma'am. A very warm afternoon to all the professors, colleagues, and my dear friends. I am Akriti Sun, pursuing PhD in Chemistry from Isabella Thoban College, going to present an article on the topic pharmacological activities of naringenin and its analog. So, in order to understand uh, the pharmacological activities of naringenin, firstly, it is necessary to understand about phytochemicals. so phytochemicals are the compounds produced from the plants with different pharmacological and biological properties most of the known and available drugs are derived from the plants more than 121 active phytoconstituents are evaluated and contributed to the drug discovery so far among polyphenols anthocyanidins limonoids phytosterols and glucosinolates flavonoids top the charts as one of the primary phytochemical present in plants Flavonoid also responsible for the various ways of plant parts, like imparting different shades to the flower, like yellow, orange, and red. The main sources of flavonoids are soya beans, citrus fruits, tea, apple, cocoa, and berries. Moving further, let's understand the structure of flavonoids. Flavonoids are the oxygenated heterocyclic compounds with the skeleton structure of fifteen carbons. that are made up of two aromatic rings connected by oxygen and three carbon chain that form a close pyrene structure therefore it also referred as c6 c3 c6 structure now i would like to shed some light on naringenin naringenin is a poly, uh, potent phenolic compound found in citrus fruit most abundantly in grapefruit and some less amount in orange and very less amount in lemon Naringenin also used in cosmetics, perfumes, and different medicinal drugs. Naringenin Naringenin also shown promising activities in very chronic illness diseases and show effective uh, activities for antioxidant, anti-estrogenic, gastrointestinal, cardioprotective, uh, anti-diabetic, anti-cancerous, anti-microbial, and and anti-inflammatory diseases. Now. wonder what is in the structure of naringenin that make it more effective for various biological activity so naringenin has three hydroxyl group and at first one the 2,4 hydroxyl phenyl at the position and seven uh, seventh hydroxy group which can be easily modified and substituted however the uh, hydroxy group present at the fifth position forms a hydrogen connection uh, with a ketone that is present at carbon 4 that is making it a little less approachable for any substitution next so but moving further based on the substitutions there are various biologically active synthetic analogs that have been synthesized to increase the pharmacological properties of naringenin here i have mentioned some biologically active analogs of naringenin first one here we can see that that is showing anti androgenic activity it has been seen that if the substitution is done at the sixth position of naringenin uh, so it can show anti androgenic properties 
analysis was done on on the prostate specific antigen concentration in the supernatant of treated ppc3 ar2 cells that shows 611 dimethyl alanine was detected which can show anti antigenic property in interestingly it also been found that 611 dimethyl alanine not only sh uh, show anti antigenic property but it also shows anti estrogenic properties as well next we can see that if the substitution is done at the third position from the oxygen it shows promising anti cancerous activity on different cell lines like human breast cancer cell line mcf7 and human col colon cell line st29 moving further if we can here we can see that if Uh, it is reported that if the substitution is done at the seventh position with uh, uh, substitute uh, if the substitute substitution done at the seventh position then the anti proliferative and anti zika activities are de detected in uh, cell melanoma b16 f10 and breast carcinoma 41 cells it also been reported that if the seven hydroxy group is substituted with tertiary amino group it shows promising activity on mcf7 sct116 hela human cervical cancer cell and a549 human lung epithelium carcinoma cell as well now moving next to the next it has been shown that if the substitution is done with the alkyl derivative at the substitution naringenic show a very well microbial properties the strongest activities was observed again streptococcus aureus lastly but not the least n oxime derivatives of naringenin shows promising anti cancerous activities too additionally naringenin also shows greater effective uh, effectiveness in the protection against oxidative damage to the lipids which proves that the naringenin derivatives also shows antioxidant activity uh, it is true that naringenin has many health benefits and has been used as a nutraceutical and dietary supplement however more research is required to fine tune its optimal doses and improve its bioavailability additionally pharmacological activities in human are also required to be studied even more to evaluate the safety profile as well these are some of my references thanking you all for listening me so patiently thank you so much Thank you so much. Now the floor is open for the question answer session. I have one question, Akriti. Um, you yes, have ma. shown the review on arginine. You have not shown any synthesis because in the review there is a lot of thing. Then there are so many synthesis of this compound. You have not discussed a single synthesis. Are synthesis is available, no, Peter? Actually, it's a mini review, and I. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. It is. They are available, and okay. here I have shown the pharmacological activities of naringenin and its de derivatives, not the synthesis. But many okay. research papers are available that shows uh, the synthesis of naringenin. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Any other question? now i would like to thanks to uh, uh, give a thanks to all the presenters each one of you have presented really very well that was indeed an inform informative session i would now hand over to saima to proceed further over to you saima thank you reha moving towards the end of today's program i would like to request to dr bhatia to proceed with the vote of thanks over to you ma'am we come to the end of day 2 on behalf of the internal quality assurance cell and department of chemistry of isabella thoban college i would like to thank all our participants for being with us throughout the deliberations approximately 250 participants were always with us on the zoom platform and rest could join us on youtube live due to covid pandemic all conferences have to be conducted online do it has its limitation but i can see many many advantages as well we got the opportunity to learn from an array of speakers from across the world and had participants joining us from across india and also abroad 
I'm extremely thankful to all our keynote speakers, Professor Ramakrishna Gudar, uh, Dr. V. R. Patel, Professor Archita Patnayak, and our very own dear alumna, Shivi Saxena, for having spare, spare time to be with us today and sharing their ideas and research work in various contemporary fields of sustainable chemistry with our students. The past two days have been very enriching for both, uh, both for us faculty and students. I would like to take this opportunity and thank our college president, Dr. E.S. Charles, and our principal, Dr. V. Prakash, for motivating us and supporting all our academic pursuits. We are thankful to our sponsors, HDFC Bank, Cappuccino Blast, Reliance Industries, and Reliance Digital for sponsoring this event. Now, I take this opportunity to appreciate the coordinated hard work put in by the entire organizing committee, be it faculty or be it our dear students who worked hand in hand to bring forth this conference to you. Hope each one of you had something new to learn from today's deliberations. Looking forward to your presence with us tomorrow again. Take care. Thank you students and thank you faculty. We had a very enriching session today and hope to see you again tomorrow. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am.